Welcome to the world of Python, where creativity meets technology. Whether you are a beginner, eager to dive into coding, or a seasoned programmer looking to expand your skills, this journey has something for everyone. Please note, we have added sessions being covered in this tutorial with timestamps in the description for your convenience to jump to the topic which excites you the most. You will be mastering the fundamentals of Python, diving deep into advanced concepts and unlocking the secrets of powerful data structures and algorithms. Picture yourself analyzing data like a pro, building intelligent machine learning models and exploring the fascinating realms of generative AI. But that's not all. We'll also delve into Python for automation, simplifying everyday tasks and crafting beautiful interactive GUIs for your applications. Join us as we embark on this comprehensive Python adventure. From basics to brilliance, we have got you covered. So let's get started and code your way to mastery. In the Python fundamentals, we'll start with the basics. Installing Python, understanding variables, data types, operators, and flow control statements. You will also learn about Python's core data structures, tuples, lists, dictionaries, and sets. Next, we will delve into advanced topics like object-oriented programming, inheritance, and exception handling. You will also learn file handling techniques to manage your data efficiently. Understanding data structures and algorithms is key. We will cover arrays, stacks, queues, linked lists, and essential searching and sorting algorithms like linear search, binary search, incision sort, quick sort, and merge sort. In Python for machine learning, you will work with libraries like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. These tools will help you manipulate, analyze, and visualize data to gain valuable insights. You will also explore the fascinating world of generative AI, where you will learn the basics and how to apply Python in creating generative models, opening up new possibilities in AI. In Python for Automation, we will focus on making your life easier. You will learn to use Selenium for web automation. We will also cover GUI development using TK Inter, bringing your applications to life. Why wait? Let's quickly start with the first module. In Python Fundamentals, this is where it all begins. We will start by introducing you to Python's syntax and core concepts. You will learn about variables, data types, and control structures like oops and conditionals. By the end of this section, you will be comfortable writing simple Python programs and ready to tackle more complex challenges. We'll start off this session by installing Python into our systems. And to install Python, we'd have to go to this particular site over here, Python ORG Downloads. Let me just go ahead and click on this link. So as you see, since Python is platform independent, whether you have a Windows system or a Linux system or even a Mac, you can download Python for either of these operating systems. And since I'm using a Windows system, all I have to do is click on this particular link and Python would be downloaded. Now, after downloading Python, we would need an IDE. So what exactly is an IDE? IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Now, if you just download Python, we would also need some environment which would make our coding much more easier. So if you have worked with other programming languages such as C, C++ or Java, then you would know that you would have used an IDE for these languages as well. So if you have worked with Java, then you would have used an IDE called as Eclipse. Similarly, if you have worked with C or C++, then you would have worked with IDE such as Turbo C++ or Dev C++. So similarly, we've got a lot of IDEs for Python. So one such IDE for Python is PyCharm, and we can download PyCharm from this particular link, jetbrains.com slash PyCharm. I'll just click on this over here. Then I'd have to click on this download button. And as you see, we've got the professional version and the community version. 
And if we want it for just single user development, we can just go ahead and download this community version over here. And similarly, as you see over here, we've got, if you use a Windows system, then you can download PyCharm for Windows. If you have a Mac, then you can download PyCharm for Mac. Similarly, if you have a Linux, then you can download Python for Linux. Since I have a Windows system, I'll select this and I'll go ahead and download the community version of this. Then we have something called as Anaconda, which is actually a Python and R distribution. So if you want to perform any sort of machine learning task or data science task, then Anaconda is a complete toolkit. So this provides you with a lot of tools involving Python. So it will provide you an IDE called as Jupyter Notebook and not just the IDE. Along with the IDE, it will also provide you with a lots of libraries, libraries such as Matplotlib, Seaborn, Pandas and NumPy. So you don't have to manually install these libraries. So once you go ahead and install Anaconda, so you can install Anaconda from this particular site over here. Over here, you see the products tab, click on the individual edition which is the open source one, then just go ahead and scroll down. So you have the download button over here again. And since I have a Windows system, I'll just go ahead and download the 64 bit graphical installer. And since this is a lot of MB, which is 466 MB, and since I don't want to use up my data pack, I'll just go ahead and cancel this because I already have Anaconda installed into my system. Now, once we have installed Anaconda, as I've told you guys, Anaconda comes up with an IDE called as Jupyter Notebook. So what is Jupyter? It is a browser based interpreter that allows us to interactively work with Python. So all of our Python code will be implementing in this Jupyter Notebook. And if you have to open Jupyter Notebook, I'll just show you how to do it. So here on your search bar, go ahead and type in Anaconda. So you'd have to select this over here, Anaconda prompt. Now in Anaconda prompt, you would have to type Jupyter notebook. And let's just wait for the browser based interpreter to open up. So this what you see is called as the Jupyter notebook, which is a browser based Python interpreter and will be writing all of our Python code over here. Now, if we want to open up a new Python notebook, click on this tab and select Python 3. Now, once this is done, we have opened up our new Python notebook. So you have a lot of tabs over here. So similarly, if you want to create a new notebook, select file, then you have this new notebook option. Again, you can go ahead and select Python 3. And as you see over here, this is our new notebook. I'll just close this up over here. Then let's say if you want to download the code file which you've written, you have this download as option. And over here, normally, whenever we want to download the Jupyter notebook, we download it as .ipynb file, which basically stands for Python notebook, ipython notebook. You can also download it as other formats. If you want to just save it as a simple Python file, you can just select .py over here. You can also go ahead and save this file as a HTML doc or maybe a latex doc. And if you want to save, you have the save as option over here. And similarly, you can go ahead and rename your notebook. Either you can select this or you can just click over here. Then you can go ahead and rename it. So I'll just write it as my Python notebook and then I'll rename this file over here. Now let's go ahead and write our first Python program. So to print something out on the console, we would have to use the print command. Then I'll give this parenthesis over here. I'll use double quotes and inside this, I will give in the command. This is Sparta and I'll just go ahead and click on run. And as you guys see, we have successfully printed out this uh, Sparta. We have written our first Python program in Jupyter Notebook. Now we can, we are on our way to happily go and hack the NASA systems. So this is our building stone, guys. We can go ahead and do a lot of things with what we've learned with this. Now, 
you have something called as a kernel over here so what exactly is a kernel you can consider this kernel to be the executor of this program so whenever you would have whenever you write a piece of code and you'd want to execute it you click on kernel and this is what actually runs your entire code then let's say if you want to add a new cell above this so this what you see is called as the cell and if you want to add a cell above this you click on insert then you have the insert cell above option similarly let's say if i want to insert a cell below this i click on insert i select insert cell below and this is how i can add another cell so this was a basic intro about jupyter notebook so let's start off by understanding what exactly are variables in python now when you work with any programming language your first task needs to be to work with data isn't it so whatever programming language you're working with you are essentially working with data but the question over here is how do you actually store the data that you work with so let's say you are working at a company and you want to store the names of all of the employees so we start off with taking three employee names so let's say we have john sam and matt with us and we'd have to store these names somewhere so where can we store them this is where a variable comes in so you can consider a variable to be your temporary storage space now what we'll do is we'll take this string value so this what you see inside double quotes is known as a string and we'll take the string value and we will store this in this variable called as student either we can call the student or employee or whatever we want to and this variable will have a particular address associated with it and since this variable is a temporary storage space the values which are stored inside it can be changed again and again so initially we are storing this value john inside this variable employee or student then after some time we can go ahead and replace this value john with this value sam similarly after some time we are changing this value of sam with this value of matt and this is how variables work in python so now let's go to jupyter notebook and i'll give you a proper example of this here what i'll do is i'll create a variable called as var1 i'll give in this equal to symbol and i'll go ahead and store the value john inside this let me click on run now let me print out the print of var1 and let's see what will be the result so we have successfully stored the value john inside var1 and we were able to print this out and since var1 is a variable it is a temporary storage space so that is why we can change the value which is stored inside this so now instead of john i want to store the value sam inside this i'll click on run again i'll use print and then i'll be printing out the value of var1 and as you guys see initially we had john inside this we were able to change this to sam now again after some time i'll go ahead and change this value to matt now let me print out var1 over here print of var1 and as you guys see initially we had john then we changed it to sam and finally we have changed it to matt so that was a basic intro to variables now another thing to be kept in mind is every variable has a data type associated with it so when you're working with data that data can be present in any format so when you're working with numbers such as 10 500 -1000 -323 -3, these are called as integers and when you work with decimal point numbers so decimal point numbers such as 3.14 15.97 -1.92 all of these would be floating point numbers then we have something called as boolean values so boolean values are basically you have only 0 and 1 or you can also tag them as true and false so you have only two values over here and those two values are true and false or you can also tag them as 0 and 1 then we have strings so strings are something which you put in single quotes double quotes or triple quotes so these are the four main data types over here in python so let's go ahead and look at an example of each of these 
And now I'm going to start off by creating an integer variable. So I'll name this integer variable as num1 and I'll store the value of 10 inside this. And just to see what is the data type of this, I will use the type method. And inside the type method, I'll be passing in num1. And as you guys see, this tells us that the data type of this particular variable is integer. Then I'll go ahead and pass in a floating point number or a decimal number. So I'll call this as, let's say, decimate. And in decimate, maybe I'll store in the value of 3.14. Now let me go ahead and check the type of decimate. So inside this, I'll pass in decimate. And when I click on run, you guys see that this is of floating type. Then we have the next data type, which is of Boolean. So here I will have maybe another variable called as log one and inside log one, I will store in the value true. Let me hit run again and then let me check the type of log one. So inside type, I'll pass in the variable log one. And as you guys see, this tells us that this is of bool. Bool basically means this is of Boolean or logical type. And then we've got the character or string. So this time I'll have my variable as char1 and inside this I will store the name. Let's say I'll store the name Arjun over here. Then let me check the type of char1. And when I hit run, you see that this tells us that this is a string type variable. We also have another variable over here or another data type over here, which is of complex type. So complex is basically a data type where you have a real part and an imaginary part. So let's say if I write something called as three plus five J. So here three would be your real part and five J would be your imaginary part. You would have learned about complex numbers in your primary or in your secondary school. So normally in math, this J is represented as I. So you'd have something called as three plus five I where three would be your real part. Five would be your imaginary part. So in Python, this I is represented with J instead of I. So now I'll go ahead and store this in a variable called as comp one. Now let me go ahead and check the type of this. So type of comp one. And I see that this is of complex type. So we have successfully understood what are variables and we have also looked at the different data types of variable can have. Now we'll go ahead to the next concept in Python, which will be operators. And as the name suggests, operators help us to perform simple operations on this data. And we've got arithmetic operators, relational operators and logical operators. So we'll start with the first set of operators, which are the arithmetic operators. Let me go ahead to this Jupyter notebook over here. And what I'll do is I will clear out everything which is present in the console. So this scissors, which you see, if you click on this scissors symbol, you will be able to cut out all of these cells. Now let me add a comment. So what is a comment? Comment is something which is not executed by the Python interpreter. And you can add a comment with this hash symbol. So after this hash symbol, I am going ahead and writing arithmetic operators. I'll click on run. And as you see, this is not executed over here. So whenever you add a hash symbol over here, Python interpreter automatically recognizes whatever follows hash symbol as a comment. Now, if I remove this hash symbol and then if I click on run, you'd see that we get this error, which tells us that this is invalid syntax, because if we don't add the hash symbol over here, then Python interpreter would consider this these two actually as two separate variables. And since we have not declared any variable called as arithmetic or as operator, this is giving us this error. So I'll just go ahead and add this hash over here. Now after this, since we have to perform arithmetic operators and arithmetic operators basically constitute of plus, we have plus, then we have minus, then we have multiplication, and then we have division. Now, 
I'll create two variables over here. I'll have first variable num1 and I'll store the value of 10 inside this. Then I'll have the second variable num2 and I'll go ahead and store the value of 20 inside this. Now after creating these two variables, let me perform the basic arithmetic operations. So I'll start off by adding num1 and num2. So I'll type num1 plus num2. And when I perform num1 plus num2, I get a result of 30. So basically, if you want to add two numbers, you have to use the plus symbol between those two operands. And since 10 is stored in num1, 20 is stored in num2, we get a result of 30. Then similarly, I'll go ahead and perform the subtraction operation. So here I'll have num1 minus num2. And when I type num1 minus num2, I get a result of minus 10 because 10 minus 20 is minus 10. Going ahead, I'll also perform multiplication. And to perform multiplication, I'd have to type num1 into num2. And when I have num1 into num2 over here, which is basically 10 into 20, I get a result of 200. Then we are only left with division. So to perform division, I'll have num1. Then I'll use the forward slash symbol, which denotes division. Then I'll have the second operand over here, which is num2, and I'll click on run. And as you guys see, when we divide 10 with 20, we get a result of 0 0.5. So these were some basic arithmetic operations. Now we'll go ahead and work with relational operators. So I'll just add another comment over here and I'll add the comment as relational operators. And what are the relational operators? These help us to find the relationship between two operands. So we can understand if one operand or the value of one operand is less than the other operand or maybe the value of one operand is greater than the other operand. So we will have less than symbol, greater than symbol, equal to symbol and not equal to symbol. Now again, we will use the same variables num1 and num2. Let me just print out num1 and num2 over here for your sake. And as you guys see, we have 10 stored in num1 and 20 stored in num2. Now, I want to check if the value in num1 is less than the value in num2. So I'll type num1, I'll use the less than symbol, then I'll type num2 over here, I'll click on run. And as you guys see, I get the result as true, which means that num1 is less than 20, which we get because 10 is obviously less than 20. Now, I want to check if the value in num1 is greater than the value in num2. And when I hit run, I get a false value because 10 is not greater than 20. Now going ahead, I want to check if the value in num1 is equal to the value in num2. So this what you see is the double equal to operator. You have to understand the difference between the double equal to operator and the single equal to operator. So this is the single equal to operator and with the help of single equal to operator, we are assigning a value to a variable. But when we are using this double equal to operator, this helps us to understand if these two values, if the operand on the left hand side and the operand on the right hand side are equal to each other or not. And when I click on run, I get a false value because 10 is obviously not equal to 20. Then going ahead, I have the not equal to operator. So I'll have num1. So not equal to operator is represented like this. So I'll have exclamation mark. Then I'll have the equal to symbol. Then I'll have num2 over here. And I get a true result because 10 is obviously not equal to 20. So these were some of the relational operators. Going ahead, we'll work with logical operators. So I'll add a comment over here, which would be logical operators. And we have two logical operators, which are and or. <clears throat> Let's start with and. So and is a logical operator, which would give us a true result only when the both of the operands are true. But 
or is a logical operator which would give us a true result when either of the operand is true. So let's understand this in detail. So this time I will be creating two Boolean variables over here. I'll have log one and in log one, I'll have the value true stored. Then I'll have log two and in log two, I'll have the value false stored. So I have log one and log two over here. Now I'll perform the and operator on both of these. So let me go ahead and type log one and log two. And when I hit run, I get a false value because log one is true, log two is false. True and false will give us a false result. Now, let me see what will happen when I have log two and log one. Again, I get a false result because false and true is also false. Now, let me check log two and log two. Log two and log two will also give me false because false and false is also false. And finally, I'll check log one and log one. Log one and log one will give me a true result because and operator gives a true result only when both of the operands are true. Now we'll head on to the or operator. So this time I'll have log one or log two. Now true or false will give me a true result because or will give me a true result when either of the operands is true. Then I'll have log two or log one. And this again gives me a true result because false or true is again true. Then I'll have log one or log two. And this again will let me actually change this to log one or log one. And this will give me a true result because true or true is also true. And finally, we'll have log two or log two. And this is the only case where we'll have a false result, which is false or false. So only in the case where both of your operands are false, that is when you will get a false result when you're working with the or operator. So this was all about the different types of operators in Python. Now we'll understand what exactly are Python tokens. So Python token is the smallest meaningful component in a program. So when you combine all of these Python port tokens together, that is when you get your final Python code. <clears throat> so the basic Python tokens are keywords, identifiers, literals and operators. So we have already worked with operators, which were one of the tokens in Python. Now we'll go ahead and understand what are keywords, identifiers and literals. So we'll start with Python keywords. Python keywords, as it is stated, are special reserved words. So when I say special reserved words, you can't use these special reserved words for any other purpose, which would mean that you can't give the name of a variable or the name of a function or maybe the name of a class with these Python keywords. And you have some of these reserved keywords over here, which are if, def, del, true, false, while, not, or, return. So these are some of the Python keywords. Now, let me just show you how to use these. So let if I type in DEF, so as you guys have seen over here, when I type DEF, this automatically turns into green. So Python interpreter recognizes this word def as a keyword. Now let's say if I try to store something in this def is equal to 10, I get an error because since this is a keyword, I can't use this as a variable. Similarly, let's say if I have if, if again is a keyword and that is why this turns into green. Then we have something called as identifiers. So identifiers are basically the names used for variables, functions or objects. So till now we had created some variables called as var1 or num1 or log1. So those all are identifiers. So the names which you give to the variables, functions or objects are known as the identifiers. So let's say if you have a person and the name of that person is Arjun or Sam or Matt. So here the names of these people are the identifiers. So similarly, as you need a name to identify a human being, that is how you will also need an identifier 
to understand or to call or invoke a variable function or object and this is the simple analogy between the real life and these python identifiers and there are some basic rules when you're working with these identifiers so the first rule is you cannot have an identifier with special characters so you can have underscore but instead of under uh, except underscore you can't have any other special characters in the name of the identifier and also identifiers are case sensitive so let's say if you create a variable called as var1 with v in small case and then you create a variable as var1 with v in capital case then both of them will constitute as different variables and then also you have another rule over here which states that the first letter cannot be a digit so these are some basic rules which normally a python coder keeps in mind so let's go ahead and <clears throat> understand about these rules in python so i have told you guys that special characters cannot be used in the name so let's say if i have j percent and i have this over here and if i try to store the value 10 inside this let me click on run so you see that we have a syntax error over here similarly what i'll do is i'll have a variable called as n1 and inside n1 i'll store the value 10 then i'll have the value capital n1 and inside this i'll store the value 20 now let me print in both of these n1 with a small n and n1 with a capital n and as you guys see both of these values are different because both of those variables are different so this is about python identifiers then we have something called as literals and literals are just the constants in python so constant is a value which does not change so whatever values you are storing inside a variable that is called as a literal so here when you are storing 10 into n1 n would be literal similarly when you are storing the value 20 into n1 20 would be your literal then over here when you are storing the value such as 10 into num1 20 into num2 again they are your literals now we will head on to an interesting topic in python where we'll understand about strings in python so what are strings strings are basically sequence of characters which are enclosed within single quotes double quotes or triple quotes and we already know that and we have already seen an example of python strings so let me just give you an example of all three of these where i'm creating a string with single quotes double quotes and triple quotes let me go ahead and remove all of this over here because i like it clean let me just remove all of this stuff from over here now what i'll do is i will create a new string variable called as str1 and the value i'll be creating with single quotes and inside this i'll just type hello world and i'll print out str1 over here and i have successfully created the string str1 with hello world then i'll have str2 and in str2 i'll be creating this with double quotes and over here i'll just type in this is sparta and i'll print out str2 over here going ahead i'll have another variable called as str3 and this time i'll create a multi line string so if you want to create a multi line string we can create it using triple quotes so i'll have triple quotes over here and inside this i'll just type i am going to france tomorrow let me run this and let me print out str3 right now so as you guys see i have successfully created a string called as i am going to france tomorrow and this what you see backward slash and that indicates a new line so after i am we have backward slash n which tells us that going to comes in a new line similarly we have backward slash n followed by france tomorrow which tells us that this again is in a new line so this is some basic idea about strings in python now that we know this let's actually see how can we extract individual characters from a string so here we have created a string 
called as my string. So the name of the variable is my string and the value which is stored inside this is my name is John. Now if we want to extract individual characters, we'd have to understand the concept of index. So here these characters are present at indices and the index value starts from zero. So here M is present at index zero. Y is present at index one. The space is present at index two. Right. So similarly, all of these have a particular index assigned to them and the index value starts from zero. And if you want to extract this particular character or the first character from a string, we'd have to give in the name of the string. We'd have to give in the parenthesis and inside the parenthesis, we will give in the index value that we would want to extract. And since I want to extract the first character, we'd have to give in index zero. And that is how we were able to extract this. Then similarly, if I want to extract the last character, so the index of the last character will be minus one. So either you can manually count the last value over here. So that is basically time consuming. So instead of counting the index, if you just want to directly extract the last character, then you can just go ahead and give it minus one and that will automatically give you the last character which is present in the string. So let's go ahead and perform these operations in Jupyter Notebook. Let me add in a new cell over here in third cell below and I'll go ahead and create a string called as my string and over here I'll have let's say a string called as my name is John. Let me print out my string over here. Now after this, I'd want to extract the first character. So if I want to extract the first character, I'll just type my string. I'll give in parenthesis. I'll have one written over here and I'll actually have to give zero because the first character is present at the zero at index. So yes, this is important. You'd have to remember that in Python, the indexing starts from zero. So this is how I have extracted the first character. Now, similarly, if I want to extract the last character, which is N, then I will give minus one over here. And as you guys see, I am able to extract the last character. Now, similarly, let's say if I want to extract this A, so this is presented zero, one, two, three and four. This is presented index number four. So let me just give in four over here. And as you guys see, I have successfully extracted this particular element from this entire string. Now we'll go ahead and work with some string functions. So the first string function is len, which will give us the length or the number of characters which are present in the string. So all we have to do is use len and inside that we will pass in the name of the string. So when we pass in my string, this tells us that the length of the string is 15. And similarly, let's say if I want to convert all of the characters in the string into lower case, we have the lower method. So all I'll do is type in my string dot lower and this will convert all of the characters into lower keys and a method which is analog analogous to lower is the upper method. So I'll type my string dot upper and with the help of this, I'll be able to convert all of the characters into upper keys, which you see in the result over here. So I have my string ready. Now I would want to check the length of this and inside L E N I will pass in my string and this would tell us that the length of the string is 15. Now similarly if I so you see as you see over here we've got two capital characters over here. M is capital J is capital. I'd want to convert them into lower keys. So for that purpose first I'd have to give in the string name which is my string. I'll use the dot operator, then I'll use the lower method. And when I click on run, you will see that all of the characters have been converted into lower keys. Now, similarly, if I want to convert all of the characters into upper keys, I'll go ahead and type my string. I'll use the dot operator and then I'll have upper written over here. I'll click on run. And as you guys see, I have converted all the characters into upper keys. Now we'll go ahead and see some more functions. So we've got the replace method over here and we've got the count method. So if I want to replace some particular character or some particular string with another string, then we can use the replace method. 
So again, first we'd have to give in the name of the string, which is my string. I'll use the dot operator, then I'll use replace method, and it takes in two parameters. The first parameter is basically that character which I'd want to replace. So as you see over here, initially we had y over here. I want to replace that y with a. So initially the sentence was my name is John, but I have changed that to my name is John. So quite an interesting method, isn't it? Then we have the count method. So here we have created a new string where we have stored the value hello hello world. And if I want to check the count of the number of times a word occurs or number of times a particular substring occurs, then we can just pass in the substring into this method. So if I want to understand the number of times this substring hello occurs in this entire string, so if I pass in hello, this tells me that the substring hello occurs two times in the entire string over here. So let's work with this replace method and the count method. So we already have this my string variable ready. And let's say instead of my name is John, I would want to change the name over here. So instead of my name is John, I would want to change that to my name is Sam. So I'll have my string, then I will use the replace method over here. And we already know this takes in two parameters. The first parameter is a substring which I'd want to replace. So I would want to replace John and I'd want to replace it with let me actually keep it like this and I'd want to replace it with Sam and when I click on run you would see that I have successfully changed the substring from John to Sam then we have the count method let me create this new string variable over here I'll have new string and inside this I'll store hello hello world now that we have this what I'll do is I will go ahead and use the count method so I'll have new string and use the count method and inside this I'll pass in hello and when I pass in hello this tells me that the substring hello is occurring two times now we have two more string functions over here so now we have the find function so the find function helps us to find the index or the starting of the index of a particular substring. As you see over here, if I want to know the starting index value of this substring part up, I'll just pass this entire substring into this method find. And this gives us the value of eight. So let's just understand this. So now if I count the index, it'll be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So as you see, this S is placed at index number eight, and that is what this find method gives us. So let's say similarly, if I would have passed in S into this find method, then this would have given us the result of zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Then we have another method called as split. So the split method helps us to divide this string into a list of substrings on the basis of one split criteria. So here we've got this entire string called as I like apples, mangoes and bananas and I would want to divide this entire string into multiple substrings on the basis of comma. So here wherever this method encounters comma it will separate or segregate it into a substring. So I like apples becomes one substring, mangoes become second substring, bananas becomes the third substring. Let's go ahead and implement an example of these two. Let me write str1 over here and what I'll do is I'll just have a new value over here. Let's just say I'll just type I love pizza and I would want to know the starting index of this substring pizza. So I'll have str1.find and inside this I'll just pass in pizza and we get the result of 7. So let's just verify this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Now we'll go ahead and work with the split method. So for that purpose we'd have to create a new string value and I'll name it as fruit 
and here I'll just type in I like apples, guavas, bananas and I'll also write maybe strawberries. Then I'll use the split method fruit dot split inside this I'll give in the separator which will be comma and I've got a list of substrings. I like apples becomes one substring, guavas becomes the next, bananas is the next substring and then we have strawberries as the final substring. Now we'll go ahead and work with the next data structure in Python which is a list. So when it came to a tuple that was an ordered collection of elements enclosed within round braces but a list is an ordered collection of elements which is enclosed within square braces and that is not the only difference. So tuples were immutable that is when you created the elements inside a tuple you could not change them later on. But when you create a list you can actually change the values which are present in it. And this is how we create a list. So L1 that is the name of the list which I'm creating and I'll have square braces and I'll have these different elements stored inside it. Let me delete all of these over here and let me start fresh for the list. I'll add a new comment which will be list and inside this I'll name the object as L1. I'll have square braces over here. I'll have one A and true. Let me print out L1. And this is a new list. Now let me go ahead and check the type of this. Inside type I will pass in L1 and as you guys see this tells us that this is a list. Now as we had extracted individual elements from a tuple similarly we can go ahead and extract individual elements from a list as well and it is the same process. So over here we've got all of these elements and the indexing starts from zero. So it is very important keep in mind guys so the indexing of a list or whatever data structure you're working with in Python it starts from zero and if I want to extract the second element over here the index of the second element will be one because this is index number zero this is index number one and when I pass in L1 of one I'll be able to extract this particular element from this entire list. Similarly if I want to extract a series of elements so I've got all of these if I want to start from index number two. So this will be index number two. So we've got zero, one and two and this will go on till index number four. So as I've already told you when it comes to Python the outer limit is exclusive. So when we give it till five we will be only able to extract till index number four. So that is why over here we'll be extracting two, B and three. Let me create L2 over here and I'll have some elements. I'll have 1, A, then I'll have 2, then I'll have B. After that, I'll have 3 and going ahead, I'll also have C over here. I have successfully created L2. Let me print this out. And now if I want to extract, let's say B from this, let's see what would be the index. It will be 0, 1, 2 and 3. So I'd have to give in L2 inside the parenthesis. I'd have to give in 3 and I am able to extract this particular element from this. Similarly, if I want to extract the last element, I'll give in L2. I'll give in minus 1 over here and I'm able to extract the last element. And if I want to extract a series of elements, then in that case, all I have to do is give in L2. And as we saw in the example, if I want to extract 2, B and 3, so the index for this is 0, 1 and 2, I'll give in 2 over here. And if I want to extract till 3, so this will be 2, 3 and 4, so that is why I'd have to give in index number 5 as well. And we are able to extract 2, B and 3 from this entire list. Now, let's see how can we modify a list. So we have the same list over here. And initially at index number 0 we have the element 1. But if I want to change it to some other element all I have to do is given the index number and I have to assign a new value to that particular index number. So as you guys see I am assigning the value of 100 to this particular index number and I am able to change this value of 1 to 100. Now we can also append a new element at the end or pop the last element and to add a new element at the end we will be using the append method. So we'd have to give in the name of the list we'll use dot operator and then we'll use the append method 
and we'll just give in the value which we'd want to append. So when I type in Sparta over here, this gets appended at the end of the list. Now, similarly, we can go ahead and pop the last element. So if we have to pop the last element, popping basically means removing the last element. So we would have to use l1.pop and it automatically removes the last element. So as you guys see, we had added Sparta, but after using the pop method, this Sparta value was removed from this list. Now we have the same list over here, which is L1. Let me actually, I'll have L2 over here, not L1. Let me print in L2 for you guys over here. And I'd want to change, let's say this particular value over here. So let's say instead of A, I'd want Z. So I'll have L2 and the index for that is one. And instead of A, I'd want to store Z inside this. And let me print out L2 again. So initially we had A, but after changing it, we have Z over there. Now we'll see how to append an element at the end of this list. So we'd have to give an L2, I'll use dot operator. Then I'll be using the append method. And inside this, I'll just add this word called as Python. Let me print in L2 for you guys. And I have added Python at the end of this. Now if I want to pop this out, I have to Right, L2 dot pop and when I click on run, we see that this has been popped out and let me print out L2 again for your reference. We see that the last element has been removed. Now there are some more modifications which we can perform on the list. So let's say if we want to reverse the elements which are present in a list. So as you see in L1, we have all of these elements over here and if I want to reverse the order of these elements, all I have to do is use the reverse method. So I'll type in L1 dot reverse. And when I print this out, we see that the elements are printed backward. Then if we want to insert an element at one particular index value. So when we use the append method, we were able to add an element at the end of a list. But instead of adding an element at the end of a list, if we want to insert an element at some particular index, then this is how we can do. So I'll have L1 dot insert, then I'll give the index position where I'd want to insert. So initially at index number one, we had this value A, but now at index number one, I want to insert Sparta. So this takes in two parameters. First parameter is the index at which I'd want to insert. Second parameter is the value which I'd want to insert. And as you guys see, I have inserted Sparta at index number one. Now, here, as you see, the rest of the elements have been shifted one index towards the right. So A, which was initially present at index number one, is now present at index number two. Two, which was initially present at index number two, is now shifted to index number three. So each element shifts towards the right by one index value. Then we can also go ahead and sort a list. So we have all of these elements over here. Now, if you want to sort these elements in alphabetical order, then we can just go ahead and use the sort method and this sort method sorts all of these with respect to alphabet. So we have apple followed by banana followed by guava and then finally we have mango. So let's use the reverse method insert method and the sort method in Jupyter notebook. So we have the same L2 over here. Now if I want to reverse this, I'll just type in L2 dot reverse and when I click on run, this has been executed. Now let me print in L2. So as you guys see, initially we had this particular sequence over here, which was 1, Z, 2, B, 3, and C. And after using the reverse method, the elements have been reversed. Now we'll go ahead and add an element at one particular index. So if I want to add something at maybe index number 3, so now we've got 0, 1, 2, 3. So we've got 2, which is present at index number 3. But now let's say I'll have L2 dot insert and at index number three, I'd want to insert great learning and let me hit run and let me print out L2. And as you guys see at index number three, I have inserted great learning and the elements which are followed after that shift towards the right by one index value. Now, finally, we'll see how to sort a list. So I'll have L3 and inside this I'll have some elements. So I will have apple. After that I'll have mango. Then let me actually change the sequence over here. So let me start off with mango first. 
then I'll have Apple going ahead I'll have Guava and then maybe I'll have Lychee now this is the sequence which is present in this list and if I want to sort this out I would just have to use the sort method so when I hit L3 dot sort so this has to be a list and not a tuple so this has to be square braces you guys have to keep that in mind let me change this over here let me cut all of this out and let me paste it over here and as you guys see this method has been executed and when I hit on run we have changed the order so we've got apple followed by guava followed by lychee and we have mango at the last now we can also perform the same concatenation and repeating operations on list as well so here we have L1 where we have the elements 1, 2 and 3. Then we have L2 where we have the elements A, B and C. And if I want to concatenate this L2 at the end of L1, all I have to do is use the plus operator. And when I use L1 plus L2, this is what I get. I'll have 1, 2, 3, A, B and C. And if I want to repeat the elements which are present in a list, I would just have to multiply the name of the list with a particular scalar number. So as you guys see, I am multiplying L1 with 3 and I have repeated these elements three times. So here I'll just have concatenating a list and I'll have, I'll just go ahead and create two lists over here. Inside L1, I'll have 1, 2 and 3. Inside L2, I will have A, B and I'll also have C. Now I'll perform L1 plus L2 and we have appended L2 at the end of L1. So you'd have to understand that L1 plus L2 and L2 plus L1 would give you different results. So now when I actually type in L2 plus L1, you would see that we have appended L1 at the end of L2. So this sequence also changes when you change the sequence with the plus operator over here. Now let's go ahead and repeat the element. So I'll have repeat a list and I let's say if I want to repeat the elements which are present in L2. So I'll just multiply L2 with let's say 5 because I want the elements to be repeated 5 times. So I have A, B and C being repeated 5 times. Now we'll head on to the main component which is about the different data structures in Python. So we have tuple, list, dictionary and set. Let's start off with the first data structure which is a tuple. So till now when we have worked with single variables, we were able to store only one value or a single value inside a variable. But with the help of these different data structures such as tuple, list, set and dictionary, we'll be able to store multiple elements inside a data structure and it's not that we can store only multiple elements of a single data type. We can also store elements of different classes or different types into this data structure. So let's start with tuple. What exactly is a tuple? It is an ordered collection of elements enclosed within round braces and tuples are immutable. What do I mean when I say tuples are immutable? So what this basically means is if you create a tuple, then you can't go ahead and change any of the values present in it later on. A tuple cannot be modified once you create it. And this is the example of a tuple over here. So we have round braces. Inside the round braces, I have stored the elements 1, A and true. So as you see, I have elements of different types. So we can store elements of different types into a tuple. So let me create my first tuple in Jupyter Notebook. I'll type in, let me actually have this in a fresh space. I'll add the comment tuple. And over here, I'll type in TUP1. I'll have round braces over here. So first element is 1. Then I'll have Sparta. Then I'll have true over here. And then let me just print out TUP1. So I have created this tuple. Now let me check the type of this type. Inside this, I will pass in TUP1. And this tells us that this is a tuple. Now, if I want to extract individual elements from a tuple, how can I do that? Well, the process is pretty much similar 
as when compared to strings. So if we want to extract the first element from a tuple, so as you guys see over here, I have created a tuple which comprises of all of these elements. 1, A, true, 2, B, false. And if I want to extract the first element, since the first element is present at index number 0, I'd have to give in the name of the tuple and inside the parenthesis, I'd have to give in the index value which will be 0. And I have extracted this particular element from this entire tuple. Similarly, if I want to extract the last element, so if I want to extract the last element, I just have to give in minus 1. So in TUP1, I'll give in minus 1. And with the help of this, I am able to extract the last element. Now, if I want to extract a continuous sequence of elements. So here, if I want to extract A, true and 2, which is a continuous sequence of elements, I'd have to give something like this. So inside the parenthesis, I'll give in 1, colon, 4. So this is the starting value of the index. This is the ending value of the index. Now here, when it comes to Python, you'd have to keep in mind that the ending value is exclusive. The starting value is inclusive. So when you give one, the starting index value A, right? So we have one and we have extracted this element. But when you give in four, this only goes till index number three. So that is why we have extracted only A true and 2. So 2 is present at index number 3. We have extracted A, true and 2. But when we have index number 4, so index number 4, we have the value B, but this is not extracted because index number 4 is exclusive. So let's go ahead and create a new tuple and extract some elements from those tuples. So what I'll do right now is I will have a new tuple called as TUP2. And let me just store some random values inside this. I'll have 1, a true then I'll have 2 B and I'll have false inside this so I have created T U P 2 now if I want to extract the first element so that is obviously present at index number 0 I'll just type in T U P 2 and inside this I'll give in the index value which is 0 and as you guys see I was able to extract this particular element from this entire tuple now similarly if I want to extract the last element so I'd have to type in TUP2, I'd have to give in the parenthesis and to extract the last element, I'd have to give in minus one. And if I want to extract a series of elements, so let's say if I want to extract true, two and B. So here true, the index value would be two. So I'll have TUP2, the starting index value is two and this is so two, three, four, five. So since this goes till 5, 5 is also included, I would have to give 6, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This will go till 6. Let me hit run. And as you guys see, I have included true, 2, b and false. If I, let's say, wanted only till b, so this will be 2, 3, 4. And if I, since this has to be included, I'll just give in 5 over here. And I have extracted only true two and B. Now we'll actually try to modify a tuple. So initially I had told you guys that a tuple is immutable. Now when I say a tuple is immutable, I would basically mean that whatever you store inside it cannot be changed. So here I am actually trying to change the value which I had actually stored in a tuple. So as you guys see TUP1 and inside this the whatever element was present at index number two, I am trying to change it. But we get an error over here and the error is tuple object does not support item assignment. So let me just print in TUP2 over here. I'll hit run and let's say if I want to change this particular value. So I have this is present at 0, 1, 2 and 3 index number 3. So TUP2 and index number 3. I'd want to change that from 2 to 20. Let's see what do we get. We get the same error. Tuple object does not support item assignment because tuple is an immutable object. And that is why you cannot go ahead and change whatever is stored inside a tuple. So we have seen that a tuple cannot be modified. Now let's go ahead and perform some basic operations on top of the tuple. So here we have the same tuple where we have all of these elements over here. 1, A, true, 2, B and false. Now, if you want to find out the length of a tuple or in other words, you would want to find out how many elements are present in a tuple, then we can just go ahead and use this LEN method. 
So this would give us the number of elements which are present in this tuple. And as you see over here, we've got six elements and that is the result over here. Then going ahead, we can also concatenate two tuples. That is, we can attach the elements of one tuple to the back end of another tuple. So here we have TUP1, where we have elements 1, 2, and 3. Then we have TUP2, where we have elements 4, 5, and 6. Now when we are trying to concatenate, all we have to do is use the plus symbol or the plus operator. And when we use TUP1 plus TUP2, we get the result 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let's go ahead and perform these operations in Jupyter Notebook. So I'll just create the tuple again over here. I have TUP1 and let me add in some elements. So I'll have 1, A, true. Then I'll have 2, B. And then I'll also have false over here. So I have created this tuple. Now if I want to check the length of it, all I have to do is use the LEN method. And inside this, I will be passing in the object. And as you guys see, we have the result, which tells us that there are six elements present in this tuple. Now I'll create two more tuples. I'll have TUP2 over here. And inside this, I will have the elements one, two, and three. Going ahead, I'll create another tuple with the name TUP3. And inside this, I will store the elements four, five, and six. Now I would have to perform TUP2 plus TUP3. Let me change the spelling over here. And as you guys see, we have concatenated these elements at the back end of TUP2. So this was a very simple operation. Now, if we want to repeat the elements which are present in a tuple, that is also something which we can perform. So here in this tuple, we just have two elements, which are Sparta and 300. Now, if we want to repeat these elements a certain amount of time, then we have to multiply this with a scalar number. So here, when I'm multiplying TUP1 with 3, I get Sparta 300, Sparta 300, and Sparta 300, which basically means I am just repeating these elements three times. Now, we can also perform repeating and concatenating at the same point of time. So here, we have TUP1 and TUP2. So first, what I'm doing is I am repeating the elements which are present in TUP1. So here, when I use TUP1 into 3, the elements are repeated three times. So I have Sparta 300 repeating three times. Then I am attaching or concatenating TUP2 at the back end of this. So let me add a comment over here. I'll just have repeating elements in a tuple. And now, I have this TUP1 over here. Let me just print out TUP1. And if I want to repeat these elements three times, all I have to do is type in TUP1 into three. And let's see. So as you guys see, 1A true 2B false. So we have this once, then the same thing is being repeated twice, and the same thing is being repeated thrice. Now, similarly, if I want the entire thing to be repeated five times, I would have to multiply this with five. So as you guys see, I have repeated all of the elements five times. Now we'll do repetition and concatenation at the same time. I'll add a new comment over here. Repetition and concatenation. I'll have two tuples over here. I'll have TUP1 where I'll have, let's say, A. B, and then I'll have C, then I'll go ahead and create a new tuple, which will be TUP2. And inside this, I will have X, Y, and then I'll also have Z. And now this is an interesting operation. So I'll have TUP1 into 3 plus TUP2. And let's see the result. So as you guys see, I have repeated the elements which are present in TUP1 three times. So I have ABC, ABC, and ABC. Then I'm adding this at the back end of it, and I get X, Y, and Z. So this was an, another simple operation. Now we also have some simple tuple functions. So if you have a tuple and if you want to find out the minimum value and the maximum value which are present in it, all we have to do is use the min method and the max method. So over here, I have these elements. And if I want to find out the minimum value which is present over here, all I have to do is use the min method and I pass in the TUP1 object inside this. And as you guys see, this method tells us that the minimum value which is present in this tuple is 1. Going ahead, similarly, we use the max method. 
and when we pass in TUP1, this tells us that the maximum value which is present in this tuple is 5. So I'll have TUP1 and let me add some numerical values inside this. So I'll add some random numbers in a random order over here. So I have 825107. Now if I want to, I have to remove the C over here. Now if I want to find out the minimum value which is present in it, all I have to do is use the min method and inside this I'll be passing in TUP1. And as you guys see, this method tells us that the minimum value which is present in this tuple is 0. Similarly, if you want to find out the maximum value, I'll use the max method and inside this I'll again pass in TUP1 and we get the result of 8. This brings us to the end of this tutorial on tuples in Python. So dictionary is an unordered collection of key value pairs enclosed within curly braces and a dictionary again is mutable. So what exactly are key value pairs? Let's see an example of that. So over here we are creating a dictionary where we have two key value pairs. So the first key is apple, second key is orange. First value is 10, second value is 20. So you can also consider it this way. Let's say we have the name of the fruit and the cost of the fruit or maybe the quantity of the fruit. So we have apple and let's say there are 10 apples. Then we have orange and let's say there are 20 oranges. And you will be separating the key with the value with this colon over here. Now let me just delete all of this and let's start fresh for our dictionary. So instead of list, I'll just type in dictionary over here. And let's say I'll create this dictionary like this and I'll have, um, let's say my first fruit is mango and I have 10 mangoes with me. Then I'll have apple and let's say I have 20 apples. Then I have lychee and I have 30 lychees and finally I would have strawberry and I would have 40 strawberries with me. Let me print out the result over here. So this is our first dictionary which we have just created and just to ensure that we have actually created a dictionary let me check the type of it. So type of fruit would tell us that this is of dict type which is basically your dictionary. Now, once we have created a dictionary, we can actually go ahead and extract the individual keys and values which are present over here. So this is our dictionary and if you want to extract only the keys, so this is what you see on the left side of the colon, those are our keys and if you want to extract only the keys, all you have to do is use the name of the dictionary, follow it up with the keys method and we'll get all of the keys which are present in this dictionary. Similarly, if you want to extract all of the values, we would have to use the values method. So when I type in fruit.values, I am able to extract all of the values which are present over here. So I'll have fruit, which is a dictionary, which is already present. And if I want to extract all of the keys, I'll just go ahead and use the keys method. And as you guys see, I am able to extract all of the keys which are present. Similarly, if I want to extract the values, I'll type in fruit.values and I have extracted all of the values which are present. Now, since dictionary is mutable, we can modify it. So that would mean we can add a new element or we can change an existing element. So here we had only four elements, but if I want to add a fifth element, so here we don't have mango initially, but if I want to add mango, all I have to do is use the name of the dictionary, then inside parenthesis, I'll add the new key. So this is what you see inside parenthesis I'm adding the new key and I'm adding the value to it. So here as you guys see I have attached this new key value pair at the end of this dictionary. Similarly if I want to change an existing element so initially the value of apple was 10 but if I want to change the value then inside the parenthesis I'll just give in the key and I'll assign a new value to it. So initially we had 10 now we have modified it to 100. Now we'll see how to add a new element. So I'll have fruit over here. Let me just print it out. We have four elements. Now let me add a new element inside this. So I'll have fruit. I'll have the square braces and let's say the new fruit which I'll be adding is guava. And let's say I have 50 guavas with me. 
and let me print out fruit right now and let's check the results so as you guys see we have attached this new key value pair at the end of this dictionary and finally let's see actually how can we modify an existing element so we've got let's say if i want to modify this particular key value pair so i have lychee and the value of lychee is 30 so i'll have fruit inside this i'll give in the key which is lychee and i want to change 30 to 300 i'll just assign 300 to this and let me print this out and as you guys see initially the value was 30 i have successfully changed it to 100 now we'll go ahead and work with some dictionary functions. So let's say if we have two dictionaries over here, we have fruit one and fruit two. So in fruit one, we have apple and orange and fruit two, we have banana and guava. And if I want to append the elements of fruit two to fruit one, or in other words, if you want to concatenate the fruit two values to fruit one, all we have to do is use the update method. So I have fruit one, and I'll use update method and I'll pass in fruit 2 inside this. So as you guys see, we have appended banana and guava to the end of fruit 1. Then similarly, we can go ahead and pop an element from a dictionary. So we can, uh, so if we want to pop any key value pair, so inside the pop method, we would have to give in the key which we'd want to pop. So we had orange, but I don't really like oranges. So that is why I went ahead and I popped out orange. So as you guys see, orange is not present in this particular list. Now let's create two more dictionaries. I have fruit one and I'll have two fruits inside this. So I'll start with mango and I have 10 mangoes. Then I'll have apple and maybe I have 20 apples with me. Then I'll have fruit two. And in fruit two, let's say I'll start off with guava and I have 30 guavas with me. Then going ahead, I'll have lychee and i'll have 40 lychees with me so i have created these two dictionaries so we have made a mistake over here let's actually check what this mistake is so instead of the equal to operator i'd have to give in colon over here that is important so i have created fruit one and fruit two let me print out fruit one and fruit two for your sake and once we have printed these two, let me go ahead and actually append the values of fruit two to fruit one. So for this, I'll have to use fruit one, then I'll use in the dot operator over here. And after that, I will use the update method. And inside the update method, I'll be passing in fruit two. And let me print out. Let me close this first. Now, let me go ahead and print out fruit one. Now, as you guys see, I have appended the values of fruit 2 to fruit 1. Now we have fruit 1 already, but let's say if I want to pop out something from this. So let's say from this, if I want to pop out the value of lychee, I'll have fruit 1. Then I'll use the pop method. So fruit 1 dot pop. So We have an error because we'd actually have to give a key inside this. So because I'd want to pop out lychee, I'll give in lychee over here and we have successfully popped out lychee from this. Now we'll head on to the last data structure in Python, which is set. So set is an unordered and unindexed collection of elements enclosed within square braces. So when we say unordered, so in whatever sequence you insert the elements in a set, those that particular order does not remain intact and also when we say it is not indexed you can't extract elements from a set with a particular index value because there is no proper ordering and also you'd have to keep in mind that in a set duplicates are not allowed so you can't have the same element twice but if you actually given the same element twice what happens is the set takes it only once and uh, we are creating one particular set over here. And if you want to add a new element inside this, so initially we are creating this set where we have all of these elements. So we have one, a, true, two, two, b, and false. And if I want to add a new element at the end of this or somewhere, so I'll just use s1.add and this is how we can 
insert the new element inside this. Now let's say if instead of adding just one particular element, if I want to add multiple elements at the same time. So instead of the add method, we'll be using the update method. And with the update method, I am passing in these list of values, which are 10, 20 and 30. And as you guys see, I have inserted 10, 20 and 30 inside this. But then again, you have to keep in mind that the order is not maintained in a set. So these are inserted randomly. And if you want to remove a particular element, you can just use the remove method and you will pass in the element that you'd want to remove. Again, since there is no indexing, you can't remove elements with an index value. You would have to give in the value which you'd want to remove explicitly. So let's create our first set. So I'll have S1. I'll just add some elements over here. I'll have A, B, C, D, E and F. Let me print out S1 for your reference. And this is what we have. Now, let's say I'll add some duplicates inside this and let's see what happens. So I'll have A repeating three times. Then I'll have B also repeating two times. Then I'll have C repeating two times. Now, if I print this out, as you guys see, we have only A, B, C, D, E and F. Even though A is repeating three times, we'll only have one unique value of A. Similarly, even though B and C are repeating two times, we'll only have one unique value of B. Now, if I want to go ahead and add a new element inside this, I'll use the add method. So S1.add and inside this, I'll just add Sparta. So when I use S1.sparta and when I print S1, so we have inserted Sparta over here. Similarly, if you want to pop out something or remove something, we will have to use the remove method. So I'll have S1 dot remove over here. And inside this, let's say if I want to remove the element E, I'll just pass in E over here and let me print out S1 again. So we have successfully removed the element E from this entire set. Now we'll work with some set functions. So here we have two sets S1 and S2. In S1 we have the elements 1, 2 and 3. In S2 we have the elements A, B and C. Now if we want to combine all of the elements which are present in S1 and S2, then we can use the union operator. So S1 dot union S2 will give us a union of S1 and S2. And as you guys see in the resultant we have 1, 2, 3, A, B and C. Similarly, we have two sets over here and if we want only the common elements which are present in both of the sets. So here we have 1 to 6, here we have 5 to 9. If you want the common elements, I would use the intersection method. So when I use S1 dot intersection S2, you will see that we have 5 and 6 common in S1 and S2 and that is the result which we get. Let me have S1 over here. And in this, I'll have 1, 2, and 3. I'll have S2 in which I'll store 4, 5, and 6. Now, let me use the union operator. So, I'll have S1.union and inside this, I'll be passing in S2. And as you guys see, I have appended 4, 5, 6 at the end of S1. Now, similarly, if I want to find out the common elements, so let me make some modifications in S1. So, in S1, let's say I have from 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and then S2, let's say I have the elements 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. Now, if I want to find out the common elements which are present in S1 and S2, I'll have S1 dot intersect and inside this I'll be passing in S2 and uh, we seem to have an error over here. So this has to be intersection and not intersect. Let me click on run. So as you guys see, by using the intersection operator, we have the common elements which are four and five. Now we'll understand about flow control statements in Python. And in flow control statements, we'll have decision making statements and looping statements. We'll start off with decision making statements. And as you can get from the name itself, decision making statements would help us to make a decision on the basis of a condition. And we have a very good example over here right in front of us. So let's say you would want to play football, but it's actually raining outside. 
So the condition over here is if it's raining outside, then you can't play. You'd have to sit inside. On the other hand, if it's not raining, else it is not raining, then you can go out and play football. So this is a very good example of if else statement. Then let's look at another example. Let's say you have your main exam coming up and you go ahead and give a mock exam. And in that mock exam, if you score greater than 70 marks, then your parents tell you that they'll buy you an ice cream. But on the other hand, if you score less than 70 marks, then you would have to give another mock test. So this again is an example of if else statement. So now that we've understood how if else statements work, let's go to Jupyter Notebook and implement them. So here we have two variables A and B. We have stored the value of 10 in A and 20 in B. And we are trying to see if the value of B is greater than the value of B. That is, we are checking if 20 is greater than 10. And if that is evaluated to true, we will just go ahead and print out B is greater than A. And this is the syntax as you see. We'll give an if, the keyword if, you'll follow it up with the condition. And in the condition, we are checking if B is greater than A. So is 20 greater than 10? That is evaluated to true. And since that is evaluated to true, when I hit on run, I'll get this result, which is B is greater than A. Now let me change the condition over here. So instead of checking if B is greater than A, I want to check if the value which is present in A is greater than the value which is present in B. So I'm basically checking if 10 is greater than 20. And obviously this evaluates to false. And since this evaluates to false, whatever is present inside the body of this if will be skipped out. And when I hit run, you'll see that I'll not get any result over here because this is evaluated to false. So whenever if is evaluated to false, you need something else. So that is why we have this else keyword over here. So here we are checking if A is greater than B. And since this has been evaluated to false, I'll give an else keyword over here and I will print out whatever will happen. Since this is false, I would have to print out B is greater than A. And when I hit on this, you would see that I'll get B is greater than A and which is actually right. So this is about if else condition. Then we have another variation of if else, which is if elif else. So with the help of this, we can compare multiple variables together or we can have multiple conditions together. And this time I'd want to find out the greatest value among three values. So I have three variables over here, A, B and C. I'm storing the value of 10 in A, the value of 20 in B and the value of 30 in C. And once I do that, using if, I start off by checking if the value of A is greater than B and also if the value of A is greater than C. So as you can look over here, I am giving two conditions and those two conditions have been joined with the help of this AND operator. If A is greater than B, and if A is greater than C, and if that is the case, I'll go ahead and print out A is the greatest. And if either of these is evaluated to false, then with respect to AND operator, you know that if either of these is false or both of them are false, then this part will be skipped. So here, if A is greater than B, we are checking if 10 is greater than 20, that is obviously false. And we here we are checking if A is greater than C. So is 10 greater than 30? That again is false. So false and false will be evaluated to false. And that is why we'll be skipping out this particular line. Then we'll head on to LF. And this time we are checking if B is greater than A and B is greater than C. So if B is greater than A, 20 is greater than 10. This is evaluated to true. After this, we are checking if 20 is greater than 30. This is evaluated to false. So true and false is again false. And that is why we'll skip this as well. And finally, we'll enter the final else statement and we'll just go ahead and print out C is the greatest. So this is about if elif else. Then we can also go ahead and use the if statement with a tuple. So here we have created a tuple where we have three elements, A, B and C. And once we create this tuple, I am trying to find out if the element A is present in this tuple. So here, if A in tube 1 
then I go ahead and print out A is present in TUP1. And as you see, since this is evaluated to false, or in other words, this element is present in this tuple, I am able to print out A is present in TUP1. Now, on the other hand, if I would want to check if an element Z is present in this tuple, so here I have if Z in TUP1 print, Z is present in TUP1 and as you see, I don't get anything because this element is not present. So here what I'll do is, I'll add the else statement and I'll print out Z is not present in TUP1 and this time I'll get the result because this is evaluated to false and will print out whatever is there in the else condition. And this time we are going ahead and using the if statement with the list. So again, we are creating a list L1 over here and we have these three elements A, B and C. And this time what we are doing is we are checking if the value which is present at 0th index of this list is equal to A. And if that value is equal to A, I would want to change that value to 100. So you see if L1 of 0 is double equal to A. I am assigning a new value over here and that value is equal to 100 and after I run this you would see that initially the value is A and I have changed that value to 100. Now let's say if I run this back again and if I would want to change this value from A to Z, I'll just have Z over here. And you would see that initially the value is A and this time I have changed the value to Z. And finally, we will be applying the if statement with a dictionary. So here we have created a dictionary D1 where we have three key value pairs K1, K2, K3. The value of K1 is 10, the value of K2 is 20 and the value of K3 is 30. And with the help of the if statement, I am adding 100 more to the first key over here. So the condition is if D1 of K1 is double equal to 10, I'm checking if the value for the key K1 is equal to 10, then I will add 100 more to this by using this condition. So D1 of K1 is equal to D1 of K1 plus 100. So I have an error over here. I'd have to initialize D1. And as you guys see, initially, the values were 10, 20 and 30 and after using the if condition, I have added 100 more to the first value of the first key. So those were decision making statements. Now we'll head on to looping statements and these are used to repeat a task a certain number of times. And again, we have a very beautiful example over here. Let's say you have a bucket and you'd want to fill up that bucket with a mug of water. Now what you'll do is consider the mug and the bucket to be empty at this point of time. First, you'll fill up the mug and you'll pour this water into the bucket. Then you'll check if the bucket is full or not. After this, again, you'll take a mug full of water, then pour it back into the bucket. Again, you'll check if the bucket is full or not. Then next time again, you'll take a mug full of water, pour it back into the bucket. And again, you will check if the bucket is full or not. And this process goes on until the bucket is completely filled up with water and you will stop this only when the bucket is filled. So here what you're doing is you're looping or you are performing the same task again and again until a condition is met. We have another example over here. Let's say you're listening to your favorite song and you put that song on loop. So here the condition is the same song will be kept on playing until you either close the app or maybe you switch off your phone. So this is the condition over here. The song is on loop until you close the app, you stop the song or maybe you switch off your phone. Then we have a very interesting example. So at the end of every month, you will get credited with a salary amount. So here what is happening is if the date is equal to 30th or 31st and if it is the last day of the month, you will have salary created into your bank account. This again happens in a loop. So these are some examples of looping statements. And we have two types of looping statements in Python, which are for and while we'll be working with both of them. So we'll go ahead and start off with the for loop. 
So here we have created a list called as fruits and this has these three fruits over here, apple, mango and banana. Now with the help of this for loop, I would want to print out all of the individual elements which are present over here. So I'll have for i in fruits print of i. So here i what happens is initially the value of i will be equal to apple. Then the value of i will be equal to mango. Then the value of i will be equal to banana. And this will end once i reaches the last element which is present in this list. And that is how we are printing out each element which is present in this list. So this is a very simple example of how we can work with the for loop. Then we can also have a nested for loop where we'll have one for loop inside another for loop. And here we have two lists again. We have one list comprising of different colors and we have another list comprising of different items. So the colors are blue, green and yellow and the items are book, ball and chair. And what I'm doing is I have an outer for loop which would help me to pick a color. So here it is for i in color, then inside the outer for loop, I have an inner for loop, which goes for j in item, which should help me to choose an item and I print out i comma j. Let's understand how this for loop works over here. So initially value of i is equal to blue and we enter the for loop and the value of j over here will be equal to book. So I print out i comma j, it will be blue book. Then value of J is incremented, it becomes ball and I print out blue ball. Again value of J is incremented, it becomes chair, then I print out blue chair. Then I go back to the outer loop and blue is incremented, then the color becomes green. Then I have green book, green ball, green chair. Again after this value of green becomes yellow, then I print out yellow book, yellow ball and yellow chair. This is how you can work with nested for loop. After the for loop, we have the while loop. So while again would help us to repeat a particular task and this task is repeated on the basis of a condition. And over here, I am trying to print out the first 10 numerical numbers using a while loop. Here I have initialized a variable called as i and I have assigned the value of one inside this variable. And after this, I am checking if the value of i is less than or equal to 10. And if the value of i is less than or equal to 10, I enter this while loop and I print out i, then I increment the value of i. So let's understand what is happening in this while loop. Initially value of i is equal to 1. So the condition is, is 1 less than or equal to 10. And since that is true, I go inside the for loop, I print out 1, then i value is incremented, it becomes 2. Then I go back and I check if 2 is less than or equal to 10. This again is true. I head back, I print out 2, then I increment the value of i, it becomes 3. Then I am checking if 3 is less than or equal to 10. This again is true. I head back into the while loop, I print out 3, then i value is incremented, it becomes 4. Then again I am checking if 4 is less than or equal to 10. This is true. I come back into the while loop, I print out 4, then I will increment the value of 5, it becomes 5. Then we will proceed the same way till the value of i is equal to 10. When the value of i is equal to 10, I am checking if 10 is less than or equal to 10. And this condition is true. I print out 10 over here. After this, I have i plus 1, value of i becomes 11. And this time when I check is 11 less than or equal to 10, this condition fails. And this is when I come out of this while loop. And this is the result which I get over here. Similarly, instead of the first 10 numbers, if I want the first 15 numbers, I'll just go ahead and change this value over here. And you would see that I have printed out the first 15 numbers. Now using the while loop, I can also go ahead and print the two multiplication table. Here I have i and I'm assigning the value of 1 to i. Then I have a new variable called as n and I'm assigning a value of 2 to this new variable. And in the while loop again the condition is while i is less than or equal to 10. And while this condition is true, I will print out 
n into i is equal to n into i, then I am incrementing the value of i. So let's again understand what is happening inside the while loop. So initially value of i is equal to 1. So the condition will be while 1 is less than or equal to 10, which is true. I come back over here and I print out n into i, which will be 2 into 1 is equal to 2. So I print out this. Then I increment the value of i. It becomes 2. Is 2 less than or equal to 10? Yes, that is true. I come inside. Then this time I print out 2 into 2 is equal to 4. Then i value is incremented. It becomes 3. So is 3 less than or equal to 10? That again is true. So this time I will have 2 into 3, which is equal to 6. And I print this out. And this process continues till i value is equal to 10. And when i value is equal to 10, I will have 10 is less than or equal to 10, which is true. So here it will be 2 into 10 is equal to 20 and we'll print that out. And after that, when we increment the value of i, it will become 11. So it's 11 less than or equal to 10, which is false. And this is when we will come out of this while loop. So these were some examples with the help of while loop. Now we'll also see how to apply this while loop on top of a list. So here we have this list L1 with all of these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And I would want to add 100 to each individual element of this list. So I start off by initializing this variable i. I given the value of 0 and this while loop will go on till the length of the list or in other words the number of elements which are there in the list. So what is the length? It will be 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Initially, value of i is equal to 0. So we are checking if 0 is less than 5, which is true. We come inside the while loop. Here it will be L1 of 0 is equal to L1 of 0 plus 100. So it will be 1 plus 100. We'll print out 1 plus 100 over here. Then we are incrementing value of i. It becomes 1. So it's 1 less than 5. It is true. So here we will have L1 of 1 is equal to L1 of 1 plus 100. So it will be 2 plus 100 which will become 102. And this is how we'll go on and print out or add 100 to each element of this list. Now that we have built a strong foundation, let's elevate your skills. It's time for advanced Python concepts. Get ready to delve into object oriented programming, inheritance and exception handling along with efficient file handling techniques. Now we'll head on to one of the most important concepts in Python, which is object oriented programming. Now, when you look around you, you would see that you are surrounded with objects. The laptop, which is there in front of you, that is an object. The phone, which is there in your hand, that again is an object. The bottle, which is there beside you, that again is an object. Now, if you'd want to represent all of these real world objects in the programming paradigm, you would need an object oriented programming language. So you would have a lot of object oriented programming languages and Python is also an object oriented programming language because it allows us to represent all of these real world entities in a programming world. Now, to understand the concept of object oriented programming, we would need to understand two main components of it, which are classes. And then we obviously have objects. So let's start with this term called as class. So what exactly is a class? Simply put, you can consider a class to be a template or a blueprint for real world entities. And we have a very simple example over here. Let's take the example of a phone. Now, when we talk about a phone, a phone would again have two things associated with it. It will have some properties and it will have a certain behavior associated with it. Now, when I say properties, the phone will have a color associated with it. The phone will have a cost associated with it. And the phone will also have a certain battery life associated with it. And along with these batteries, when I say a phone will have certain behaviors associated with it. Now, what do I mean by behaviors? I simply mean that with the help of a phone, you can make calls. With the help of a phone, you can watch certain videos on it. And also some phones allow you to play games in it. So this class, this phone class has properties and behavior associated with it. 
end, what exactly is a class in Python? You can consider this class to be a user defined data type. So as we have predefined data types, so we had looked at all of these predefined data types, which were integer, float, boolean and string. So similar to these predefined data types, we can create a user defined data type and that user defined data type will be this class. So here what we're doing is we are creating this class, this user defined data type called as mobile. And this user defined data type will have attributes and methods inside it. So these attributes are nothing but the properties of the class and these methods are nothing but the behavior of the class. Now that this is clear, let's understand the next component of object oriented programming, which is object. So we already know what is a class. Now object is nothing but a specific instance of a class. So when we say we have a mobile class, the specific instances of this mobile. So we have Apple, Motorola and Samsung. So Apple, Motorola and Samsung would be objects of this class phone or mobile. And if you want examples of what exactly is an object. So as we have these predefined data types, so these are integers. So a is an integer variable and I'm storing the value 10 inside this. Similarly, B is an integer value and I'm storing the value 20 inside this. So similarly, if we have the mobile data type, then for this mobile data type, we have the objects, Apple, Motorola and Samsung. So that was a brief intro to object oriented programming. Now let's see how can we actually create a class in Python. So to create a class in Python, we'd have to start off by giving this keyword called as class. Then going ahead, we will give in the name of the class. And by convention, you would have to remember that the name of the class needs to be capital. The first letter has to be capital. So that is why we have given capital P over here. So the name of this class is phone and inside this we are defining two methods. So the, with the help of these methods, we can have the behavior of this class. So I am having this first method called as make call and inside this method, I'm just printing out making phone call. And over here, as you see, this method takes in a parameter, which is self. So for now, just understand that with the help of this self parameter, we will be able to invoke the attributes which are present in this class. Just understand this for now. And as we'll go ahead through object oriented programming, it will be much more clear to you guys. So as we have created this particular method, similarly, we will create another method called as play game. And this again takes in one parameter, which is self. And all I'm doing is printing out playing game. So now that I have created my blueprint or my class over here, I would have to create a specific instance of it. Or in other words, I'd have to create an object of this phone class. So I'll just write down phone over here and I will store it in this object called as P1. And now that I have the object of this class, I can go ahead and invoke the methods which are present in this class with the help of this object. So when I type in p1 dot make call with the help of this, I will be able to invoke this method and I am printing out making phone call. Similarly, when I invoke p1 dot play game, I am invoking this method and I am printing out playing game. So this is how we can create a class and an object in Python. So let's go to Jupyter notebook and work with this example. So my task would be to create a class. So I'll have class. I'll give the name of the class as phone. I'll give in a colon over here. And after this, I would have to create a method and to create a method. We already know that we will be using the def keyword and I will give the name of this method as make call. And we know that this takes in only one parameter, which is self. And inside this, I will just have a print statement, which will be making a phone call and once I have this method, I will go ahead and create another method over here. So I will call this method as play game def of play game and I'll have self over here. Again, I'll have a print statement and here I will write down playing a game. So I have created my phone class over here and now that I have created this phone class, I would have to create an object of this. So here I will have P1 
P1 is equal to phone. So I'll have to give in parenthesis over here. And this is how I am creating an object of this phone class. And now that I have the object ready, so with the help of the dot operator, I can invoke both of these methods. So I'll start off by invoking the make call method. So I will have make underscore call. And when I hit on run, you would see that I have successfully printed out making a phone call. Similarly, now when I have P1 dot play game, you would see that I have printed out playing a game. So we have created our first class and we have also created the object for this class. And now in the methods which were present in the previous class, there were no additional parameters. We had only one parameter known as self. And with the help of that self parameter, we were just able to access the attributes which were present. And we did not actually have any attributes in the previous class. So we will modify that. So to our phone class, or actually the methods which are present in our phone class, we will be adding some additional attributes. So we are adding a new method over here called as set color. And this set color method over here takes in two parameters. The first parameter is self because it is compulsory. Then we will have this new attribute called as color. And with this color parameter, what I'm doing is I will have an attribute called as color and I am assigning this color to the attribute color, which is present in my phone class. Similarly, I have another method called as set cost. This again has two parameters. First is self because again it is compulsory. Then we have this additional parameter called as cost. And I would also have an attribute called as cost in the phone class. And what I'm doing is I am assigning this value of cost to my attribute cost in the phone class. So now that I have assigned the value of color and cost to my attributes, what I'd have to do is show the value of color and show the value of cost. So now that I have set these, I would need two methods to show the color and show the cost. So that is why I will create a new method called as show color. And this only has the self attribute or the self parameter over here because I'm not assigning anything. And all I have to do is return the value. And if I have to return the value, I'll just use this keyword return and I'll print out return self dot color. Similarly, if I would have to return the cost, I would have this new method called as show cost. This takes in only one parameter, which is self. And I'll go ahead and return here. As you see, I will have return self dot cost. And these are the additional methods which I have. And then I have the same methods which are make call and play game. And inside make call, all we are doing is printing out making a phone call. And inside play game, all we are doing is printing out playing a game. So let's go ahead and modify our phone class, which we had created earlier. I'll delete these records from over here. Let me cut this entire thing, or actually I can write it over here itself. So these are the methods which were present earlier. I would have to add four more methods inside this. So to create a method, we would have to use the def keyword and I would have to set a color to the attribute. So I will use this method called as set color. The first parameter is self because it is compulsory. Then I will have this additional parameter called as color. And I am assigning the value of this color to the attribute color by using the self attribute or self parameter, which I have passed in. Now, similarly, I will have another method over here. So as I have set the color, similarly, I would have to set the cost as well. So def, I will have a new method called as set cost. This would take in two parameters. The first parameter would be self and the second parameter would be equal to cost. And over here, I will write down self dot cost is equal to cost. And this is how I'm assigning the value of cost. And after this, I would have to print out the value of color and cost, I would need one method called as show color and the parameter will only be self. And what this does is it would just return out the color. So it will be self dot color. Then I would need another method called as show cost. And this again would take in only one parameter, which is self. And with the help of this, I am returning out the cost. So here I will have self dot cost. 
So these are the four additional methods which I have added inside this. So it seems that we have an error over here. Let me see what exactly is this. So this is line number seven and this is set dot cost. So sure, I would actually have to give in a comma instead of full stop over there. And now we see that we have successfully created this. Now after creating this class, I would have to create an object. So I will have P1 is equal to phone. And now that I have created this object, with the help of this object, I can access these methods and assign values to the color and cost. So I'll just invoke P1 dot set color and I will set the color of this phone to be equal to, let me keep it blue over here. Now, similarly, I will also set the cost of it. So I'll have P1 dot set cost and I will set the cost to be equal to, let's say $999. Now that I have set the value of color and cost, I can print out these two values. So let me delete this. So I will have P1 dot show color. And now when I hit on run, you would see that the color is blue. Similarly, when I have P1 dot show cost, you would see that the cost is equal to 999. So this is how we can have additional attributes and pass in values to the attributes which are of which are belonging to a class with the help of these additional parameters. Now there's a special example or a special concept in object oriented programming, which is known by the name of a constructor. So if you have worked with other languages such as C++ or Java, and if you have learned about the concept of inheritance, you would know about a constructor. So normally in C++ or Java, a constructor is a special method which would have the same name as that of the class. And this would help us to initialize the values of the attributes during the object creation itself. So that is what a constructor is in Python itself. It's just that the constructor in Python, the name of this method will not be equal to the name of the class. So the constructor in Python goes by the name of init method. So here, as you see, this is our constructor. We have our init method over here and I have def. So in it, we have the prefix of two underscores. And also after init, we will have two underscores over here. So we have our constructor ready. And as I've told you, with the help of a constructor, we will be able to assign values to the attributes during object creation itself. So obviously we will have some parameters inside this and with the help of these parameters, we'll be able to assign values to the attributes. So in this employee class, let's say I would have four attributes called as name, age, salary, and gender. So I'll have these four additional parameters over here. And I am assigning the value of name to this attribute. Similarly, I am assigning the values of age, salary and gender. Now that the constructor is ready and I have assigned the values, I would have to show the values out. And to show the values, I have this new method called as employee details. And I will create this method like this. So I'll have def employee details and I will pass in self inside this because I'm not assigning anything and this is the default or the de and we definitely have to give in the self parameter inside this and inside this method I'm just printing out the name of the employee the age of the employee the salary of the employee and the gender of the employee and and once we create this class it will go ahead and create an object of it so here when we are creating an object as you see we have e1 is equal to employee and during the instantiating of the object itself, as you see, I am passing in the values for all of the attributes. So as you see over here, the name, I'm assigning the name to be equal to Sam. Similarly, the age, I am setting it to be equal to 32. Then the salary, I am setting it to be equal to 85,000. And the gender, I'm setting it to be equal to male. 
and this is how I'm assigning all of the values during instantiating of the object. And once I have created the object and since I have also given all of the values to the attributes, I can directly invoke the employee details method. And when I invoke the employee details method, you would see that I am able to print out all of the details. Name of the employee is Sam, age of the employee is 32, salary of the employee is 85,000 and gender of the employee is male. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and implement this concept of constructor. So I'll just add this comment over here, constructor, and I will create this new class. So I will have class employee and inside this, I will go ahead and create the init method def I will have two underscores then I'll write down in it then again I'll have two more underscores over here so I'll start off by giving the self attribute inside this then I will start off by giving the name attribute then I'll give in the age of the employee after this I will give in the salary and then finally we have the gender of the employee and all I have to do is assign these parameters to the attributes which are present so I will have self dot name is equal to name self dot age is equal to age self dot salary is equal to salary and self dot gender is equal to gender again so i have created this constructor over here after this i would have to create a new method called as show employee details let me just write down the name of this method so i will have show employee details and this will have only one parameter which will be self and inside this method, I'm going to print out all of the values of the different attributes which are present. So I'll start off by printing the name. So I'll have name of the employee is, I'll have self dot name. Then I will have age of the employee is, here I'll have self dot age. Then I will have salary of the employee is here I will have self dot salary and finally I will have gender of the employee is and here I will have self dot gender so let me hit on run and I have successfully created this class where I have a constructor inside this now I can go ahead and create an object of this. So I will have E1 over here and what I will do is I will give in the name of this class, which will be employee. The first value inside this should be the name of this person. So let's say this uh, employee's name is Sam, then Sam is 28 years old. And let's say Sam around uh, earns around $75,000. Let's make this $75,000 and Sam is male. So I have created this object over here. Now that I have assigned all of the values, I can go ahead and invoke the show employee details method. Here I will have E1 dot show employee details. And when I invoke this, you would see that I have this result name of the employee is Sam age of the employee is 28 salary of the employee is 75,000 and gender of the employee is male. Now we'll understand the concept of inheritance. So simply put inheritance is when you derive some properties from something else and a real world example of inheritance would be you'll be inheriting some of your features from your parents. And your parents will be inheriting some of their features from their grandparents. Or in other words, let's say you will sort of look like your parents in a way and your parents might look like your grandparents in a way. So you're inheriting some physical features from your parents. Now, if we have to relate this concept of inheritance in Python, this basically means that we will have a child class and a parent class and the child class would inherit some features or all of the features from the parent class. And we have an example of inheritance over here. So what we're doing is we are starting off by creating the parent class. So the parent class is called as vehicle. So we will have class of vehicle. And inside this, I have two methods. The first method is the default constructor. 
and in this constructor i have two additional parameters which are mileage and cost and i am assigning the value of mileage then i'm also assigning the value of cost and once this is done i will go ahead and create another method called as show details and inside show details i am printing out i am a vehicle then i'll go ahead and print out the mileage of the vehicle and also i'll print out the cost of the vehicle so now that the parent class is ready i would have to create an object of the parent class so here i have v1 is equal to vehicle and i pass in 500 and 500 so this 500 would denote the mileage of this vehicle so this might basically mean 500 miles per gallon then we have the cost which is 500 again so this would mean that the cost of this vehicle is 500 dollars so now that we have created this object we can directly invoke the show details method with this object so i have v1.show details and as you have in the result i'm a vehicle mileage of the vehicle is 500 and cost of the vehicle is 500 let's go to jupyter notebook and implement this let me delete all of these previous examples from over here let me keep it fresh and i will create this new vehicle or new class called as vehicle over here we will start off by creating the constructor i would need the init method over here and the first parameter is obviously self after this i would need the mileage of the vehicle and i would also need the cost of the vehicle then i'll go ahead and set out these two values so i'll have self dot mileage is equal to mileage after this i will have self dot cost is equal to cost now that I have created this constructor, I would have to show the details. So I will have show vehicle over here. And this will just have one parameter, which is self. And inside this method, I will go ahead and print out some basic things. So first I'll be printing out, I am a vehicle. Then I will go ahead and print out mileage of the vehicle is here i'll have self dot mileage then i'll go ahead and print out the cost so i'll have cost of the vehicle is here i'll have self dot cost and this is how i have created this class and after creating this class i would have to create an object of it so i will have v1 is equal to vehicle and inside this i would have to pass in the mileage value first so let's say this vehicle would give me around 120 miles per gallon and the cost of this vehicle is around 800 dollars so i have set these values over here then i can just go ahead and invoke the show vehicle method so here i will have v1 dot show vehicle and when I run this, we have an error over here. Let's understand what exactly is this error. So we have self dot mileage. We have self dot cost inside this vehicle object has no attribute mileage. So I'm setting M I L E A G E. Let me keep it over here. Now, when I run this, so as you see, I have successfully printed out I'm a vehicle, mileage of the vehicle is 120 and cost of the vehicle is 800. So we have created our parent class. Now it's time to go ahead and create our child class. So to create the child class, we will again go ahead and give the name of this class, which is car. So we'll have class of car and to inherit something inside the parenthesis. So as you see, this class we did not have any parenthesis over here but after this child class we'll have a parenthesis and inside this we will pass in the name of the parent class which is vehicle and this child class will have a method of its own which is show car this takes only one parameter which is self and i'm going ahead and printing out i am a car with this method now, once I create this child class, I will create an object of it, which is C1. Now here, as you see, even though I don't have a constructor inside this child class, but I'm passing in some values. This is because since this car class is inheriting the vehicle class, this will automatically have these two methods inside it. So this 
car class will have the init method and also the show details method. So this car class will have three methods in total, which are the constructor from the parent class, then the show details method from the parent class, and also this show car method, which is explicit for this car class. Now, since this also has the constructor, we would have to pass in the values for the mileage and the cost. And as you see, I am passing in the value for mileage, which is 200 and the value for cost, which is 1200. Then I'll go ahead and invoke the show details method with the help of this object of the child class. So as you see, this object is of child class, but this method is of parent class. But since this child class inherits the parent class, that is why we are able to invoke this method. And when you see the result, we have I'm a vehicle, mileage of vehicle is 200 and cost of vehicle is 1200. And since we also have the show car method, which is part of the car class, we can directly invoke it. So when I have C1 dot show car, I get the result. I am a car. So we already have our parent class over here. Now let me go ahead and create the child class as well. So I will have class of car. And I'll have this parenthesis and inside this, I will pass in this vehicle class. Then I would have to go ahead and create a method which is explicit to the car class. So I will have def and I'll name this method as show car. This takes in only one parameter, which is self. And inside this, I will have the print method and I will go ahead and just print out. I am a car. And when I hit on run, you would see that we have successfully created this class. So after creating this class, I would have to create an object of this. So I will have C1 is equal to car. And since this inherits this, this will also have a constructor. So I'd have to pass in a value for mileage. Let's say this car would give me a mileage of around 300 miles per gallon. And the cost of this car is around, um, let's say $10,000. So I'll pass in these two values over here. Now that I have passed the values, let me invoke the show details method. This is actually show vehicle method, which is there in the parent class. So C1 dot show vehicle. And as you see, I have the result. I'm a vehicle. Mileage of the vehicle is 300 and cost of the vehicle is $10,000. And since we also have this particular method over here, I can go ahead and invoke it. I will have C1 dot show car this has to be small c now when i hit on run you would see that i am able to print out i am a car now we'll see how to override the init method in the child class so in the previous example we had created a child class where we had only one method over here but what we'll do is we'll also have an init method in this child class and this init method will take in four parameters. The first two parameters will just be the two parameters for the parent class. And since the vehicle class has mileage and cost parameters, I'll have them over here. I'll also have the self parameter and I will add two new parameters for the car class itself. So I'll have tires and HP. Now to pass in the values for the super class or the parent class, I would need the super method. So I will write down super dot init, which would basically mean that I am invoking the init method of the super class or I am invoking the init method of the parent class. And inside this, I am passing in mileage and cost. So these are just values of the parent class, which I'm passing in. And after passing in the values of the parent class, I'll go ahead and assign the values for the child class as well. So here, as you see, self dot tires is equal to tires. I am assigning the value of tires over here to the attribute of the car class. Similarly, I am assigning the values of HP over here to the attribute of the car class. And once I assign these values, I would have to show them out. So here I will have def of show car details and I will print out I am a car. Number of tires are self dot tires and value of horsepower is this. And after I create the template of this child class, I can go ahead and create an object of this. So here, as you see, I will have C1 is equal to car and I given four values over here. The first value will be for the mileage of the vehicle class. 
The second will be the cost of the vehicle class. So here, as you see, I'm a vehicle. And when I invoke C1 dot show details, so here, even though show details is part of the parent class, I'm able to invoke this because car class is inheriting from the vehicle class. And here I have mileage of vehicle is 20 and cost of vehicle is $12,000. And I also have four and 300. And as you see, when I invoke C1 dot show car details, I have the result. I'm a car number of tires are four and value of horsepower is 300. So I'll go ahead and create the parent class again and child class again over here. So I will have class of vehicle and this will take in, this will have init method. So I'll write down def over here. I will write down init and this will definitely have the self parameter over here. And this has two values, which are mileage and cost. Now I would have to assign these values. So it will be self dot mileage is equal to mileage over here. Then I will have self dot cost is equal to cost. And this is how I am assigning the values for mileage and cost. Once I do this, I would have to go ahead and print out the values. So I will have a new method for it. I will have def of show car details over here and this will only have one parameter which is self and I will start off by printing I'm a vehicle and after this we would have to print out the mileage of the vehicle is the mileage of the vehicle is here it will be self dot mileage then I'd have to also print out the cost the cost of the vehicle is here it will be self dot cost and this is how we have created this template for the vehicle class now I'd have to create the template for the child class as well so here it will be class of car and since this is inheriting from the vehicle class I'd have to pass the vehicle as the parameter inside this and after that I would have to override the init method and since I have to override I need to create an init method of the car class itself and I'll start off by giving the self parameter then I this will have mileage and cost for the parent class then it will have tires and HP which are exclusive to the car class itself and after this I will invoke the super method so this is with the help of this I'll be able to invoke the init method of the super class so I will have super dot init and inside this I will just pass in mileage and cost and once I do this I would have to assign the values for tires and HP so it will be self dot tires is equal to tires and self dot HP is equal to HP and now that I have created this init method or overridden this init method I would need an explicit method for the car class itself let me give in a space over here and this time it will be def of show car details and I'll have self over here and after this this will actually only have self and nothing else and I'd have to go ahead and print out I am a car and after this I'd have to print out the number of tires are here it will be self dot tires and after that I'll have to print out the horsepower as well so here it will be the horsepower is and the value will be equal to self dot HP and now that I have created the parent class and the child class as well I'd have to create an object of it here it will be equal to C1 is equal to car and I'd have to given the value of mileage and cost. Let's say the value of mileage is around 30. 
so it would give around 30 miles per gallon and the cost I would see this is five thousand dollars and after that let's see this car would have four tires and the horsepower of this would be equal to 499 and we have created the object of this now that we have also assigned the values I can go ahead and invoke the methods of the parent class and the child class I will have c1 dot show car details over here and you would see that I have printed out I'm a car the number of tires are 4 and the horsepower is 499 so these are the details of the child class or the car class now I'll print out the details of the parent class so here I will have c1 dot show vehicle details and when I print this out this is so seems like I've overridden this I will keep the name as show vehicle details over here so this method in the parent class will be show vehicle details and this method in the child class will be equal to show car details and once I have done this you would see that I have this result I'm a vehicle the mileage of the vehicle is 30 and the cost of the vehicle is equal to 5000 going ahead we'll look at the different types of inheritance so we've worked with single inheritance now we'll see what is multiple inheritance and what is multi-level inheritance so we'll start off with multiple inheritance and in multiple inheritance we'll have a child which inherits from more than one parent class so let's say if you have a mother and a father obviously you will have a mother and a father and you'd be inheriting some of the features from your mother and some of the features from your father and thus what is happening over here is known as multiple inheritance so as you see if there's a child class this child class will be inheriting some features from parent 1 and some features from parent 2 and this is what is known as multiple inheritance and let's have a look at this over here so we are starting off by creating the first parent class class of parent 1 I have two methods over here in the first method I am assigning the value for string 1 so assign string 1 I have self and str1 and with the help of this I am assigning the value for this attribute of str1 and this parent 1 class then once I assign the value for this str1 I'll go ahead and show out this value or return this value with show string 1 so in parent class 1 I'm assigning the value for string 1 then I have parent class 2 and with the help of parent class 2 I am assigning the value of str2 first then I will go ahead and return the value of str2 then I will have a child class I will name this child class as a derived class and this over here takes in two parameters or in other words this is inheriting from parent 1 and parent 2 and this again has two methods over here the first method is assign string 3 and I am assigning the value for string 3 over here then I will go ahead and show it out as you see I am returning or I am printing out self.str3 so parent class 1 parent class 2 and child class and after that what I'm doing is I am creating an object of the derived class or of the child class and here I have d1 dot assign string 1 so even though assign string 1 and assign string 2 belong to the parent class I am able to invoke them because child class is deriving from both of the parent classes so here I am assigning the value of 1 to string 1 I am assigning the value of 2 to string 2 and I am assigning the value of 3 to string 3 once I given the values I go ahead and show out the values over here so d1 dot show string 1 I get 1 d1 dot show string 2 I get 2 and d1 dot show string 3 I get 3 now this is a bit confusing let's go to Jupyter notebook over here and let's create our two parent classes and one child class so for this purpose I'd have to given this keyword class and I'd have to given the name of the first parent class which is parent 1 and after this I will create a method def and I will name this method as assign str1 this will have two parameters the first parameter will be self next will be str1 over here 
and I'll just write down self dot str1 is equal to str1 over here and once I assign the value I'd have to print out this value or show off this value so for that purpose I would need another method here it will be show str1 and what I'll do inside this is this will only have the self attribute and I would have to return the value of string one. So this will be equal to return of self.str1. And you would see that I have created the first class, first parent class. Similarly, I'll go ahead and create the second parent class. This time it will be equal to class of parent two. And here I will have def of assign str2. It will be self. I will have str2 over here. And I'd have to assign the value. This will be equal to self dot str2 is equal to str2 over here. And I'll go ahead and create the next method. I will have show str2. I'll have self over here and I'd have to return str2 and I have also created the second parent class. Now that both of my parent classes are ready, I can go ahead and create the child class. So here class of I'll just name this child class as child because that is more intuitive and inside this I will be passing in both of the parent classes I'll have parent 1 as well as parent 2 and now that I pass in both of the parents I'll create one method exclusive for the child class itself and inside the parent class I'll be assigning the string 3 assign str3 over here this will have the self parameter and I'll have str3 over here and this is how I'll be assigning the value self dot str3 is equal to str3 and once I assign the value I would have to go ahead and print it out so here it will be show str3 it will be self over here and I will go ahead and I will return so again here I'd have to keep in mind that this is self of str2 and here again it will be equal to self of str3. And as you see I have created all of the three classes, two parent classes and one child class which is inheriting from these two parent classes. Now I can go ahead and create an object of this. So here I will have c1 is equal to child. Once I have created this object, I can go ahead and invoke the methods. So I'll start off by invoking the method of the first parent class. So c1 dot assign str1. Inside this, I will pass in the value of 1 over here. Then I will go ahead and invoke the method of second parent class. This will be equal to assign str2. Inside this I will pass in the value 2 then I will go ahead and invoke the method of the child class itself assign str3 and inside this I will pass in the value 3 once I invoke all of this then I can go ahead and print them out so I will have show str1 and you would see that I have printed out one then I will have c1 dot show str2 then I would have we have an error over here so let's check this properly self dot str2 we have we are assigning the value over here and we are returning this over here c1 dot show str2 name str2 is not defined so what I'll do is I'll run all of these again because I had added those self parameters and this time we need to get the result and this time as you see when I have c1.showstr2 I get 2 over here. Now similarly I'll go ahead and invoke the third string so I will have c1.showstr3 and this time when I hit on run you would see that I get the result 3. So this is how we can implement multiple inheritance.
going ahead we have something known as a multi level inheritance and you can consider multi level inheritance to be grandfather father child relationship and as a grandchild inherits his or her features from maybe his parents and those parents inherit their features from their grandparents so here you have multiple levels and this is what is known as a multi level inheritance so here we have three classes we start off by creating the parent class first and in the parent class we are assigning the name of this person and then we are showing out the name of the person then in the child class we are assigning the age of the person and we are showing out the age and as you see this child class is inheriting from the parent class then we have the grandchild class where we are assigning the gender and we are showing out the gender and here you see that the grandchild class is inheriting from the child class so here there are three levels child class is inheriting from the parent class and the grandchild class is inheriting from the child class now let's go to jupiter notebook and implement this we have to start off by creating the parent class i will have class i'll have parent over here and inside this i will create a new method called as assign name this will have self and then we will have name over here and inside this i'll just write down self dot name is equal to name this is how i'm assigning the name then i'd have to show the name and for that purpose i will have show name this will only have self over here and i need to return self dot name and i have created the parent class now after this i would have to create the child class so here i will have class of child i will create a new method over here and i will name this method as assign age i will have self i'll have age over here and i need to assign this age so here it will be equal to self dot age is equal to age then i would have to show out the age i'll have to create a new method this will be equal to show age i am writing down self over here and i would have to return this so this will be equal to return self dot age and this child class is inheriting from the parent class so that is why i'll pass in the parent class as a parameter to the child class then finally i will create the grandchild class here i will have class of grandchild and this grandchild class will be inheriting from the child class this again will have two methods the first method will be assign gender and this is how i am passing in the two parameters i'll have self and gender and here i would have to set self dot gender as equal to gender then i will create a new method over here show gender and here i will only have self and i would have to return this it will be equal to return self dot gender and now that i have created these three classes over here i have my parent class the child class and the grandchild class i can go ahead and create the object of the grandchild class i'll call it gc and i will invoke it like this and once i create this grandchild class i can assign the name age and gender so i will have gc dot assign let me write it down again so here it is gc dot assign name and the name which i am setting or giving to this person is bob then i'd have to give him some age so here it will be gc dot assign age and let's say bob is 54 years old and i'll also assign the gender this will be equal to gc dot assign gender and the gender is male i have assigned these three things now i'd have to go ahead and show them out so here it will be gc dot show name and i am setting the name to be equal to i don't have to give anything over here i just have to invoke it and as you see 
I get the name of this person as Bob. Now let me also invoke the age over here, GC dot show age. You would see that the age of this person is 54. Then I will have GC dot show gender. And here, as you see, the gender of this person is male. So let me take you to the next slide with the introduction to the file handling. Okay. So what do we mean from file handling? So whenever I just talk about the file handling topic, so we say that dealing up with the text files is completely known as file handling. Text files you all know, right? Dot the files which we have extension as dot txt, right? That particular files are known as the text files. So let's say you wrote out some uh, text onto a file and just save that particular text file. Now, how to drill that with that particular text file with the help of Python programming? Like, let's say if you just want to write some things into that file, you want to read out that what's written into that particular file or, or any particular operation you want to perform onto that particular file. So how you can do that particular thing in the uh, with the help of Python programming, that's completely known as file handling. Right. Hope you are very much clear. First of all, that what file handling means. So as mentioned, the definition as well that dealing with the text files is called as file handling. Right. Even in Python programming, we have one another name for the file handling and that goes as IO functions. That is the input output functions. So whenever I say file handling or IO functions, they both actually mean the same thing that's dealing with that text files do not get confused into these things okay next so as i as well mentioned out that what are the places what are the things that uh, come under the file handling what are the operations that you could perform so in the file handling we already have many functions in built functions which helps us to operate out and do out the steps like opening of the file, reading the text, whatever is written, uh, writing some things into the file, appending the text, basically altering out the text, deleting out some text and all these operations you could completely perform with the help of Python, right? So as I mentioned that there are many different functions that are particularly involved up here. Now, after that, basically, I have one more thing here, and that is basically that what's the IDE that I'm going to use and what's the Python version that I'm going to use up here to for doing out the practical for the file handling. See, one very important thing to let you know that basically what are the online IDEs you are having that do not support out the file handling technique. And the reason is that with the help of the PY file, that .py, .py is basically your Python file into which you write out your coding stuff. So any of the online ID, if that particular ID is supporting the .py and the .txt file at the same time, then absolutely you could use out that ID for writing out your code start online ID. Otherwise, I would recommend you to download out the offline ID. Now, there are many different IDEs which you can go ahead with, like you can use out the uh, PyCharm, you could use out the VS Code, you could use out the Jupyter Notebooks, whatever you feel like you could use. Let me tell you my particular specifications that I'm going to use. So I'm going to use about the PyCharm IDE and the Python version, which I am using is 3.9.1, right? If you have the same configurations, well and good. And even if you have some newer version of Python, then also it's absolutely fine. Uh, do not take out the Python versions below than 3.7. Okay, some functions work there, some functions do not work. So I would recommend you to upgrade your Python version above 3.7. Hope you are very much clear with this particular that uh, what are dealing with the text and what are the functions or operations which you could perform and basically what's the IDE that I'm going to use up here for doing out the stuffs. Night, right so now basically i'll be taking you to the next slide and there we are going to discuss about the open read and the write modes which we have in the file handling so let me take you to that brief discussion of these three particular topics that's open read and write modes okay as the name suggests for the open mode so into this particular mode what you could do you could open out any text file with the help of this particular function that's open so this particular open mode is used whenever you just want to open out a text file 
for reading or for writing for altering or for doing anything so you use out the open function at the very first point now one more thing uh, which comes up here is that let me take a very a uh, live example of this particular uh, do not assume it as a text file let's say i'm having out a book okay i want to read out a book so how can i read out the book i will be taking out that particular book i would be first of all opening that then reading out the stuff whatever i just want right same particular case applies here on the text file as well you will be saving out your text file onto the same folder where your python file has been saved out after that the very first step that comes is the opening of file writing reading altering all these things are the secondary part that you need to do before, like if you are not opening the file without opening your file how you could perform out any of the operations right so that's the reason whenever you we do the file handling whenever we just deal out with the text files so the very first method was the very first step that we use is opening our text file so that particular thing is performed by the open mode which we have here in the python programming language hope i just made this thing very crystal clear that what is this open mode and why we just use that here in the file handling right now next i'll be taking you to the read mode after you have opened up your file let's say you just want to read out some text from that file let me take the again example of the book when i have opened out my book so there can be two cases for opening out my book first can be i want to read out something from that book or even i just want to write out something onto that book right only two cases could be there so whenever is your first case that you want to read out something from your book in the same case whenever you just want to read out something from your text file so into that particular case what we do we use out the read mode right so this is a mode which is used whenever you just want to read out the text which is already stored in your text file so we use out this read mode right hope i made this thing as well very much clear regarding the read mode as well next your second case could be that instead of reading anything you want to write out something onto that book so same case goes for the file handling as well that instead of reading out your file you want to write something you want to add some more text onto your file so in that case the write mode actually comes in place so whenever you are willing to write out anything to add some more extra stuff onto your text file so in that case we use out this write mode so this is used whenever you want to write the text in your .txt file right so hope i made this write mode as well very much clear to you that what it is used for what's the case when we use this out and why we just use out this write mode as well right so hope these particular three modes are very much clear that what are these how we perform out the functions how we go ahead with the operations now i'll be taking you to my ide that's my pycharm ide and there i'll be letting you know that basically how we could perform out the practical how we can read write and open up the files using the python programming language so this is the pycharm ide that we actually are having right um i'll be giving you a quick overview regarding this particular id then i'll be uh, going ahead with the practical so uh, here basically let's i just make out one of the folders that is the folder which i'm having so what i would just do for making out a python file into which i'll be writing out my code so for doing out this particular thing i'll be clicking on this file okay and now here i'll be doing out the right click so as soon as i do out the right click this particular box would appear now i would just go on the very first option that's new okay from this new option i'll be going on to the number fourth option that's python file i'll be clicking on that particular here you need to save out your file with any particular name let's say i'm going to give out the name as file and that's the let's say file handling okay click enter so yeah this is how your notebook actually appears out here whenever you have uh, made out any py file that's your .py file that's a completely python file okay hope i'm very much clear next so here we are dealing out with the text files so it's necessary to make out one text file see now the two cases apply up here either you make out a text file 
or basically you uh, you basically uh, like take out one path where you already have one of the text files and put on that particular path here so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to make out one new text file here okay so for that again the same procedure go on to your project do out the right click go on the new option and now in this case go on to the very first option that's file so whenever you just see out this file option take this as it's a txt file and uh, let's say my text file's name is um, text only and hit enter right so click on this and click on okay so my text file has been made and that is having the extension that's dot txt this file okay so hope you are able to see this particular file right now what i'll be doing here is that i would be putting okay let me do one thing yeah i'll be putting on the uh, things and writing out my folder program so i'll be making out a variable let's say that's f before that okay not here into the text file before that i'll be putting on some text into this file so i would just put on the text that let's say uh, this is the topic this is the topic of file handling now one more thing to notice out here that this is a text file into which you are writing so you do need not to put out any comment any hash sign or any um, double inverted quotations or single inverted quotations nothing like that is at all needed because this is a text file if you were doing out the same thing onto the py file then it would have been a problem it would have shown you errors but as you had made out a text file so it doesn't matters at all right hope i'm very much clear let me take you to the file where we have the python file and let's start writing up the code let's say i just make out one of the variables now this is known as a file pointer okay make this as a file pointer so f is equal to open now open is basically my function the very first function that we are going to see let me put on a, a hash here and let me wrote out here the first mode that's the open mode okay so here we use out the open in, uh, in inside this only putting out the double inverted commas okay now into that double inverted commas you're going to write out the text file name so my text file name is text.txt okay let me just do out one thing because i just need to rename this out so okay one second that is okay rename file let's do that not right here so input okay let's do the cancel file okay let's go ahead with this particular thing only let's see what is going to happen out so open text.txt okay that's my file name come to the new line and this is how you open out your particular text file simply you need to write out a variable that's called uh, this we just start i just wrote out here as if because we call that as a file pointer that's the reason i mentioned out of if other than that it's not compulsory you could put on any variables of your choice we put on the assignment operator and after that we use out the open function for opening out this particular file right so as soon as the open file has been done the next thing comes is that in which mode you want to open it out you want to open in the read mode or you want to open in the write mode so whenever you are willing to open the read mode so in that case we write out here r and whenever you are willing to open it in the write mode so in that case we write out w okay so we write out r for the read mode and w to the new this comma to the new this comma to the new this comma to the new line here and write out here if it will above f is equal to here goes the open into the bracket my file comes that what file you want to open so that is text.txt okay putting out the comma here again double inverted commas quotations come out now here you mention out that uh, what's the mode in which you want to open let's say i want to go on with the read mode so i just simply wrote out here r so it will automatically understand out that now you want to go ahead with the read mode it means that you are you want to read out your file you are opening your file for reading that let's come to a new line here and i'll be making up a variable that what will will be do uh, so that particular variable will be reading out the text for me so let's say my variable is uh, content a t e n t content is equal to and my f is the variable in which i have opened out my file in the read mode and now here comes my read function content is equal to f dot read 
come to a new line and simply i would be writing out here print and into the bracket i'll be writing out here the variable that's content because content is only the variable into which my file is being read right it is being read and it is being stored see uh, okay before that let me quickly run out the program then i would let you know what i was just like trying to convey out from here okay no such file or directory i was just feeling that it would be happening let me make out a new file click on new uh, go on to the file write out here the name let's say that's demo hit enter yes now i want out the txt file and click on okay okay right here so let me just close out the file from here now click on to this particular write out here something like uh uh okay that's demo and let me quickly do out one thing let me make out uh one more right here so that's file demo.txt click enter so yeah now this is the complete correct file which has been made out please yeah one more thing to uh, notice out here do not uh, miss out the extension that you want to put on fine so as soon as you put on dot txt now this is your correct file which has been made out so i would just once again put on a text that this is um this is a uh, okay this is a file handling topic let's say this is my text okay topic now let's come to the back here now i would just change on the name for my file that's demo dot and that's txt and i would comment out the first line because now that's not needed at all let's run out our file here for a while so okay it's indexing basically it's uh, setting up whatever you have written out here so it's setting up all of that to all those particular things so this is one of the things which comes here on to the like uh, the spike jump id okay i would just click on the run button above so now let me just uh, take you above so right now you are having your output that this is a file handling topic this was the text that we have written in the demo.txt file right this was the same text which we have written out and with the help of the read function we are able to display out this particular text here in this particular context in the console of my pycharm ide i am able to get out this particular text so this is how we perform out the read mode this is how you read out the text with the help of the uh, file handling techniques right hope you are very much clear with the first full read function right now what i'll be doing is that i'll be taking you to the next mode and that's my write mode so what i would just do is that i would comment out all the above three lines because now i want out my file uh, to be opened out in the w mode that's my write mode so let's say f is equal to here goes the open function my okay one second let me come out to this particular place my file name is demo.txt right putting out a comma here and i want to open that in the w mode now after opening that into w mode i'll be using out the write function that what is the text which you want to write into your txt file so let's say i just want to uh, like write on the topic that uh, write on the text that i am learning file handling right let me come down once okay the text which i just want to write out so yeah that's completed now one thing to mention here very importantly which i did not mention up uh, above right i'm mentioning out that whenever you are opening out a file it's important to close out that particular file as well okay it's a good practice i would say see when i relate this to the example which i have taken for explaining you about the book so in that case what we were doing in that particular case we were having a book so we opened it for uh, you want to read or you want to write inside that book that depends so whenever you have opened that out after doing whatever the operations you want to do you will be closing out that particular book as well right same case applies here on to the text files as well that whenever you have opened out any text file so you would be closing that as well right so that's the reason i have used up here f dot close file now i'll be running out my file here now here i would not be getting out any answer into the console file into the console of my pycharm ide the reason is that i'll be directly getting out the text onto my demo.txt and here goes that i am learning file handling right i'm learning file handling this is the text right that we have 
written up right this was the correct sentence so i am getting out that particular sentence written up here onto my demo.txt file right so hope you are very much clear with this particular function as well that how does this write function works so i hope that you are very much crystal clear regarding the open function how does that work about the read function and even about the write function right so uh, now we have some more further topics some more further modes to learn about so i'll be taking you to the presentation right away and then let's discuss about the rest of the particular topics now let's discuss about that how we can add the text onto that text file and even how we could count out that what are the number of characters that we have added onto that particular text file so let me take you to the next slide here and here we have uh, adding the text and counting characters so let's first of all discuss about adding that text so whenever i just want to add out any text onto that txt file so in that case we have a function named that's append a double p e n d so this is the particular append function which we use for adding out some data some uh, text onto your text files right so basically whenever is your case that you want to add on these lines or you want to add on that particular lines so we use out the append function so the mode which we write here is double inverted commas and a small a as for the read and write we used to write r and w so for the append function we used to write here as a small a right so a small a whenever you see that small a written so quickly understand that out that this is the place where anything is being added or written something onto the text file now uh, let's say you have one particular case that whatever the text you are adding on you just want to transfer out or add on that particular text onto a new line so for adding the text in a new line we use out the uh, operator that's backslash n so backslash n is one of the other operators that's used for changing your line to a new line and then adding whatever the text is required right so for the append function it basically helps us to add the text in your .txt file as i mentioned it is used for adding your text in the .txt files next the mode used is a for appending means adding or writing some text to the file so whenever i just use out the a so it means that i'm using out my append mode it means that adding or writing out some text to the file then i have that for adding the text to the file in a new line we use backslash and before writing the sentence to be added so yeah this is one more case that comes up i have already told that but one thing i was left here that whenever you just want that whatever you have written up uh, that comes on to a new line i mean to say that uh, like a new sentence is being appeared in a new line you want to append the things onto a new line so in that case uh, use out that backslash n in the starting of the sentence not at the last okay you start in the starting of the sentence then it will particularly take you to a new line and display your sentence in a fresh new line right so hope i'm very much clear with the append function that what it is used for and how we use that out what are the specifications and what is the mode that we used up here then we have the next topic that's counting the characters now we have that how you can count out the characters so it comes with the help of the len function l e n okay so len is the function which is basically used for counting out the characters right that what is the total number of characters which you are having into your file so that particular uh, operation that particular thing can be added can be performed with the help of the len function so what do you do basically first of all you open up your file and you just read out your file using some function that we already have open and read functions after reading out the file and that what it takes to return onto the file you just apply out the len function okay you just simply apply out a len function and that particular len function is being applied in a variable i mean to say that you put on a variable user assignment operator and 
the variable in which you have opened your file in the read mode with the help of that particular variable you use out the len function and as soon as all the things are done up here we simply get out the total count of the characters which you have in your text file right so hope i am very much clear regarding len function as well let me go once again that it's completely used for calculating for finding out the total number of characters whatever you have used in your text file right so first of all you open out your file then you use out what are the operation you you will want to use and after that you simply use out your len function so hope i am very much clear regarding the append and the len function that what are these two particular functions what are they used for and basically how to use them out so hope you are very much clear with these things now i'll be taking you to the pycharm ide and they will be seeing a practical for the append and for the len function so now let's see that basically how we can implement out the append mode and the len function so append mode is basically used for adding on some characters onto your file and the len one is used for calculating that basically how many characters you are having here right so okay so okay what i would just do is that i would already add out first of all some text onto my demo file because that has been it is because i have commented everything so let's say i'm going to write out here that i am i am learning i'm learning and here goes let's let's say file handling file handling okay fine this is one of the text that i already have out here so i'm going to use out now my append mode to add on some more text onto this particular place so the uh, like the short form that we use is a the very first procedure that i'm going to do is that i'm going to open out my relevant file into which i want to append out that text so that's for me demo.txt putting out a comma putting out a double inverted commas what's the mode and the mode is a so i'm going to put that out coming to the new line uh okay now here you have uh, i could just take on one variable let's say that's um, add underscore text one variable of mine here i'm going to use out f dot write function to write or to add anything onto my notebook or to my file inside this i'm going to write out that okay above what we have written that um, what is already written i'm learning file handling okay let's write out that this is append mode like this right let's come on to a new line print out the add underscore text here and at last i'm going to close out my file so f dot close putting out the brackets like this uh what i would do is that i would add one backslash in here as well so that whatever comes comes into a new line and here it's time for running out the program so okay this is basically coming because i have written out here add underscore text so it's basically counting out the number of simple characters that i have added so yeah that's actually okay let's go on to the demo.txt and see what has come here that this is append mode basically here what i'm getting i'm getting a new line added here that this is append mode and which i have added through the a function so using this a mode i have added out that particular thing right so hope i'm very much clear first of all that how this this function actually works out right so i'm going to do one thing simply i'm going to remove out these relevant things from here so this as well great and if i again run this out so again it would be basically it will run out here now downside i did not got any option any answer but here this again the sentence has been added so the number of times you are going you are going to run this statement out you are going to run this program out so it will basically add that much number of statements onto your relevant text file right now this was how the append function actually works out now i'll be showing you about a, a, like for the len function so here goes the len function let's come down here i would again open my file but this time my file would be opened in the uh one second uh this time my file will be opened in the read mode because i want to um uh that i want to just add on or count on some of the relevant things right i do not want to write or append anything like that so i simply want to count the total number of characters that's the reason my file will be opening in the read mode okay so here i'm going to write out let's say my variable is data is equal to f 
got read and in the bracket i'm going to write out the variable that we are having as if okay not this if i'm simply going to write out if dot read and like this next i'm having total underscore count as one of my new variables and into that i'm going to put on first of all the function that we are having len and the variable into which i have read out my data which i have into my file so that's the variable is only data okay i will just read down data underscore read let that be and here as well goes data underscore read so inside the len function you need to write out that particular variable in which you have used out that read function which i have written up here okay and at last you are going to print out here the variable in which you have counted so that's total count and i'm going to write out like this and simply last goes here the closing of my file right so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to run out this relevant program here so my total characters the total number of characters which i am having into this file is 87 right i'm totally having 87 characters onto this demo.txt file right and why i just get out one more statement like this because i haven't commented out this particular line that's what is, that's the reason one more line has came here right so yeah i hope i'm again very much clear that how to use out the append function for adding some text and basically how to use out the len function for calculating for giving you a count that total how many number of characters are present into your file right so i hope i'm very much clear with these things so let's move on to the next topic and see how the next functions now we'll be seeing our one another function here in this file handling and that's the read line function now i'll be telling you that what read line function actually is and how is that useful here fine now let's say we had seen about how to read out the text how to write out the text how, how to add on some things onto that particular text right we had seen how we can append and all these things are absolutely clear now there could be one case that let's say whatever text file you are having into that text file you want to read out that text line by line like in the first line whatever the text is written first of all read that out then secondly comes out in the second line whatever the text is written read out the second text in the third line whatever text is written read out that so this can be a particular case that could be here that whatever the text are here you need to read down uh, all of the text line by line right so for performing out this particular function we have a read line function in the file handling read line as from the name only suggests that it helps you to read out the text, read out the lines, or uh, the text, whatever is present in the line, line by line. Right, hope I'm very much clear. Now, next basically what we are having, so how to use out this particular function. So for using out this function, firstly you need to open out the file in whatever you, mode you just want, read mode or write mode, whatever you just wish out, you could open out the file. After that, you need to use out that read line function. So to read out the lines accordingly, we use out the read line function that is mentioned, and it will basically display you the line uh, lines in the form of uh, like it will display the text in the form of line by line. Now, uh, let's say into your first uh, take first uh, line, it's written uh, learning file handling. Into the second, it is written read write and open mode. Into the third, it is written append mode. So whenever you are going to use our read line function, so first of all, it is going to display you the very first text that learning file handling. Okay. Next, basically, it is going to just give you out the out uh, like let, again you are going to use our read line function. So it will be giving you the next output, and that will be your very second line that is read, write, and open functions, open modes, right? Now that will be after again if you use read line. Then it is going to display you the third line. So this is how this particular read line function actually works. This is how these functions uh, play a role and help us to read out the text line by line. So after writing up the things and after let's say I just uh, said you that okay read out this file line by line. 
so once we had seen about that read function right that is as well one function that is uh, used to read out the text which you are having but it defers that onto that particular function you read out your text uh, in a one complete go like if you do use out the read function so at one complete time it will display you all the text which is written up into your file the case where you just want to read out your text line by line one single line by line so into that particular time you use out the read line function right so hope i am very much clear with these two particular things that we have about the read line function and basically how to read out the text line by line now what i'll be doing is that i'll be taking you to the pycharm ide and they will be seeing up the practical for this read line function okay so here we are onto the pycharm ide and now i'll be using up the read line function okay but before that i'll be writing one or one or more two more sentences onto my uh, file so f dot write let's say i'm learning file handling okay uh topics i will just write that topics are open read and write mode okay then okay that's not open it's open like this right and let me come to a new line i would just write f dot write once again and let's say i would write here that uh let's say next is append function right let's say this is these are the three texts which are written i would just run out this particular file up here but before that uh, what i would just do is that i'll be commenting out this particular place right so comment that out and now let's come to the downside and run out our program so here we go okay so nothing would be displayed here as i told you because we have written onto the file and this is my file now here i haven't used out the backslash and that's why it is coming like that so let me just quickly use out the backslash n in the starting backslash oh okay not like this like this and backslash n in the starting and now let me quickly run that out once again here so let me go on to demo.txt and yes now it's coming up right so i'm learning text file i'm learning file handling topics are open read and write mode and it comes a append function and one more thing if you just want to remove out these spaces so do not give any space between the backslash n and between the sentences now it comes appears to be absolutely correct right great now what i'll be doing up here is that i want to read out the text line by line okay what is the thing that we perform so i would simply write first of all the variable name uh, with the help of which i have opened out my file in whatever the mode it doesn't matter how so let's say here i have opened in the right mode so it doesn't matter that what is the mode that you are opening uh, using out simply it matters that uh, what is the variable that you have taken right so you have opened out your file and the variable is f dot and now here basically you use a read line function like this and this whole particular thing would go inside the print statement like this right now i would just run out this program here for a while okay one second it's not readable where is my text file gone one second guys um where is that particular folder uh, for the great learning let me just quickly open that out so here it is not neither here it is right here so demo.txt right these are the files now let's quickly run out our program here for a while okay not readable let's let's check out that what is the thing that we are making up here error as and why it's basically not displaying as that thing Okay, so it goes print f dot read line, and after that bracket is completely done. Before that, let me comment out these three lines, and uh, let me open it in the read mode first of all. Now it's the time for running out the program once again. So here we run, and now here I got out my very first output. That's I am learning file handling. So this particular output came because, uh, first of all, that I okay. One another thing that. Um, simply the opening of the file can be done in the read mode or the write mode but you could not use any functions like this so at that particular moment i need to comment out this these lines first of all because at the same time i cannot write and i cannot use the read line function at one particular point i could not use out these two functions together right that was the reason i needed to comment out these three particular lines 
so it read out the very first line of my text file which i'm having and that was i am learning file handling yes this was the very first thing now let me come down here what if i again use out one of the print statement right here f dot read line and put on the bracket like this now if once again i run out my program see now what output i'm getting up here uh, so that output which i'm getting is topics are open read and write mode so let me just uh, do it like this right here so when i use out my first read line function i was getting my very first line displayed next case when i just uh, used out the sec uh, read line function second time so this particular line was getting displayed right so hope you have got the idea regarding this now let's see if i just once again use out this print uh, read line function so f dot read line and the brackets now what will happen this particular will be displayed third time means my third line would be displayed up here for the append function so verify as yes, these are the only three lines i'm learning file handling topics are open read and write mode and the next and last one comes here as well, the append function right so hope i'm very much clear about these uh, these three read line functions that how we just read out the line read out the text line by line now what if i just once again use out my read line function as i was having only three lines in my uh, text file but what if i just once again use out my read line function now basically it would not display you any other text because there was no other line in my text file in my demo.txt i was having only three particular lines neither it will display you the error nor it will display you the text simply it will keep that particular thing as blank i would remove out now this particular thing and at last my file is getting closed because we all know that whenever we just open out a file it's basically we need to close that particular file as well right so hope you got out this particular idea as well regarding the read line function that what is this read line function how we use this out basically how we will be able to read out the text which is uh, present in one single line and that is completely line by line right hope you are very much clear now we'll be seeing up the next topics now let's discuss about the try and accept functions so this is a particular point from where we start dealing out with the uh, take uh, with the exception handling right so from here i'll be letting you know about how to deal with the exceptions so the very first topic that comes under this particular one is try and accept so let me take you to the next slide here and here goes the try and accept statement now see whatever the block of code whatever the like code you are going to write inside the try block that gets executed whenever your code is completely error free and if you have any error into your code then basically your accept part gets executed see take it in a way let's say you are writing out any particular code so you just put on your main logic of the program inside the try function right after that you add on one exception as well that if basically if there is such some or uh, error into your code which you have written out so just display out that particular exception to you in the form of an error it's not an error in the form but i would say that it's a form of exception that would completely occur out so in that particular case you are required to put on those particular uh, that particular uh, print statement or anything inside the except so if your code is not having any errors then basically your try function would run and it will display you the relevant output whatever is the required one but if your code whatever you have written out that is having some issues or is having some errors so in that case the control of your program will go inside the except function and then your except block will basically execute what are the exception would be occurring that would come or if you have written any print statement inside that that would come whatever the things you have written inside the except part that would be displayed as an output to you in the form of an exception right hope i am very much clear first of all regarding the try and accept statements after that one more thing comes here is that with one single try you could use any n number of accept functions 
accept the statements actually let me elaborate this a little bit let's say you are uh, you are have on uh, you had put on one try and accept statement okay you put on one try statement and one accept statement now the case is that let's say you just want to put on more than one accept statements so yes basically you are uh, completely uh, allowed to put on that particular part here as an output right so now with one single try it's uh, okay with one accept statements it's compulsory to put one try function okay it's it's compulsory to put a pair of try and accept other than that with one single try statement you could use any n number of statements according to your choice whatever you just wish out you could use that much n number of statements that is the accept statements with one single try right so hope i am very much clear with the usage of the try and accept statements so whenever you are having no error into your program so your try block actually gets executed and when you are having any error in your program so your accept statement gets executed if basically after that when the accept statement gets executed so whatever the print statement you have used either that will get executed or if you haven't used out any print statement so in that case you would be getting an exception as a form of a result okay now the other thing as well which i mentioned is that a single try statement can have more than one accept statements so it's not compulsory to always put out a pair of try and accept with one single try you could use 10 accept 20 accept 30 accept whatever the accept functions accept the statements you want to use out with one single try you are always allowed to do out that particular thing right hope i made this thing very much clear to you regarding the usage of the try and accept functions as well that how to use them out now we have a syntax so how to use out what's a syntax for try and accept so first of all you put on your try keyboard right you put that out put out the colon come to the new line so as soon as you'll be coming to the new line you would automatically be getting out some tab spaces so that spaces you will be getting out so as to confirm that yes you are inside the try block right after that you put on your relevant logics you put on your statements you just write out your complete code whatever you just want to write on to that particular place right after that come out of the try statement and then put out your accept now you could simply print out ex, uh, write out accept and inside that print the statement or you could write out accept exception as e now these two cases occur up here what are they used for so this except the exception as e it uh, it is basically used whenever you want that whatever is your relevant error or exception that is occurring you want to see out that exception as an output so in that case we use out except exception as e and whenever is the case that basically you want that whatever the exception you are actually putting on after that you want out a print statement to be getting printed as an output so in that case you simply use out accept keyword and in after that you just use out your relevant print statement right so as we have learned about the uh, try and accept theory now let's move on to the practical let's see that how it's completely used out how to implement that out so what i'm going to do here is that first of all i am going to take out two inputs let's say a is equal to i would simply mention out here as input and inside that i'm going to write out a statement let's say that enter the number okay come to the new line let's say i just take out the second one i just write out here as it's say input enter the uh, number 2 let's say this is number 2 and let's say this is number 1 so here again comes out the colon and like this right now let's say i'm writing out the program for addition of two numbers so here goes now my try function coming inside my try function what do i have here so i'll be starting up here with the things that let's say i have to declare a variable let's say that is c is equal to now above i had simply use out the input functions only what i want to write out the program for i want to write out the program for adding of two numbers but 
at uh, uh, at none of the places i have declared that i want the integer i want the input to be in the integer format right this is the case which is not declared so now i have declared a i would declare a new variable let's say that is c here and after that basically what i'm going to do is that now as i mentioned that we will be writing out a program for the addition of two numbers let's say i'll be taking up the two numbers from the in, from the user here right now uh, when i talk about taking the input from the users in the number format so in that case uh, at none of the places i have mentioned that i want the input to be the, in the integer format and if i haven't mentioned out that particular thing so in that case it will automatically take in the string format when i use out the plus sign so it would not give me the addition it would simply do the concatenation of both of those numbers right this is the case which actually happens out what i could do here simply i could just do out the relevant type casting i could write it like this and simply i would write it out like this coming to the new line i would be using out one of the print statements and inside that i'll be printing here as c okay fine after this i'll be using out my except exception as e right this is my first sentence which i just uh, told you right away that we could use out this particular statement that is except exception as e and here i would be simply printing out e what i'm going to get out a result you all as well know out that i'll be getting out some exception here the reason is that i haven't mentioned out any data type here in the starting and i have mentioned here so it would say that we cannot add integer and a string either it shall be integer integer or it shall be string string right let me run out the program and so show you how these things appear can okay, it to give out the number 1 let's say that's 2 and here goes the 6 so what i got here unsupported operand type for plus int and str so it basically means that the operand type the operators which you have used out here like the variables which you have taken that are not supported one is the integer and another one is the str right now this is the kind of exception it occurs when you had made out any error in your program the first way to get out the exception okay now second way is that you could simply write out here except and inside this you could add on a print statement that uh, error error in your drive block you could print out one simple sentence like this as well when i run this out so here let's say i enter out my number let's say that's 3 then 5 so what i got error in your try block but it's not that much specific that it was giving me with the previous one that was except exception as e that right? it's not that much specific so in that case we always try to prefer write down except exception as e we always prefer to use that only right so hope you got out the idea how exception occurs now i would type cast this thing as well and now let's write out our program in the correct manner and i would be running this at this particular place so what i got as in first full output that enter number 1 it's that's 4 6 6 and now i got out the resultant output that's 10 the reason is that i wasn't having any errors so my try block executed and if my try block executed my except block will not get executed because i was sent having any of the errors into my program which i have written out right hope i am very much clear with this particular try and except statements to you that how we use this try and except what's the syntax that we use um and what's the correct way actually for generating out the exception so the correct way is except exception as e right hope i'm very much clear now let's move towards forward with the some other topics of the try and except functions only that's in the exception handling now let's understand about the try with the else clause so i just uh, told you about the try and except right away some minutes before now let's see that with the try and except how you could use out the else clause at what particular time it would get executed and all the things let's move forward okay so first thing is that you could use out the first of all try uh, first of all the else clause with the try and except statement yes that's allowed 
what is the set of instructions what are the things that you need to follow up here so whenever let's say you use out the else clause with the try statement so when you want to execute a set of strict instructions whenever you do uh, let's say the case is that whenever you do not have any exception into your program after that uh, after execution of the try block you want one more statement to get printed as an output for you so in that case we simply use out this else clause let me give you an idea let's say you wrote out a program for multiplication of two numbers you add on your accept statements after that you use on the else clause inside the else clause whatever the print statement you are going to use so in that particular case if you do not have any exception in your program if you do not have any error in your program then after the execution of the try block that particular else statement will take place for the execution hope i am very much clear with this particular thing right but that will only and only be executed when you do not have any error into your uh, program when you when you your exception does not actually work then in that case only that else clause will work the syntax is that you could simply write out first of all your try statement your accept statement after that put on the else keyword after putting that out put on the colon and come to a new line automatically some spaces you will be detected and after that you could add your relevant print statement your relevant block of code whatever you just want to be get executed if your exception hasn't been occurred so in that particular case you could use any of the things relevant to you right there is no such restriction that you would only use print statement or you would only use the um, like uh, write out some logical things nothing like that you could write out anything in that particular case right so hope i am very much clear with the use of try with the else clause that how you could use this out and what are the cases where it is particularly used out now let's see out the practical that how we can use out the try and accept the statements with the else clause so i'll be writing out first of all two input from the user so a is equal to int input and i would be writing out here let's say that enter the number okay enter the number one let's coming to the new line i'll be taking another input and that's int here comes the input and goes that uh enter the number two. okay so here i go with the small n now i'm going to write out a program for finding out that a number is even or odd okay so i do not need the second statement right if i just write out the program for finding that a number is even or odd so i do not need out the second number right it only works with the one so let's go ahead and write that out so i put on my try statement come inside my condition goes that if a percent two is equal equal to zero zero basically the number is divided by two and the remainder is zero so in that case print out with the help of f strings that um i would write out the number first of all that a is an even number right and if this is not the case in that case print out the else part that print f strings a is an odd number right these these can be two statements two cases which could appear that if the number is even it means that the remainder is zero in that case write out that this particular number is even otherwise print out it's odd after that here goes the except i would write out except exception as e put on the colon come to the new line print out the small e that is my exception now after this try and except here you use out the else clause so like this it goes inside this you could write out anything i would simply put on a print statement that uh, that else clause got exe uh executed like this i could print on one of the statements at the s clause got executed right so okay now what i would just do is that i would run out this particular program so it's asking me to enter the number one let's say that's four 
See what it got me. It gave me that four is an even number and else clause got executed. Now, why did my else clause got executed? Because my try block got executed completely in a complete manner because there was no error or exception in my program. That's the reason this else part got executed. Now what I would do, let's say I just make out any error into my program. Let's say if I just uh, put on one single uh, this. Okay. Now if I run out my program. Okay. So it okay. So it is syntax error. One second is equal to. And here let's say I just make on B because B is one of the variables which we haven't defined. So let's say I may, made out B. Run that out to you. Asking me to enter the number one. Let's say my number is uh, three. See what it is giving me name B is not defined. This is my exception that is occurring, right? And my else clause even did not got executed. The reason I have already told you that whenever your try block will get executed, whenever the portion, whenever the logic which you have written inside the try block, that would get executed. After that only your else part will get executed. If you are getting any error or exception, then your else clause will not at all get executed, right? So I would uh, again make out the relevant changes. So it's A and again it's A. And now if I just again run out my program, so now in that case I would not be uh, getting any error or any exception like that. Let's say it's right. So 45 is an odd number. And here I got the statement executed that else clause got executed right hope i am very much clear with the statement for a lot like how does this try except and else clause work together hope i'm very much clear with this that which part will basically execute when right so we'll see up the next topics now let's discuss about the finally keyword so now we'll be seeing up that what is this finally keyword in the exception handle let's go ahead so yeah here we have um, okay, I told you about the try and accept functions in a very much detail. Even we had done out the practical as well, right? That was completely over. Then we, in, then I introduced you to the else part as well, right? That the how to use out the else clause with the try statement. So that particular condition was applied at that particular case. Whenever you just wanted to, like, uh, like let's say you are writing out any particular logic or particular code inside the try block. And whenever you do not have any particular error into your program, it means that your except part doesn't work out. It doesn't execute at all. In that case, the else part was getting executed. Now, what happens with the finally keyword here? See, finally is a keyword that would execute. Either you are having exception in your program or you are not having exception in your program. It doesn't at all matters for the finally keyword. It means that finally keyword has to execute no matter if you are having any exception or you are not having exception, right? You could use the finally uh, keyword directly with the try and accept or either if you just want to add on the uh, that uh, else clause. So in that case as well, you could just add on your else clause and your finally keyword after that. No matter that you are using it with the else clause, you are reading with the try and accept, whatever you just wish out. But one complete case actually takes place here and that's compulsory that whatever you're going to use out like uh, whatever the uh, program or whatever the code you're going to write inside the try and accept no matters try runs or accept runs finally keyword will shall be run out right now let's quickly pay a little attention towards the write up which I have written out here. So finally is a keyword which shall executes after the execution of the try and accept block of a statement so it means that finally is one of the keywords that is surely going to execute after the execution of the try and the accept block of a statement as i told you that particular thing as well right now when i move towards the talking of the syntax that how to use that out so syntax is super easy and even the same as we have followed from the previous uh, like topics simply first of all you put on your try statement Put out your relevant code or the logic, whatever you just want to put inside the try block. After that, put on your accept. So I would always recommend you to put on your accept statement as accept exception as E. 
it makes a relevant exception for you it, it generates a relevant exception so if you have any exception into your program so it comes to you as a completely defined one so that you could get out a clear idea that okay this was the exception that was occurring so now i won't make out this particular exception into my program right this is what actually happens out then after that we have the else part that exceptional if you just want to add you could otherwise it's not at all compulsory to add out right and after using out whatever the relevant else condition you want to use or do not next statement comes about the finally keyword so at this particular place you use out your finally keyword inside the finally keyword you put out your relevant code or you just want to print out a print statement or you just want to put out some logic whatever you just want to wish you could just put that inside the finally keyword after that you execute out your program so whatever runs either try or accept that doesn't matter but you will finally be getting the answer the finally getting the output with either or uh, uh, either with a try or a accept and the finally keyword will surely come at the last it means whatever you have written in the finally that will surely be executed and given to you after the uh, after the uh, run of try or accept right so hope i am very much clear first of all regarding the finally keyword that what is this finally keyword how we just execute that out and what's the syntax what it is used for what conditions are applied and what not are applied right so hope this theoretical part is very much clear now let me take you to the pycharm ide and let's implement out the practical for the sake so now let's execute out some practical for the try and accept part right so i'll be using up the finally keyword here with the try and accept so let's get started up here and okay let me just come down at this particular place what i'm going to do is that uh, i'm going to write out a program first of all uh, to find out which is the greater number among the two okay let's say a simple program so i'll be taking up the int and here goes the input and here goes my enter the number right my first number goes here next coming to the new line what i'll be doing is that i'll be using second variable and into that again as well i'll be taking out the input from the user so here goes that into the number and giving out this space like this right so in num a and num so num one and num two have been taken the input from the user then comes my try function so try my condition goes that if a is greater than b right so in that case i could print out an statement print i could write out with the f strings print f i could put on that a is a is uh, that's greater than and here goes the b right a is greater than b coming back adding on my else condition is what we could print is that print uh, okay let me go above add this particular place go adding the f strings in the bracket it goes like okay f will be out not inside like this right so yeah uh, i would write here b is greater let me come down at a place right here b is one second so b is greater than and here is here as a okay so b is greater than a that conditions are satisfied coming out and using out my except function so except exception as e putting on the colon and printing out here as e right this much code you absolutely understood because we already have dealt with these types of code previously right now coming down onto a place here i'll be using out my else clause as well let's say that is as well getting executed okay let's first of all uh, simply add on the finally after that i would uh, add that else clause well so here goes my print statement and i would just write that um finally uh keyword uh w keyword use let's say this is my print statement okay fine so i don't think that we have any of the relevant exceptions into our program because we haven't made out any of these so my output will be first of all i'd be getting whether this uh, any of the conditions from here and at last this particular statement will be printed let me show you how so let's run it out here so as remember for doing running out quickly uh, on the blank space we do out the right click click on the run option and here we go so the number run i would enter let's say 21 
Okay, okay. Abba one is as well not commented. One second. I'm so sorry. Let me terminate this out from here. Okay, yeah. Remember the previous program as well we have written out. So let me just quickly here as well. Let's comment that out. Right now it's the correct time for running out the program. So click on run. Enter the num one. So let's say that's twenty one here. Um, that's thirty four. So what should be thirty four is greater than twenty one because my second condition was getting satisfied. It means the value for the B is greater than A. Right. And at last, this statement came here that finally keyword used. Right. Because this finally statement got executed. Now what I'm going to do is that I'll be making out some um, changes into the program. Let's say let's see here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's run this out now. Okay. So I'll be entering out the number one. Let's say that's thirty-four, and number two is let's say that let's do one. Okay. I got my relevant exception that name C is not defined. Other than that, my finally keyword again got executed at this particular place. So it showed me finally keyword used. So I as well mentioned you when we were discussing about the theory that uh, finally keyword always gets executed, no matter that what are we using, no matter that. Try block is running or the except block is running. The finally keyword will surely run at the particular place, right? Hope I am very much clear with this particular thing. Let me close it out here and now I would be making it the, again the same here. And let me as well uh, show you how to use out the else block. Simply after the except, you could put on the else condition. Um, and one second, go back, hit out enter, and write out your relevant print the statement. So print or whatever logic you want to put anything works out here. So I will just write out here print um, else part got executed. So here goes the executed, right? So here is part as well. I have added on here the finally and now let's run that out. So let's say my num one is sixty seven and num two is thirty two and here goes that sixty seven is greater than thirty two. After the try, we have used out the else part, so that's the reason else part got executed first. Then we were having the finally keyword, and then basically my finally uh, statement was present there. So this particular statement got executed. That's finally keyword used. Right? Hope I am very much clear with the complete detailed explanation for the program as well that how to add on the finally keyword, how to add on the else conditions, and all the things are very much clear. Hope. Right? Fine. So let's see the other things as well. Uh, so now basically I'll be discussing about the summary of this particular module that we have discussed. So let's take. Uh, let me just uh, take you to that particular presentation as well. Now let's take out a quick summary of whatever we have learned in this exception and file handling module. So let me take you to the very starting from where we had started out, and there we'll be seeing up all the things. So we had started out with the introduction that what is uh, file handling. So file handling basically deals with the uh, text files. It means that uh, this is completely known as when you are dealing with the text files. Means you are opening, you are reading, writing, appending. All these operations are done onto a text file, and this particular procedure is known as file handling. The another name for file handling is Python file. Input output functions, file I/O functions, or file input output functions. Whatever you just want, you could use that out, right? So particularly, we have different uh, functions here, like read, write, append, alter, many other functions we are having. Okay, let's move forward. And here we described out the open, read, and write modes. So open was one of the mode that was basically helping us to open out a file. As we when we read out a book, so first of all, the first um, procedure that we do is that we open out that relevant book. Same here, whatever the file you are gonna uh, particularly operate, first of all, you're gonna open out that file. So that particular thing is done with the open mode. Then we have the read mode. So read was the mode which allows you to read out whatever is written into your program, into your file, into your text file. And write was one of the modes which basically allows you to write out anything, to write anything onto your text files. So these were the three modes that we had seen. We had also seen on the practical for these that how to implement them out. Then we were having adding text and the counting characters. So for adding out some text onto your text file, we were having that 
function that's append function. So append was the function that basically helps you to add on uh, the text onto your file, right? That as well we had seen out. Next, we were having a function that was used for counting out the characters that total how many number of characters you are having into your text file. So that function was length function, right? Now let's come. Then we had seen about the read line function. So this was one of the functions which basically allows you to print out your uh, relevant written out text line by line, whichever text you have written into your um, like into text file. So it allows you to print out all the text line by line as an output for you, right? Then we had moved on towards the exception handling. We had seen about the try and accept functions. So we had seen about the try and accept the statements. Whatever the code written inside the try blocks gets, uh, it will only and only get executed when there is no such error or no such exception occurred. If you are having any exception, then basically the try block will not get executed and you will be getting out your relevant exception. We had seen two methods for writing out the exceptions. First for accept. Simply write out the accept and inside the print statement, write out your relevant statement. And the second one was you could use accept exception as E and you could print out E. So it will automatically give you a relevant uh, and the meaningful exception, right? So we had seen about the try and accept. We had seen one, one more thing here that with one single try, you could use any n number of accept functions. Right. Then we had gone ahead with the try and the else clause. So I told you that how to use out the try with the else clause. So the part or uh, the block of code written inside the else clause only and only gets executed when you do not have any exceptions into your program. If you are having any exceptions, then your else clause will not at all get executed. Right. This was what we had seen in the try with else clause. And at last we had seen about the finally keyword that what's the finally keyword how we just execute uh, like uh, in the finally whenever you do not have any uh, like uh, if you're using out the try block or if you are using out the except function either your try blocks executes or your except block executes it doesn't matter but what matters is that your finally keyword will surely get executed no matters you are having any exception or you are not at all having ex uh, any exception in your program but your finally keyword will as well get executed right so hope i am very much clear with whatever i have just told you regarding this module of exception handling and the file handling right so hope you are very much clear with all of the topics which i had shown even over the practicals we have performed hope you all are very much clear with advanced concepts in hand let's tackle data structures and algorithms we will explore arrays stacks queues and linked lists and dive into essential searching and sorting algorithms to enhance your problem solving skills now let's talk about our first linear data structure that is array. So what is an array? It is a linear data structure. That means elements will be stored in a linear fashion, right? Linear fashion. Now, if you talk about array, let's take an example. Now let's consider that this is how you represent an array in the form of a row, right? And let's suppose it contains elements one, two, three, and four, right? Now, with every memory location, there will be some address, right? So let's suppose these are the four elements, right? One, two, three, and four. And these are some addresses. Let's suppose this is 100, and this is 104, this is 108, and this is 112. Now, if you talk about memory, obviously these addresses will be hexadecimal. And when you talk about this, this particular array, it will be somewhere in the memory with four, uh, or you can say four bytes of memory for each integer now if i take a if i consider this integer and let's suppose integer takes four bytes now these four bytes are available for each integer now this is an integer right now it takes four bytes now the second address will start from 104 right because now again this will take four bytes then 108 again it will take four bytes then 112 uh, right so in memory it will be somewhere around but the thing that obviously you might be thinking okay sir let's suppose this is our memory and now 
if we have four and four bytes that means eight bytes here and eight bytes here but they are available in chunks right this is one chunk and this is the second chunk and rest of the memory is occupied can we store this array in your memory in the memory no because it needs contiguous memory location that means when this is the scenario where in you have memory locations or memory locations available in a one big chunk right that means if you talk about this array it requires 4 into 4 that is 16 bytes are available but and they are available in a in a contiguous memory fashion right or they are available in in such a way that it is a one single chunk of 16 bytes okay so then only you can store the elements at that location now obviously for simplicity i'm taking this addresses as a number integer number but in reality those are hexadecimal numbers okay so it is easier for me okay so now one more thing is that the elements are stored in a linear fashion right but can we access elements randomly yes with the help of indexes so if you talk about this array right one two three and four obviously this there will be a name associated with this array right now we have index zero one two three now why indexing starts with zero or why there is a zero and indexing always starts with zero now the question is that right now let's try to demystify this fact that why indexing starts from zero why not it starts from one now if you remember right i told you that there will be a name associated with this array that is arr now this arr is nothing but name of the array and name of the array represents right it represents its base address right now the base address of this was earlier we spoke about it so it is 100 this is 104 this is 108 and this is 112 right so now this is 100 now so let's talk about how you access uh, uh, we will talk about in the coming slides we will see how to declare and initialize our array but let's suppose if we talk about how to access this we use array and then the subscript and then the index okay so the index is one now i told you name of this array represents the base address so base address is 100 now plus one now this one represents four bytes okay so the four bytes then what internally happens it will be it boils down to 100 plus four that means 104 now 104 is not the first location it is the second location okay now similarly if you talk about uh, accessing the second element or third element in the array it boils down to what array of 2 which is nothing but 100 plus 2 now this 2 is nothing but 8 right 100 108 so you will be accessing the third element in the array now how can you access the first element so arr of 0 now it boils down to 100 plus 0 because there are no bytes right so it boils down to this that array indexing starts from 0 and now you know why and this is how you can access elements randomly so with the help of these indexes okay so now you might be thinking okay now we have an array can we store different elements right can we store let's suppose this is the array can we store in this we will store integer then we will store a floating point number then we will can we store a character no if you talk about any particular array let's talk about this array now the data type or the type of data that you can store in this array will be homogeneous that means you can only store similar elements okay so these are some facts and this is how array works and what are the addresses what are the indexes can you store different elements no you can only store similar elements in the array now let's talk about the applications of array now you might be thinking sir why do we need this array what is the uh, what is the reason that we are using this array so basically when you talk about arrays now obviously when you have a scenario wherein you want to store your elements in a linear fashion right and that too you want to store them in a contiguous memory locations right so that you can use your cpu or you can use your memory efficiently right not the cpu you can use your memory and you can utilize your memory to the maximum right so you want to utilize your memory efficiently at that time you can use this but obviously it will have some drawbacks right it will have some drawbacks that is why we have different different data structures right so if you want to store your data in a linear fashion you can use arrays okay now it is also suitable for for the scenarios wherein 
you require frequent searching right if you want to search an element in an array you can directly go and access these indexes one by one right so in a linear fashion you will access okay is this the element that you're looking for no is 20 the element that you're looking for no is 30 the element that you're looking for no is 40 the element that you're looking for yes one by one you can access all those elements and try to search for the element that you are looking for okay so it is suitable for applications which require frequent searching now let's talk about one dimensional array so if you talk about 1d array it is it can be related to a row like we saw in the example right so that is what is a one dimensional array it is represented in the form of row and we have addresses like 104 100 104 108 112 and 116 and indexing will be obviously 0 1 2 3 4 and then there will be a name associated with this array which is arr and then you can store the elements in this array let's suppose here the it is an integer array okay so you can store only integer elements and the size of this array is 5 and you have stored the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now it can be related to a row wherein elements are stored one after the other like you see you have 1, then you have 2, then you have 3 and there's those are all of these numbers are in a contiguous memory are available in a contiguous memory allocation. Okay. Now when you talk about 1D array there is only one index used right when you try to declare and initialize your array at that time you will use one subscript okay so how you can use that so let's suppose if i if i talk about this special array that i that i have defined here here right you will define it arr and then the sub or uh, the index is that the number of elements that are present here which is five so only one subscript will be there or one index will be used okay so this is how you uh declare your array so now let's talk about the declaration and initialization of this array. So obviously when you talk about the array, there will be a name associated with the array and then the data type. Are you going to store integer values in that array? Then the one uh, that one subscript or one index that we use and then definitely the size of the array. So this is how you declare your 1D array. Now, how can you initialize it? There are different ways which you can initialize it. Obviously here you are declaring it. Then you might use a for loop to initialize all the elements or you can declare or initialize your array at once. So how do you do that? So you will write, and let's suppose this is the integer array and you don't have to specify the size. You can directly write the elements, right? And those elements, let's suppose those are one, two, three, four, and five. In this case, when you're declaring and initializing your array at once at that time, this size becomes optional. You don't have to specify explicitly the size of the array. But obviously the size of this array will be five. Okay. Now, since you are declaring and initializing it at once, so this is optional. But in the case where wherein you are not initializing it at that time, the size becomes very important and you have to mention this size explicitly. Okay. Now let's talk about two dimensional array. So also it is known as 2D array. So it can be related to a table like this, or you can also say a matrix wherein you have rows and columns, right? Now in this elements are stored one after the other in such a way that you can think of it as a 1D array. Now this is what 1D array, right? As we have already seen it, right? And inside this 1D array, you have another 1D array, right? Now this is known as 2D array. So now how it works, right? Mm, let's suppose you have numbers over here and uh, you have four numbers, one, two, three, four. Then you have five, six, seven, eight. Then you have nine, 10, and 11, and 12. So this is a 2D array of having, uh, and this will be similar to what? Of having three rows, right? You, have, you will have three rows, not four rows. You will have three rows and in that in those three rows right you will have what four columns one two and three. so numbers will be like this one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven and twelve okay done so now obviously this will have let's suppose this is a zero based indexing and this will have a zero index here one index here and one now internally what is happening it will be a 0 0 then it will be a 0 1 then 0 2 0 3 then 1 0 1 1 1 2 1 3 then 2 0 
two one two two and two three indexing right so similar to that we will have this index will be zero zero this will be like this and this will be like this so if you want to access the element that is present at this location what you will do you will run two for loops right one uh, will be starting with from a uh, let's suppose one will start from i equal to zero to the length of this outer array that is uh, three less than three right so and the another from zero to the number of rows that are there okay so this one will be the outer loop this one will be the outer loop and this one will be the inner loop that means the number of columns that are there so this is for row and this will be for column that will start from zero to less than four okay so this is how you iterate and it will be similar to this and now what about the addressing right what about the addresses that will be there so this will be let's suppose if this is 100 now this will be 104 this will be 108 this will be 112 this will be 116 because internally it is treated as if they are again in a contiguous memory location but this time around you have a 1d array and inside that 1d array you have another 1d array so for declaring it you will use two subscripts right so it will be something the name of the array then two subscripts and now this will represent the number of rows and this will represent the number of columns so in this case the number of rows will be three and in this uh, and the number of columns is four right so this is how you declare your what a 2d array so dimension depends upon the number of subscripts you are using so this time around we are using two subscripts now let's suppose you are using three subscripts right so similar to like this three three and three okay so this time around this is a 3d array and similarly you can have multi-dimensional array right and you just need to keep on adding the subscripts that's it okay uh, now we shall learn regarding array implementation right we are solving three different problem statements here the first one is we are creating one dimensional array it is very simple and people can understand it in very easy way and the second one we are concentrating on creating two dimensional array that means usually we use it for matrix which includes rows and columns also we call it as m and n or m cross n all these three are the names which you can give it for two dimensional array and also two dimensional array is used for different purposes at the last we are trying to sort search and insert delete the elements inside an array only which is having integers so these are the problem statements we are solving for arrays in python so let's quickly hop into the id and check out the first problem statement that is how to create one dimensional array and insert elements inside that also put up the output whatever the input is given by the user on the screen so let's hop into the ide now here i'm using google collab in order to put up the first program right so we'll rename this i'm naming this as one dimensional array so now we'll come to this ide and we'll type one dimensional array example where you are including array size and you are asking the user what are the different inputs and then we are presenting the same inputs received by the user on the output screen so to quickly save the time i'm just putting up the code now so this is the python code where we'll be using for one dimensional array i'll explain what is happening here the first thing is we are asking how many elements to store inside the array. For example, it might be 5, 6, 10. So whatever the integer number is, the whole number, we can give it, right? So again, we are asking, assigning a variable for input. So whatever the input is given by the user will be assigned to the variable called num, right? Then we are assigning an empty array. Why? Because whatever the size has been defined by the user is put up here. So if it is five, it can take only five elements. If it is six, it can take only six elements. That's how it goes. And immediately we'll ask to enter the elements inside the array. Then we'll be pushing through a for loop and we'll be using one important piece of code here. That is arr.append. Append in the sense will be assigning the elements one after the other at the back of the array. We are not putting up the elements which is inserted by the user in middle or in the front or somewhere right so append will always ensure the elements which is given by the user is put up at the back of the array one after the other 
right so next we'll display whatever the array elements are so the array elements are again you have to push through for loop because it has to uh, just print the elements one after the other so let's quickly run this program and check out how does this output look right so it is asking how many elements do you want to insert into array so i'm just putting up three as of now so enter then it will ask you for first number i'm putting up four and then the second number that is five then it is i'm giving seven okay so it will display four, five, seven. Also, you can modify this outputs by giving commas, by giving uh, spaces between those. If not, it can generally display this way four, five, and seven. So this is about one dimensional array in Python. Let's see the second problem statement in arrays for Python, right? So we are going to create two dimensional integer array where you can insert row number and column number and it will fill up the elements inside the array accordingly so let's quickly switch on to the id that's google collab and check out how does 2d array work in python so here i have named this particular file as 2d array and you can name it whatever you want and i'm putting up the code here so explaining the code for you that we have asked for row numbers so how much the row should be in your matrix i'll take it as matrix only because usually rows and columns will be using in matrix so number of rows should be given by the user and we'll store that number in our underscore num that is row number again we'll ask the user uh, input number of columns right so whatever the number is given integer value whole numbers is stored in c num that means column number you can accordingly put up the variables uh, as per the problem statement so here to keep it relatable i have used r num and c num next we are going to assign whatever the values we have right that is given by the user that is, it might be a row number or it might be a column number. We'll assign that with the elements. So to assign, we'll be using for loop because one after the other, it has to be printed, right? At last, we'll be printing the final array or final matrix two dimensional array in 2D array. I've, I've just put up a abbreviation here. So it's understandable for you guys. So T W O two D is dimension underscore array A R R. I'm not put up completely array. It's just A R R. So this is how we initialize and the variables declaration, and this is how we execute the program. Let's quickly see the output of this. So I'm running. It is asking for the first time. That is input number of rows. So the number of rows I'm giving here is a uh, two. And again, I'll enter. It will ask for number of columns. So then it is three. Here, I'm entering that and it is giving you two rows and three columns. Also, if you want, you can arrange it as per matrix. So one after the other. But here I'm showing it for you guys. Just with, see, you can count three columns you have and two rows, right? The bracket defines the rows here, right? The first bracket set of brackets is for first row and second set of brackets is second rows. So this is how 2D array works in Python. So we are going for the third problem statement, which we are solving for array in Python. So it says implement search, sort and delete operations on array of integers, right? So I'm breaking these three operations that is search, sort and delete into three different programs to make it simpler rather than combining everything and making it to one huge program. So first I'm concentrating on deleting elements inside an array of uh, integers in python so quickly we shall hop into the ide and see the program here google collab is ready and the page is empty i'm just pasting this particular code in order to use time efficiently so explaining this code the first line it says enter the size of an array right we are first accessing an array size for example it might be 10 5 8 as per the user command and then we are inserting so many elements in, into that particular array. Say for example, it is five, right? So we are inserting five different elements, which we have already seen by now. So next it is asking which element to delete, right? So we are telling an element, an integer to delete. Then it will display the new array for you. So for loops are there in order to keep the array in sequence. 
and it might be printing or it might be taking input from the user both we are using for loop only and append is for putting up the elements into the back of an array right we are not inserting element in middle or somewhere in the front abruptly the insertion should not happen so one after the other sequentially in order to append in order to insert the elements we use arr dot append so let's quickly see what is the output of it so if you have entered any element which is not there in this particular array right so it will give you element does not exist in an array so this is how the program will work so let's quickly see the output now so it is asking for array size i'm giving three i'll enter then entering all the three numbers what i want to give okay it will ask you which value to be deleted right i am giving value 5 so the new array is without 5 that is 4 and 6 so this is how it will work and immediately i'll show you if you give any element which is out of the array bound how it will give you an error so i am taking three elements again 5 7 and 8 right so it will ask you which value to be deleted I'll say 1. 1 is not there in the array. It is just 5, 7 and 8. Right. So if you put that, it will say element does not exist in an array. Right. So this is how deletion will work in Python arrays. After knowing how to delete element in an array. So we have to see next. How do you sort elements inside an array in Python? So let's quickly hop into the IDE and check out how do you sort elements inside an array. Right. So here we we'll start coding, just putting up the code here. So array is already defined. The elements are 10, 22, 38, 27, 11, so on, right? So we have five elements here to be sorted in ascending order. And you can also make it descending as well. I'm showing you for ascending order. So what is happening here? I've just put up a comment for better understanding. Displaying elements of original array. Original array in the sense, whatever it is here is displayed first right so next it is sorting by using for loop right so every element it will chuck and it will try to compare with the next element if it is greater it will push up that particular element to the back and whatever it is lesser will come in front so this kind of exchange will happen and it will sort in ascending order so ascending in the sense from smaller to higher number so quickly it will display after sorting the elements of array sorted in ascending order are so and so. So let's quickly see what is the output of this particular code. Right. So we have original array which we have given that is 10, 22, 38, 27, 11 and then we have the sorted array. So in ascending order it is 10, 11, 22, 27, 38. So this is how it will sort. The major function where it will be sorting is we are using this particular lines of code which I am just highlighting in this particular IDE where it will compare each and every element inside the array to the next one. If it is greater, it will push it to back. If it is lesser than the compared array, I mean array element it will push it to front so this operation will happen in this particular lines of code right you can also sort by using sort function directly as well so this is a simple example to know how sorting will happen in python now we shall see how do you search an element inside an array so here i've tried to put up occurrence as well so let's quickly search and see elements in an array in python id okay so this is the code in order to search the element also find the occurrence of it right so here this is the array set so i'm giving the number one two three one two five so you can see one two has been repeated those two integers are repeated so first it is showing up the created array whatever the array which has been given is put up in the first place and next what it is doing it is trying to find the occurrences of it so with the help of index right so the element 2 the number 2 so where it is present and how many times right so 
first where it is present it will show that the second time will not be counted first occurrence will be counted so let's quickly see the output of this particular code right so here uh, the new created array is so whatever the given array by the user has been put up in the first line and the second line it it is saying the first occurrence of two at position one why this is zero one two three four five right so two at the first time is present in the index value array one right again next it is searching for one where it is the first occurrence of one in array is at index point zero right so it is showing the output zero again you have one here that is zero one two three also you have second two in fourth position but still wherever it is available at the first is been uh, demonstrated in this particular program right so this is how the occurrence is counted also the elements are searched in python now let's talk about advantages of arrays so obviously when you have indexes associated with the array right we have indexes so is it is easy for us to access any element right with the help of this index so if you want to access the third element you can directly go ahead and say arr of two in the one d array right so you can directly access elements with the help of indexing similarly it is easy for us to iterate through it right with the help of one for loop we can iterate through all the elements right one by one that is there okay that are there in the array and similarly if you want to do the sorting we can go ahead and easily iterate through one uh, these elements one by one and look for an element if we are trying to search an element in the array let's suppose uh, we are searching for three so one by one we will search okay is this element three 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 right and if this element is three we we can easily search and also for sorting right let's suppose we want to sort this array what would it be it will be simply what if you have four here three here two here one here and let's suppose you have zero here okay so now you want to sort this in the ascending order so what you will do you will use two loops one will uh, one will focus on this first element and then the second uh, the second one will compare all the elements okay and then at the end of this thing you will have the largest element at the end of the array so sorting iteration searching it is easy in array we just have to iterate through all the elements one by one now it is a replacement of multiple variables now what do you mean by this thing let's suppose you have an integer or let's suppose you want to store uh, the roll number of 10 students right so what you have you would have done earlier prior to what when you don't know the arrays what you would have done you would have said roll number one and then it's uh, or you can say s1 s2 s3 s4 and one by one you can st store the roll numbers in these integer variables right so as soon as our students increase now let's suppose we are talking about here 10 students now as we talk about 100 now what happens if we talk about 500 are you going to uh, write 500 variables integer variables s1 starting from s1 to s500 no it is a very inefficient way of doing so right so instead what you can do you can create an array and you can create an integer array and name it student and and therein you will have the size which which obviously represents the number of students that are there and in this case it will be 500 now if you want to change it to uh, tomorrow if you want to change it to 600 you can go ahead and easily change it to 600 right so it is the replacement of multiple variables so this is what it means now let's clear the screen and now let's talk about disadvantages there is one disadvantage that can be easily noticed is the size now obviously when you're talking about 1d array right the size or any array right the size is there right so you, you cannot exceed the size the elements cannot exceed this so let's suppose you have a, a size is five you can only store five elements right you cannot go more than that or beyond that now if you have a size 100 and now you're trying to store only two elements anyway the 100 memory allocations will be there for this array that means you are wasting your memory you are not utilizing it efficiently okay so this is what it means that size is fixed and you cannot store more elements and if the capacity is more than occupancy most of the array gets wasted okay so 
these are two things apart from this you need a contiguous memory allocation that means if chunks of memory are available here and there you cannot store an array which is or let's suppose here you have 16 bytes and here you have 16 bytes only if you have an array which is of 16 bytes that means if you have an array of size 4 that array can be stored here but if you have an array of let's suppose size 8 you cannot store four elements here and four elements here that will not be happening okay that cannot happen rather okay because it needs contiguous memory allocation so there is one more disadvantage and the last but not the least is that insertion and deletion is difficult now why do you say that let's suppose you have an array and you are having in this array one two three four now let's suppose you want to insert a value zero at this location now what you need to do you insert the zero and rest of the elements every element will be swapped so swapping is required right swapping is required plus there should be memory available so that you can store that element else if uh, there are only four elements and now you want to store zero and the size is also four at that time around what happens you will store one and rest of the elements will be swapped and you will be losing this value so it is very difficult to insert the value now same thing will happen when you're trying to delete but at that time you will not be losing data but yes swapping is required right so let's suppose you are you want to delete this location so what you will do or delete this number what you will do you will overwrite this with three you will overwrite this with four and let's suppose if there is six you will overwrite this with six so at the end you will have one three four six right one three four six and one memory allocation is there and it will contain the same element that is six so next time around you will just all write this so again the swapping is required so it is very difficult to insert and delete an element in the array now let's see the concept of stack now coming to the stack stack is a linear data structure which follows last in first out order that means the element which are inserted at last will be removed first that is lifo order last in first out now insertion and removal of the element has done at one end i will explain you now so let's see an example of a stack so here if i'm having 23 45 67 89 11 and let's suppose i'm having 50 so these are the elements that has to be inserted in this stack so now what i will do so this is my empty stack let's suppose that and inside this stack i will insert these elements one by one so first i will insert 23 after 23 i will insert 45 then i will insert 67 after 67 89 11 and 15 so this is my stack now as i told you the element which is inserted at the last will be removed first that means last in first out or leaf order so you have seen here 15 is the last element that has been inserted here so now if you want to remove the element then 15 will be the first element that will be removed so for insertion we are using push so push was used to insert the element and pop will be using to remove an element from the stack so 15 is the last element that was inserted so now i will be using pop to remove this 15 so once 15 has been removed then i am having element 23 45 67 89 and then 11 right so once again if i want to remove the element then my 11 will be removed so once again i will write here pop so always remember that push operation will be used for the insertion and pop operation will be used for the removal so whatever the elements i was inserting here 23 45 67 89 11 15 i was using push operation so if i'm writing push 23 then 23 was inserted then after that if i am writing push 45 then 45 was in inserted and after that if i'm writing push 67 then 67 was inserted and in this way i can use the push function to insert the element now as i written here insertion and removal of the element has done at one end why if you see this was my stack right so this is my stack so whatever the element i was inserting in an empty stack i was inserting it through one end right and i was doing insertion through push operation now if i'm doing the pop operation then also I am doing the pop operation through one end. So that's why you can see that here it is written that insertion and removal of the element has done at one end. So this was the basic concept of stack. Now let's see the example of stack. So you can see here 
this is my pile of coin right so this can be considered as the example of a stack why because the last coin is removing first here so this follows last in first out so i will remove one coin one coin so if i am removing step by step that means the last coin will remove first and in this way if i will follow then you can see that i can remove one coin one after other one after other and in this way this will be the example of stack similarly the same example goes for the dvd if i am removing one dvd after other then this can be example of stack so the dvd which was inserted at last will be removed first the same goes for the books the book which is on the top will remove first and after that if i am going one by one from the top so you can see that the last book that was kept will remove first and in this way this can be the example of stack so this was the basic example of stack now let's see some functions associated with stack so we are having push function so as i told you that if i'm writing here push 23 and let's suppose this is my stack so this is an empty stack so it will insert 23 here so here you can see that it is used to insert the element x at the end of the stack so here instead of x if i'm writing 23 then it will insert 23 similarly pop function as i told you that pop will remove the element from the stack so it is used to remove the topmost or last element of the stack so if there is only one element in the stack 23 and if i'm writing pop then it will remove 23 right and also please remember that it will remove the topmost or last element in case of this stack we are having only one element so this will be the last element so if i'm writing pop then 23 will be removed but what if i am writing here push let's suppose that 25 then 25 will be inserted here and once again if i am writing pop so this will be the last element so 25 will be removed so this was the basic idea about push and pop function now coming to the size so size function will give me the size or you can say the length of the stack next we are having top so it will give the reference of the last element present in the stack so let's suppose that this is my stack and i am having 23 25 and let's suppose 27 so this is my last element here so top function will give me the reference of this last element now coming to the empty function so empty function returns true for an empty stack so if this is a stack and if this stack is empty then the empty function will return us true right so this was the basic idea about functions in a stack and what will be the time complexity for each function so here the time complexity for each functions will be big o of one for push pop size stop and empty so for every function time complexity will be big o of one so this was the basic idea about the functions now let's see the stack implementation so there are several ways to implement stack in python we can use list we can use collection module from where we can provide dq class and we can also implement through q module so these are some ways from which we can implement stack in python so now let's see the implementation using list so in implementation using list list in python can be used as a stack so we can use list as a stack in python so in python we are having append and pop function we don't have any push function in python so if you want to insert the element we need some function right so we can use the append function which is used to insert the element now coming to the pop function yeah we are having pop function in python and pop removes the element in the leaf order that means last in first out and as we know that our stack also follow the leaf order the elements which are inserted at last will be removed first so these two are the functions that we will be using here in list now let's see the logic of this as i told you that list in python can be used as a stack right so here i am using list as a stack so this is my stack variable and this is an empty list and now as i told you that if you want to insert the element then you can use append so this was my empty list that is stack and as we know that in python list is denoted by square brackets so now what i will do i will write here stack dot append and inside this append if i am writing x so x will be inserted in my list now now coming to the pop function if i am writing here stack dot pop and if i am writing print and inside that if i am putting it then whatever the element i am having it will remove so let's suppose that this is my stack and in this if i am having x element so if i am writing stack dot pop so it will remove this x element right because i am having only one element here so the last element will be removed from the stack so this is the basic idea from where stack can be implemented using list now let's see the practical example so now for practical implementation i will be using jupyter notebook so i will click on here new and then i will go for python 3 and if i am writing here 
I will give the name here stack and let me comment it down first here I will write here hashtag and I will write here implementation using list so as I told you that a stack can be implemented using list so I will create a stack variable and this will contain list this is an empty list and after that I will write here stack dot append and inside this if I am writing here welcome and after that once again I am writing stack dot append and I will write here now two once again I will write stack dot append I will write great learning so you can see that this is my append now if I am printing my stack so I will click on run button so you can see that this is my list and earlier my list was empty but now through append function I have inserted welcome to great learning so now this is my list now what I will do here from this stack I want to remove the element so for that I will be using pop function so I will write here stack dot pop and I will put this stack dot pop inside a print function so I'll write print and now let me execute this so on executing you can see that I am getting great learning so that means the element which was inserted at the last has removed first right and as I told you that pop will always follow the leafo order last in first out so if I'm printing my stack you can see that I am getting welcome to because great learning has been removed through pop function if once again I am writing here let me copy and paste this control C control V so once again I am performing here stack dot pop and if I am printing stack then you can see that I will be getting welcome only so you can see that welcome I am getting and here stack dot pop if I am doing then two has been removed right so clearly we can see that we can implement stack using list through append and pop function so this was the basic idea about stack implementation using list so the another way the stack can be implementation using dq so we'll see the concept of implementation using collection dot dq so here stacks in python are created by the collection module which provides dq class so now let's understand this is a collection module so in python i will write here from collections so from collections module i will import my dq class right so i will write from collections and then i will write here import dq so dq here is double ended queue and here append and pop operations are faster as compared to list why because the time complexity of dq is big o of 1 whereas the time complexity of list is big o of n and also in list if you are inserting more element then the list will grow and it will go out of a block of memory so python have to allocate some memory so that's why on inserting more element in a list the list will become slow so that's why we come with the another way from the collection module we import dq and then so I will create my stack variable and inside that I will assign my dq right so now I will perform the same operation that I was performing in list I will write here append and pop so always remember that dq will be preferred more as compared to list because the append and pop operations are faster here right and rest all the concept is same so let me execute it so now let's see the implementation with dq so let me comment it down here I will write here implementation using dq now after this as I told you that if I want to implement dq then is a class right so I have to import it from the collection module so for that I am writing here from collections import dq and I will write a stack variable and inside this I will assign the dq now after this I will write here stack dot append and let me write the value as x here and if I am printing my stack so on execution you can see that I am getting my dq as x now let me append some more value so I will write here stack dot append y and after that I will write here stack dot append 
let's suppose Z and once again if I'm executing so I will write here print stack and on execution you can see that I am getting XYZ now let's perform pop operation so I'll write here stack dot pop and let me put inside this into the print function so as we know that if I am writing here stack dot pop so the last element which was inserted will remove first so Z will be removed here so you can see that it's Z has been removed now if I am printing my stack so I'm getting here only X and Y. So you can see that list and DQ are the same. The only difference is that DQ is faster because the append and pop operations are faster in DQ. So this was the basic idea about the stack implementation using DQ. Now let's see the stack implementation using Q. So here in implementation using Q, Q module contains the LIFO queue. That means last in first out. So here basically what happens here, it works same as the stack, but it is having some additional functions. So it is having some additional functions and works same as a stack right now we have seen that in list as well as in DQ we were using pop as well as append operation right but here to insert the element we will be using put operation so if I am writing here put of 3 then that means it will insert 3 in my stack so similarly if I am writing here get function so it will remove the element and as I told you that it works same as the stack so the last element will be removed first here now we are having some functions available in the queue module so the first function that is get so as I already told you in get function it is used to remove the element now coming to the max size so here max size means the number of maximum elements that are present in the queue coming to the next function we are having empty function so if a queue is empty then it will return true or else in other case it will return false next full so whenever the queue is full it will give us true Similarly put I have already discussed about the put that if you are inserting any element so you can write the put and suppose if I am inserting here 2 so it will insert 2 in a queue. Now queue size so queue size will give me the size of a queue. So let's suppose that if you are having a 3 elements that are inserted in queue 3, 2, 4 so what will be the size of the queue? Queue size will be 3. Now coming to the logic so how can I import LIFO queue through the queue module so I will write here from queue and then I will write here import and I will write here leafo and then I will write here queue after that as I told you that stack can be implemented through the queue module so I will create a stack variable here and I will assign here leafo queue so I will write here leafo queue and now if I am writing here stack dot put and if I am writing two so this means I am inserting the value 2 in a stack similarly if I am writing here stack dot get so that means I am removing the value from the stack so this is the basic idea now we will see all these functions in the practical coding example so let's start with the coding part I will write here comment and inside this comment I will write here implementation using Q now after this what I have to do I have to import LIFO queue from the queue module so what I will write here I will write from queue import LIFO queue and I will create a variable stack and I will write now LIFO queue so after creating stack variable as I told you that if I want to insert the element in a queue then I have to use the put function right so I will write here stack dot put and I will insert here let's suppose 2 so you have seen that I have already inserted a 2 element now let me insert some more elements so I will write stack dot put and I will insert 3 here and after this I will write stack dot put 4 so this is all about the put function right so we have seen several functions in queue so let me write here function so here I will write print and if I am writing here stack dot q size so as I told you that q size will give you the number of elements that are present in the queue and I have inserted three elements so the q size must come as three so on execution you can see that I am getting the q size as three right now I have also told you about the max size function right so 
inside this if i'm writing here max size max size is equal to 3 and if i'm writing here once again print and if i'm writing stack dot full so as i told you that full function will return true if my stack is full so here i have allocated the max size as 3 and i have inserted three elements that means my stack is full so on execution you can see that i am getting true right because my stack is full now if i want to remove the element from the stack then which function i can use i can use here stack dot get and now if i am once again writing print stack dot full will i get true value no because i have removed one element so if i am running it so on execution you can see that i am getting a false value so here you can see that we have used the put function get function full function queue size function max size so this is the basic idea about the stack implementation using queue now let's try to understand queue linear data structure what is queue queue is a linear data structure that means all the elements in the queue are stored in linear fashion. Now it follows a principle of V4. That means there's a restriction that whatever is the first item in is the first item that is to be out. Okay. So now let's try to make a queue. Uh, let's suppose you are in a queue and you are waiting for a movie. You are waiting for a movie ticket to buy. Okay. So there is one person, then there is another person, right? So these are few persons here, right? And you're waiting in a queue. So now the first person who is in the queue will be the first person who will get his ticket, right? Makes sense, right? So he will be the guy who will get his movie ticket first and he will be out of the queue. Then the next person who is in the queue is the next person who will get his tickets, right? And let's suppose a new person comes in. He's not going to go ahead from this person. Rather, he is going to go behind this person then the next person comes he will go after this person and in the same same way so this is nothing but a p4 principle okay the first person in is the first person out okay now insertion will always take place from the rear end okay and if you talk about deletion it will always take place from the front end okay so this is our front end and this is our rear cool so for examples buying the tickets from the counter or it can be a movie ticket or it can be a bus station. You are in front of a bus station trying to get tickets for your uh, bus, right? These are some examples. Now there are four major operations when you talk about queue. What are those major operations? Let me clear my screen. So NQ. So you are going to insert an element in the queue. This is what you mean by NQ. DQ, you are going to delete an element, okay, from the queue. Then peak first, that you are going to peak the first element that is in the in the queue and peak last means that you're going to peak the last element that is in the queue so you will have two pointers one is front and another is rear and with the help of these pointers you're going to nq dq peak first peak last you're going to perform these operations now one major advantage of these operations these four operations is that all of these operations are performed in a constant amount of time that means the time complexity of performing these operations is bigger of one. So that is why when you talk about computative programming, Q is most commonly used data structure because of these things, right? Because of its time complexity, right? You are able to perform your uh, operations in a constant amount of time. Now let's talk about applications of Q. So it is used in scheduling algorithms of the operating system like first in first out scheduling algorithm is there round robin is there and we have multi-level queue that is there in all these algorithms queue is used okay for storing the data or the processes it's also used in maintaining playlists like when you have a playlist let's suppose you have 10 songs in a queue right and after one song the next song which is in the queue will be played and it goes on uh, for like this right so for maintaining a playlist again a queue is used it's also used in interrupt handling uh, let me take an example here you know the process state diagram of operating system so it is also used at that time so uh, when you have an interrupt 
and therein if your process is is being executed at that time that pro process is printed out and it is stored in a queue now the next time when this priority or this interrupt is handled once it is done then it starts picking up the process which was in the queue and starts executing that in the meanwhile if there are some other processes that those processes will also be in the queue so a queue is maintained and once the interrupt is handled they will start taking out that process that is that was being executed earlier and executes it and completes its execution and terminates the process so it is also used in interrupt handling after learning what is queue in python theoretically let's know how to implement that into practicality so queue will be having two different basic operations that is nq and dq so these things will be shown in with a simple example in python So let's quickly hop on to Python IDE that is Google Colab. For the reason I'm using, it is visible for everybody to access because it's online availability and it is open source. So let's quickly start the simple program for Q displaying two different functions that is NQ and DQ. So here is the Google Colab environment where you'll be working. So what we are doing in this particular code is. we are creating a class called q right we are also giving different functions for nq and dq nq is nothing but entering or inserting values to the q and dq is deleting values from the q right as you all know q will follow fifo that is first in first out so wherever you want to buy a ticket for example in your railway stations or anywhere you will stand in the queue right so whoever in the first will get the ticket first and he or she will move out of the queue it's same in here as well but the elements are not humans it's all integer numbers so whatever the number you put in first is the first number to get out right so let's quickly see here we have two different functions as i mentioned that is nq and dq and later you will display we are uh, seeing three different functions displaying nq and dq so what happens here is we are using self.q.append so here whatever the item whatever the uh, number you give right it will be inserted to the back of the queue right it is maintaining the sequential process of inserting the numbers or the integers or the values you give in order to insert into the queue and while deleting you can use pop right is it append for insert and pop for deleting and display is nothing but it's normal print statement you will display whatever the queue it is accordingly so let's quickly run this program here i have just used certain numbers 1 2 3 4 5 five numbers and the after dequeuing right what it should display it should remove one first and 2 3 4 5 should be displayed so let's quickly see how it is right okay so as you can see whatever the uh, queue was given is printed at the first place that is 1 2 3 4 5 and then after removing the first element right so the first person will be removed because it is fifo so 2 3 4 5 is that so this is how a simple basic queue will work in python so after knowing a basic queue implementation right let's see one of the type of queue that is circular queue implementation there are many types of queues but still i'm taking circular queue as an example and showing you the same operations of inserting and deleting elements from the queue so let's quickly hop into the google colab id and check out the program how can we build a circular queue in python here is the program for circular queue and what are the different elements we have inside this program let me tell you the first part is class declaration so here my circular queue is the class right so class can be named accordingly or whatever you feel right so keep it very program oriented rather than keeping which is off topic so here it is my circular queue and then again we have two different initialization that is for nq as well as dq so whatever the elements we use here right whatever the items we try to insert in the queue we have to ensure whether the queue is full or the queue is uh, empty and there is still space or not so all the conditions should be checked so let's hop into nq and check out what are the different conditions you have to check so the first thing is the queue is full or not 
so before inserting something say for example the q size is 5 and the element 6 has been inserted then it has to show an error message that is there are only 5 spaces they are inserting 6th element it is not allowed hence the cube is filled so in order to print that we use this the circular cube is filled statement so the next part is you have to know uh, how when it is empty right in order to have the dq the main condition is whenever the uh, elements are out of the queue then it has to be declared as the queue is empty so nothing to delete from the queue it's every all the elements or items are deleted already so the error message or the statement to the user will be the circular queue is empty now there is nothing to pop out or delete or dq so apart from that also you can also uh, find if you are trying to print something right if it is empty queue it does not have anything then you have to show up the no element in the circular queue found statement why because if there is no elements there is nothing to show or display the display function does not work the print does not happen so this is the basic idea of this particular code and accordingly we have used the iterations and the declarations so next you have to look at the inputs what we are giving i'm trying to give 12 22 31 44 and 57 right so the five elements for the queue is being given and what you have to do is you have to check the initial values first you have to display the initial values what is the exact queue which you have given with the elements to the user and then which is deleted so the first element is deleted obviously but yes how the circular queue is different from the basic queue right so let's quickly run the program in order to see the output okay if you could see the output here right so initial q values so is whatever we have given here that is 12 22 31 44 and 57 so after removing an element so obviously the first in first all process the first element will be removed so it is 22 31 44 and 57 what is difference between a normal queue and a circular queue if you could see here right in the last space after 57 you have a space allocated so in normal queue it is not connected here the front end rail is being connected forming a circle right if one the first element for example 12 goes out the 22 will take the first place and 31 followed by 44 followed by 57 the last place will be empty right so it is in circular motion so whatever you want to insert again right so that will for example if you want to insert 6 right 6 will sit in the fifth position that is after 57 right this this will be connected circular motion that is front will be connected to the rear part so this is the difference between the normal basic queue and the circular queue now let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of queue. First, we are talking about advantages. So it follows a principle of P4 or the elements are stored in a P4 manner. That means let's suppose this is a queue and in this queue you have elements. So the deletion will take place from the front, right? And the insertion will take place from the rear side. So this is known as DQ, the deletion and insertion is known as nq operation and both these operations are performed in a constant amount of time so that is one of the advantages right and the insertion from beginning and deletion from end takes a constant amount of time plus if we want to do peak first peak last all these operations are performed in a constant amount of time and this is most widely used data structure when we talk about cp that is competitive programming when we talk about competitive programming this data structure is most commonly used because of these features that all the operations that are performed like insertion, deletion, peak first, peak last, NQ, DQ, all these operations are performed in a constant amount of time. Now let's talk about disadvantages. Since we are only able to delete or insert from the front and the rear, that means deletion from front and insertion from the rear. So the restriction of insertion or any manipulation, right? We have a restriction over these, right? What these operations, insertion and deletion. So this restriction is always there. And so 
this data structure that is the queue is not is not much flexible right we are fixed we can delete and insert element in a fixed pattern or in the fifo manner because it's not much flexible so now let's start with the linked list so linked list is a collection of group of nodes now what is node here so here you can see that this is a node so a node will contain a data as well as reference so each node contains data and reference which contains the address of the next node so this is a node and as i told you that node will contain a data as well as reference so let's suppose i am inserting the data here 20 and this is nothing but a reference or you can say that pointer so this pointer will contain the address of the next node right so as i told you that linked list is a collection of nodes so this is nothing but a single node so let's suppose if i am having more than one node and if i am connecting them then it will form a linked list so we will see the linked list representation in the next slide now so linked list is a linear data structure now coming to the last point we know that in array as well as in list elements are stored at the contiguous memory whereas in linked list elements are stored randomly now let's see the representation of linked list so as i told you that linked list is a collection of nodes so let's suppose that this is my n1 node this is my n2 node and this is my n3 node so each node will contain data as well as reference or you can say pointer so this is data and this is reference so now i will give the address of this n1 node so let me write the address of this n1 nodes at 2010 i will give the address of this as 2020 and i will give the address of n3 node as 2030 so these are the addresses so as i told you that each node will contain a data so let me assign here data let's suppose 10 is here and a reference or you can say a pointer so i told you about pointer that pointer will contain the address of the next node so what's the address of next node the address of next node is 2020 so i will write here 2020 so this pointer or this reference or you can say this link will contain the address of my next node and what's the address of my next node is 2020 now again this will be a data and this will be a reference of my n2 node so let me assign here data as 20 and what will be the reference the reference will contain the address of the next node so here it will be 2030 now again this n3 will also contain data so i will assign here 30 so now you might have a question that what should be reference here so now are you seeing any node after this n3 node do we have node n4 or n5 not right so this reference will be assigned to null so i can write here 5 because there is no next node is present there right now coming to head what is head so head will contain the address of my n1 node that means 2010 right so this is my linked list representation now the question arises that why linked list so now why do we need linked list because linked list is having more efficiency for performing the operations as compared to list so what are the operations that we are performing in linked list we can perform the operations like insertion deletion as well as traversal so it is having more efficiency in performing the operation so moving to the next point as i already told you that in linked list elements are stored randomly whereas in list or you can say in array elements are stored at contiguous memory now moving next accessing the elements in linked list will be slower as compared to list so if you want to access the element in linked list it will be slower as compared to list why i will tell you the reason now let's see this slide linked list representation so here this is my n3 node right and if i want to access the data elements of this n3 node then i have to go from n1 n2 and n3 then only i can access the elements whereas in case of list we can access the element through indexing but in linked list it's not possible so you have to go traversally right here traversal means that you have to go through each node so if you want to access the elements of n3 then you have to start with n1 then you will go to n2 then you can go to n3 so that's why accessing the elements in linked list will be slower as compared to list now coming to the last point here in linked list utilization of memory will be more as compared to list 
So let's start with the singly linked list. So I have already showed you the representation of linked list, which is same as the singly linked list. So in singly linked list, I'm having here a data and reference in a node. So let's suppose that this is my N1 node. This is my N2 node and this is my N3 node. So as I told you that each node will contain data as well as reference. So I will give here data. Let's suppose 10 in node 2. I will give as 20 and here I will give as 30 and each node is having an address. So let's suppose the address of this N1 node is 1000. It's having 1100 and it's having 1200. So this reference or you can say that link or pointer this will contain the address of the next node. So this will contain 1100. Similarly, my this reference or this link will contain the address of N3 node. So I'll write here 1200. And here after N3 node, do you see any node? We are not having any node. So here this link or this reference will null. Now coming to here, what is head here? So head will contain the address of my first node that is 1000. So in singly linked list, the traversal is done only in one direction. So what do you mean by traversal? Traversal means that you are going through each node. So let's suppose that if you want to go to the N3 node, first go to N1, then N2, then only you come to N3. You can't directly jump to N3. You have to go through N1 and N2, then only you come to N3. Now let's see some operations in singly linked list. So we are having several operations in linked list. We are having insertion, deletion, traversal. So insertion as well as deletion can be done at beginning at any specified node as well as end. Now coming to the traversal, I have already told you that traversal means you have to go through each node. So going through each node of the linked list is a traversal. Now let's see the pseudo code of singly linked list. So if you want to create a node in a singly linked list, then what should be the code here? So I will write first here class node. So here I have created a class whose name is node. So this class node will also be having an object, right? I will create object later on, but let's see. Let's suppose this is my N1 node. As I told you that a node will contain data as well as reference, right? So instead of reference, I'm writing here next. I'm taking a small word here so that it will be easy for coding now. So this is my node creation. Now what I will do here. So in this class node, you have seen that I am creating a init method or you can say a constructor. So to create it first, I will write a reserved word that is def and then I will write init method. So I will write first def and then underscore underscore init and then I will write underscore underscore. Then I will write self and then comma comma data. So why I've written here self, I will tell you later on. And I've also passed data as a parameter here. So inside this, I have written self dot data is equal to data and self dot reference is equal to none. So why I have written this because my node will contain data as well as reference. So I will write here in this method self dot data is equal to data and self dot reference. I've written here next. So I will take here next is equal to none. So when you are creating a node, let's see this is a node N1. So initially it will be having a data and because I'm just creating a node as of now, I'm not linking this node. So the link or you can say the reference will be none, right? So this is my initial load. I have written here self dot data is equal to data and self dot next is equal to none, right? Now this is a class whose name is node. I can create the object. So how to create an object? I will write here N1 and then I will write here class name node and inside this class, I will pass the parameter seven. So here now what will happen instead of self, my object will pass here. So my N1 will pass here instead of self. So now it will be N1 dot data is equal to and what's my data? Data is seven. Now the next step we are having the self dot reference is equal to none, right? Let's see here self dot next is equal to none. So instead of self, my N1 is there. So N1 will be passed here and N1 dot next. I will be having a none. So this is nothing but a creation of my node. Now, if you want to check, then we can write print function. And when you will write here 
node 1 data inside a print function you will see that you are getting the value as 7 similarly if you are writing node 1 dot reference inside a print method then you will be getting none so now this is the idea about how to create a node now let's see this into a coding so I will be using here Jupyter notebook so I will go on here new and then I will click on python 3 and here you can see that I am getting a name untitled 21 let me change it I will write here linked list linked list and I will write here python now let's create a node so I will comment it down creating a node so first I will create a class and I will give the name as node and inside this class node I will create my init method so I will write here def which is a reserved word and then I will write here init but before that I will write underscore underscore then again I will write underscore underscore and then I will write here self comma data so, so why I have written here self so when I am creating a class object that is n1 I have already showed you in the example so instead of self n1 is passed so as we know that we can create a multiple object of a class so if I am writing here n2 or n3 then instead of self I can pass n2 and n3 also so now let's create a node so I will write here self dot data is equal to data and I will write here self dot next I will write here none so this is my node creation so whenever I am having a node it will contain a data and it will be having a reference so initially it is not linked so the reference is none so this is my class now I will create an object of node so I will write here n1 and I will write class name and I will pass data as let's suppose 8 value here so if I am executing it so on executing this n1 will go to the self and this 8 will go into the data so my n1 dot data is equal to 8 and my n1 dot next is equal to none let me print it so if I am writing here print and inside that if I am writing my n1 dot data once again if I am writing print function and inside that if I am writing n1 dot next then you can see that I am getting the data as 8 and the next that is a reference I am getting as none because I didn't link this node to any other node so this is the basic idea how to create a node now let's see how to create a class of singly linked list so when will my singly linked list will be empty so as I told you that if this is a node let's suppose n1 this is another node n2 so n1 and n2 are connected with each other so we are having a head pointer which always points to the first node right so if there is no head if head is none then my linked list will be empty so now what I will do here so I will create a class and I will give the class name as let's say singly linked list and inside this class once again I will write init method so I'll write here def underscore underscore init underscore and I will write here self now here I will write self dot head is equal to none so this is my condition to create a class so if the head is pointing to none that means it is not pointing to any node and it shows that linked list is empty so now let's see the creation of singly linked list yeah so let me remove this now I will create a class so creating a linked list so if I want to create a linked list I will create a class of linked list so I will write here class singly linked list so this is my class and inside this class I will once again write init method inside this singly linked list I will create a init method so I will write def underscore underscore init underscore underscore and then I will write here self and when my linked list will be empty so when self dot head is equal to none 
so this is the simple way to create a singly linked list class now so after creating a class now let's create a object of this linked list so i'll write here sll singly linked list this is the object name and now i will write the class name so class name is singly and then capital ll is there right so on execution always remember whenever you are creating an object and if you are executing it so inside this class init method will always run i will show you the example if inside this init method let's suppose if i'm writing here print gorav so i have created the object here sll and right now if i am executing then you can see that gorav is executing here right so always remember whenever i am creating a object of class and whenever i am executing it so whatever the statements are inside the init method it will execute so on execution what will happen here i will get here sll dot head is equal to none right so sll is my object so instead of self sll will assign here so sll dot head is equal to none right so this is my basic concept of creating a node and creating a linked list let's talk about searching algorithms and the first searching algorithm that we are going to talk about is linear search algorithm so what is linear search it helps us to search an element in a linear data structure now let's talk about one example wherein we will be searching some element inside the array so let's suppose this is an array and the elements are uh, 10 20 30 40 and 50 now if we are trying to search an element that is 50 inside this array how linear search works is that it checks each and every element that is to be searched right that is there in the element array right let's talk about this example here 50 now 50 will be compared right we'll check is this 10 equal to 50 no is this 20 equal to 50 no is this 50 equal to 30 is this equal to 40 is this equal to 50 yes so here we were able to do a linear search right we were searching for this element inside this array one by one we compared first it with 10 then 20 then 30 and then 40 and finally then with 50 at the end we were able to find this element in the array in a linear fashion now this is what is termed as linear search now let's talk about linear search algorithm since it is a very straightforward or you can say a brute force algorithm right it's a brute force algorithm of finding the element in the array so this is how it works right we have one for loop wherein we will be what iterating through all the elements that is from zero to n and inside that what are we doing we are looking for the item that is that element that we want to search right let's suppose this is 50 right this 50 will be we were checking if this 50 is equal to the element that is arr of i right and then if that is the case if we find out the element in the entire array we will return its index right that is index right that i we will we will return this i now there might be the case as well if we are at the end of the array and we have exhausted the last element as well and we were not able to find this 50 right let's suppose this is 10 20 30 and 40. now this 50 is not present in the entire array at that time what we are going to return is minus one so we will say that okay we were not able to find this element whenever we are returning this minus one in this array and this minus one indicates that we were not able to find that element now we shall see how to implement linear search in python so linear search will work with the help of an array here so what we are doing is we are searching one single element in throughout an array in sequential manner so this is how linear search will work so here if you could see we have array we have number which one you have to search for and you have the starting position variable so in iterations array will move on 
and on by searching from one place to another place the first place to second second to third and so on in total we have five different elements in an array that means four different places because array starts from zero zero one two three four so index is of four and the elements are of five so we have to first take that key search element and we have to compare that particular element to all the elements inside the array right so if it is not matching the array is not matching with the number you are searching it will throw up an error called element not found if it is found it will show you index value where it is which place of an array it is there so let me quickly run the program for you so i am trying to search the element one right so the element one is in index position three zero one two and three so x is the variable which is used in order to find which number it it will just act as a key x will act as a key you can change this and check if you want to search for eight for example it is not at all there in the array so it will say element not found if you want to search two for example the answer should be zero right let's check right so index value is zero it is situated in the first place of an array if you want to search for nine it is at the last place so it's at four right so this is how the value which you want to search is always compared with all the elements sequentially one after the other so for example nine is compared with two it's not matching then it will go to the next one 9 is compared with 4, it is not matching and 0, again compared with 1, not matching, it will go to the 9th ninth place where it is situated, right? It will compare the elements sequentially. So, this is about linear search in Python. Now, let's talk about the time complexity of linear search. Now, if you observe carefully, let's try to understand this best case, right? So, now, if you are looking for the element and let's suppose these are the elements in the array now let's suppose in best case what can happen you're looking for 10 and 10 is the first element in the array now how many iteration did you require did it require to find you the 10 none right the constant time right only one single unit operation was done and you were able to find this 10 so this is the best case time complexity where the element that you're trying to find is the first element that you search right in this case you will you are looking for 10 and 10 is the first element. So this is your best case. Now, what about the average case and the worst case? Now, let's suppose average case is that you were looking for an element which is at the middle point, right? Let me just see. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, or you can put another another and looking for 60. Now, in this case, or you can just skip it, okay? No need to add one more. Okay, so now you're looking for an element which is somewhere around in the middle. Okay, in this case, you're looking for 30. Okay, so now if you observe, you are only iterating half of the elements that is 5 by 2, which is nothing by n by 2. Since constants doesn't play in the do not play any role when you're talking about time complexity, so that is why average case still boils down to big O of n. Now, what, have, what happens in worst case, you're looking for an element that is 50 and which is present at the end of the array. Or in the worst case, you're looking for something that is not present in the array, that is 60, let's suppose. And in that case, you will still iterate through the entire array. And that is why the worst case time complexity in that case will be big of n because you are iterating through the entire array and that element was not found. You're looking for 60 and that is not present there. So you're iterating through the entire array. That is n operations are done. So that is why it boils down to big O of n. Now let's talk about the space complexity of linear search. When we are trying to find the element in the array that is 10, 20, 30 and 40 and 50, we were not using any extra memory, right? We were not using any auxiliary memory, that is what is meant by auxiliary memory or extra memory. In order to find that element, we were just looping around these elements one by one. And we were doing it on this particular, on the same array that we were 
given, right? Since we are not using any auxiliary memory that can be in the form of what a stack, a linked list, or an array, or a string, or a queue, we are not using these auxiliary memories because they don't, they are not required, right? We are searching for an element in this particular array that we're given to us, that was given to us, right? So the space complexity of linear search is constant right we were find we were able to find it in a constant amount of space okay we are not using any extra space now let's try to understand binary search algorithm what is binary search so binary search is one of the searching techniques right like we saw in linear search wherein the time complexity of linear search was big of n, right? We were iterating through all the elements and now this is a much more efficient algorithm as compared to linear search. Now again, why do we need searching is the thing that let's suppose if you have a given set of elements and you want to search if that element is present in your array or not, that time Right, we can use either linear search or binary search. Now, binary search is much more efficient and it is used on a sorted array, or it can be used on an array wherein some order is maintained because, based on that order, we will divide our array. Right, it is a searching algorithm which is or which follows the divide and conquer strategy, right? Let's suppose this is our array. And now since it will be divided in such a way that we can neglect one part of it, right? We will be dividing and then conquering. That means we will be then searching for our element. Now let's suppose we are looking for something that is now let's take an example wherein this array is written or the elements contained in this array are in such a way that we if we skip this part or the uh, left hand side will be skipped or the right hand sides can be skipped in such a way that they don't affect our output so every time in linear search our search space is reduced unless and until we find that element or the array is exhausted okay so our search space is reduced to half in every iteration. So this is what a binary search is. We'll look for an element in such a way that every time we are neglecting half portion of the array. And let's take an example when we have this entire array. So first half, that means if four elements, eight, if there are eight elements, four on this side, four on this side, these four will be neglected. Then we have two on this side, two on this side. These two will be neglected. Then one on this side, one on this side. Then this one will be neglected until unless and until we find that element or the entire array is exhausted. Right. So this is how your binary search works. Now let's try to understand binary search algorithm. So first we are going to understand the iterative approach and then we are going to understand the recursive approach. So iterative, as the name suggests, we are going to use for loops, right? We will start with a for loop and it will iterate and we will iterate unless and until the beginning is less than the end, right? So because we will be updating our both beginning in some cases and in some cases we will update our end. Now what happens now since we know that in this iterative approach or in this binary search, it doesn't depend whether we are using iterative approach or recursive approach, the logic will remain same, right? So we will be having this array and it will be in some order so that we can neglect some part of it. It doesn't have to be sorted always. We can still apply binary search even if the array is not sorted, but still some order is there so that we can neglect some part of it. Because again, keeping this thing in mind that it follows the paradigm of divide and conquer. So now we have this beginning and end at place and we uh, we will always iterate when beginning is less than end, right? So now what happens after that? Now we have this array and now what we will be able, what we will do 
let me take new pointers so this is your beginning and this is your end so this is your beginning and this is your end now you will be taking a new middle index right m let's call it m and now let's name these things 0 1 2 3 4 so you will do what beginning plus n divided by 2 so that some part of it can be neglected right so it will be 2 so your mid is at this position now you will see okay the element that i'm looking for is uh, let's suppose is 50 and the element that i am currently at is 30 so obviously it will be never from this side there is no chance that we will be able to find 50 from this side that is the left hand side right first we will check okay is this 30 equal to 50 no so this will never be executed right then we will check is my item that is there is this 30 less than or greater than 50 if it is greater than 50 right if it is if the element that is if item that is 50 is greater than 30 right which is in this case our 50 that is the element that we are looking for the item item is this point is greater than 30 so there is no point that it will be on this side so we will skip or we will neglect this half portion of the array so that is why our new beginning is updated it will be new it will be middle index plus one that is middle index was two plus one that is this will be our new beginning so we have smartly skipped the half portion of the array so now let's drop all of these things and now let's see what happens in the next iteration now we'll keep this thing in mind that we are not looping or we are not exceeding this limit that is beginning should be always less than or it should be always less than or equal to n okay so this this condition should be maintained and similarly we'll again divide our array and then look for the same things right first we'll look for the element then we'll skip some part of it so this is the iterative approach for binary search right now let's look at the recursive approach or recursive algorithm for the same so again beginning the ground rule will remain same will always iterate or we will always recursively call binary search unless and until this beginning is less than n done now what happens we will again find middle index that is beginning plus n divided by 2 then we will look for the element these three steps will remain same even if, if you are using recursive approaches now what happens in recursive recursion right we again call the function again and again that is what is recursion so in this uh, in this entire tutorial we will be covering recursion as well but in the later parts part of the course here you can get a good intuition or let me give you a brief intuition about how recursion works so let's suppose this is your activation record every time when a recursion uh, is there an activation record is called so let's suppose you have these three statements hmm. And let's suppose in your algorithm you have statement p1 p2 and p3 right and at p2 you are calling the function again right you're calling this function again so now what happens an activation record is called he will check okay is this statement executed yes so one will be executed is second executed yes so second is executed but at second you are calling this function again so at that time again a new activation record is created now this third step is left behind right now this will be covered when we come back or return from this function call that we called here so let's suppose this function was here now in here you are returning right this function called let's suppose this is not less than beginning uh, beginning is not less than end so this will be some somewhat this case is relatable right this is similar to what we are looking for right let's suppose there is some similar situation wherein beginning is not less than end at that time you will be returning from this right now once you have returned you will be then calling this function again but this time around for this and let's suppose this time around you will you are calling this one is executed step one is executed now again this activation record is called this activation report is one and then again this is called right this is executed again this two is called again a new activation record will be created and these three three steps the step third will be still left for execution so now here you return right then it will go back to this step right 
and then once you are done with this now there are two positions or two possible scenarios where you can return either you are returning from this function just like we have executed this condition and we return right another is that once you are done with this entire activation record at that time you will also return okay so these are two scenarios now you have executed this there is no step to be executed it will return now this left this was left behind this will be executed now nothing is to be executed it will go to the caller which was this and finally it will go to the main method where it we call this at the first place this function okay so this is how an activation record is created a stack is maintained okay even if uh, you might be thinking we are not using any extra space but whenever recursion is there an extra space that is in the form of stack that stack is maintained so you need to keep this thing in mind while you are playing around with space complexity at the time when you are using recursion okay so now with that being said let's clear our screen and let's see how recursion is called here so again now recursively what we will doing if now we have this mid right and let's take an example of an array 0 1 2 3 and 4 10 20 30 40 and 50 so middle index will be 0 plus 4 divided by 2 that is 2 so this is our middle index right so this is 0 uh, this is our beginning and this is our end right so now we are hit here right so we again check the 50 that we are looking this is our item that we are looking for okay so is 50 and this is our middle index is 30 greater than 50 no it is not in this case so this will never be executed this is not executed as well right now what about this condition the else part now what we will be doing will be skipping since this 30 is less than we'll be skipping this part and we will focus on middle index plus one which is nothing but this so this will be our new beginning and our process will start moving right so now again then the same thing will happen unless and until this condition is false okay so this is how your binary search works when you're using recursion so now let's try to understand binary search and let's see its demonstration okay so we are looking for 20 and this is our array right 10 11 16 20 and 23 now this array is sorted right so we can apply binary search okay since we, we can neglect some part of the array based on some conditions okay so now our beginning in the first iteration what is happening our beginning is zero our end is four and our middle is this element now what we will be looking for is 16 equal to 20 no it is not but 16 is less than 20 so we will skip this part in the next iteration what happens we'll be focusing on these three elements right that is 20 uh, six from we will be focusing on this part rather if we say we'll focus on this part right focus on this part okay so now in the second iteration what will be happening our beginning is updated now our new beginning is this point our end will remain at its own position now we'll find the middle index so it will be 4 plus 3 that is 3 uh, that is 7 right and divided by 2 it is 3.5 Right. So since this will be truncated, right, the truncation will happen and the integer that is there, the middle index will be three. So this is our middle index, right? So you can see middle index is three. Now, is this an element that we're looking for? Yes. So we'll return the index. So we found our element at index three and hence we return three because if you observe carefully, it is returning if the element is found it is returning the index so this will be returned okay so this is how binary search works after knowing what does binary search will implement the same in python quickly switching up to the ide so the binary search has four different elements are important the first one is array the second one is which is the element to search for which is stored in x and low and high why because every array in order to have the binary search will be divided into two parts right it will go accordingly if the key that means whatever the element you are searching is matching the middle element it will exit the binary search immediately if not it will try to proceed with the search of that particular element in 
halves of the array like it will divide the array into sub arrays the right and left part it will try to see and search for that element accordingly as per the key element is right so mid is equal to low plus high minus low by 2 so this is the basic formula which we'll be using in order to split the binary array in order to have the search right so if array of middle that means middle element is equal to equal to that means it is equal to the key element which you are searching then it will immediately give you the middle element as the searched element so if else what happens if the middle element is lesser than x what it will do it will go to the right side of an array if it is greater than x it will go to the left side of an array right so it will try to search in halves like sub arrays here if you could see the array that is 3 4 5 6 7 and 8 and 9 you have all these elements inside the array what you have to search is 4 so 4 is the second element immediately you can see but accordingly you have to search uh, as per the binary search rules what it will do it will first cut this particular array into two halves by using this formula and then it will compare the key element which you are trying to search with the elements which is already present in an array in order to find so let me quickly run this okay it is telling the element which you are searching is present in index number one that means it is having the count of array index not on the element so 0 1 2 3 and so on so 4 is present in index value 1 so this is how binary search will work in python now let's talk about the time complexity of binary search now in the best case now what is the best case now let's take an array and in that array 1 2 3 4 and 5 these are the elements now the best case is that not that if the element like we saw in linear search the, this element when we are looking to search for this same element at that time that was the uh, best case scenario for linear search right but in this binary search the best case scenario is when your middle index is at the at this location and you are looking for you are searching three in the entire array so at that time this will take a constant amount of time and this is the best case time complexity in that case okay now in average case what happens right if you talk about this algorithm let me just clear out my screen so it follows a paradigm of divide and conquer so let's suppose you have eight elements first in the array it will be divided into four because these four or uh, either it can be on the left side or on the right side will be neglected and then we deal about these then we focus on these things okay these four elements again it will be divided into two and two then we will neglect two elements then one and one then again there will be one of the element can be neglected so there are one and one so we focus on this element so the entire operation will be done or entire searching will be done in three steps right now if you i take the example and if i do a log eight to the base two what should be the value of this Obviously, when I do this, this can be written as 2 raised to the power 3, right? And this can be written as 3 into log 2 to the base 2. Now, this is 1 and now you get the answer as 3. So, this 3 and this 3 are equal. That means, if I talk about the worst case time complexity of binary search, it will be somewhere around log n. As, it, although, as we saw in three steps, we were able to find the element and the log n, that means log 8, is the answer of that is also 3. So you get the point, right? So the worst case time complexity of binary search is log n. And same goes for the average case, wherein it will be somewhere around log n divided by 2, neglecting log n divided by 2, neglecting the constant terms. It will be again, uh, or it boils down to big O of log n, okay? Now let's talk about space complexity of binary search. Now, when you talk about space complexity, right, we only think of auxiliary memories, or you can say that, or you can say that what any extra memory that you guys have used. Since we did not use any extra memory, that can be in the form of array, or it can be in the form of stack, 
or it can be in the form of queue or linked list or even strings, right? Since we never use these extra memories in our implementation, so the space complexity of binary search is bigger of one. That is, it takes a constant amount of space. What is insertion sort? So the question is that what is sorting? So you might be thinking, why do we need these sorting algorithms? So if I told you that you have a bunch of students, right? You have a bunch of students and they each have their roll number. They are not present in what in a numerical order or you can say they are not present in some order. I want that order to be maintained. Let's suppose you have one to ten students in those bunch of students and each are having roll numbers from this range from one to ten. Now, some of them are absent and some of them are some of the roll numbers have left the school, but the roll numbers are not changed yet. Now, what I told you, I told you, please sort them or arrange them in such a manner so that I can easily understand which roll number is after which either in ascending or in descending order. Let's suppose one is there, two is there, then six is there, then eight is there, then ten is there. So rest of the roll numbers, I can easily depict, okay, these are the ones which either are not there or are absent. So in order to do so, we have these sorting algorithms in picture. And one of those sorting algorithms is insertion sort. Now it is the simplest, easiest and a brute force sorting algorithm. Now what do, what do you mean by brute force? Brute force means straightforward. Right in a naive way, it means straightforward. That means you are not keeping into, uh, you are not considering any efficiency, or you don't you don't care about time complexity or space complexity. You just straight away sort it with the most simpler and naive approach. Okay. In this brute force algorithm, what happens that let's suppose let me give you an example right obviously we can sort with the help of this insertion sort algorithm you can obviously sort either in ascending or in descending order right uh, let's take one example we all know about the card game right wherein you have a bunch of cards right suppose you have a single card that is in your hand right and you have a bunch of cards available on the table now you start picking those cards one by one obviously the one that is in your hand is sorted because if I told you to sort a number one, obviously there is only one element in the array or anything right in the linked list. I told you to sort it, but if you're having only one element that is itself sorted, right? You don't need to sort that. Similarly, what happens now this card is in your hand, right? It's just like playing cards, right? Now you have this one card in your hand and it is obviously sorted. Now what you will do in the next turn, you start picking up one by one from these set of cards that are available on the table. Now let's suppose this is zero. Okay. I'm considering these numerical values so that because so that you can understand and you can just connect the dots, right? So what happens, you have the zero and now you start comparing it. Now we are considering the scenario where you're trying to sort in ascending order. Okay. So now let's try to erase these things so that it's easier for you to understand things. Okay. So now you have these two elements, right? And now we are considering the case wherein you are trying to sort in ascending. So you check, okay, if zero is less than one, yes it is. Now you swap them, okay? Now you have zero and one. Now these are the two cards that are present and both of these are sorted. So now insertion sort works in such a manner that you will always have two parts, right? One is the sorted part, obviously, which is in your hand. And one is the unsorted part, which is on the on this deck, right? So similarly, you can you will start picking uh, elements or you can start picking these cards one by one and keep sorting them. OK, now this is one simple scenario wherein you can apply what insertion sort. Right? This is the most simpler way one can explain or one can understand you this insertion sort algorithm. Now it is simple, right? Now you start picking these elements and you keep sorting them and the, at the end, when all of these elements are exhausted, you will get your sorted array. Now let's try to understand insertion sort algorithm. So in this algorithm, what happens? Obviously, now we know that we will have two parts, right? One is the sorted part and another is the unsorted part, right? So 
obviously the one element that is present in your hand or the element or the card that is in your hand and there's only one element there right the one element in your hand obviously that is sorted right so we, we will not consider that first element and we will start our iteration from the second element right now we understand why we are doing this that we are starting from 2 to n minus 1 or 2 to n depending upon the array that we are starting from either we can start from 0 index or we can start from 1 index right so we always start from element number 2 right and then what we will do we'll just store this value inside temporary variable and then we will check if that element is less than the element that we have in this sorted part if that is the case then we will shift their positions right and we will get both now we will have two elements in the picture that is 0 and 1 and both of these will be sorted in ascending order and then what we will do we will consider the rest of the cases that is starting from 3 to so on to n okay now you might be thinking okay how does this thing happen let me take an example and let me show you how let's consider this array that we have over here that is index 0 these are all the indexes that we have and this is our array that is 23 10 16 11 and 20. so in the first step we are making now we are making partitions now this is our sorted part that is the first element and this is our unsorted part now what we will do in the first iteration this is our iteration number one because this is the case wherein we will start moving from second index that is first index if we consider from zero right so we consider from second element and so on to n right so now in the first iteration what we will do we'll compare these two values okay let me just erase everything so that it's easier for you guys so now we will compare these two now obviously 10 is less than 23 what we will do we'll shift their positions now this is your sorted part and this is your unsorted part Again, we will do the same thing right so in second iteration what we will do here comes 60 now what we will do we we'll compare it first with 23 okay we know now okay 16 is less than 23 so now what we will do we'll swap their positions so this is 16 and this is 23 now what will happen now 16 will be compared with 10 obviously it is not less than 10 so it will remain as it's at its own position that is its new position at index 1 right so this is the second iteration and after second iteration this will be your sorted part as you can see that i have bolded this text right bolded the borders of these two these two elements and bolded the same for these three elements because this is the sorted part that we have over here and this is the unsorted part now what will happen in the third iteration that it will check for this number that was there it is 11 so for 11 what we will do we'll compare it with what read this thing now we'll take 11 into consideration and now we'll check it we'll swap them then 11 is here 23 is here we'll check them we'll swap them 16 is here 11 is here we check them so since 10 is less than 11 so nothing will happen so in the third iteration what will happen we will have 10 11 16 and 23 these are all sorted and we are only left with one element which is unsorted right now in the final iteration what will happen that 23 now this 20 will be at its original position that is here and rest of the elements will be sorted now since we have exhausted all the elements all the elements have been exhausted and we at the final step that is in iteration 4 we will have this array that is sorted after learning what is insertion sort, let's quickly implement the same in Python language. So I'm using Google Colab, whether it is easy for everybody to access Google Colab. So need not install anything. It's right available in the online. So let's quickly switch to that Google Colab IDE for Python. So here you can find insertion sort, the name for the file in Python extension. So with that, we already have this particular program which is easy for me to explain to you. So here, so we are considering a function called insertion sort, right? So the function is called whenever the data is being passed in order to sort the elements inside the data in ascending order, right? So in order to do that, we have to write a proper function accordingly as insertion sort will work. So how does that work? 
you have already learned about it so in order to implement you have to use a for loop so for loop has a range so it will be always checking for the elements inside the array one by one for comparison with the key element right so whenever it is finding the key element it will uh, which is greater than the key element or which is lesser than it will swap accordingly right so we are using while loop in order to do that same work so we are swapping from the current position where it has been found which is greater or which is smaller accordingly we'll swap it right so then we have the data which has been given here so the data is present that is 52178 so what happens in this particular data is when it passes through this function every element will be sorted with the help of incision sort function which we have written here so first it will compare the elements and it will try to sort in ascending order say for example if you want to do descending order then you have to change just one single element that is this key should be greater than array element that's about it nothing else no change so after that incision sort uh, is the function is having the data which is present here so all these functions will be completed then we'll be printing the final output how do you print once the function has completed sorting immediately it will be stored in the variable data itself so that particular data is being printed after sort elements will be viewed right so this is just a print statement sorted array in ascending order so if you are doing for descending you can make it a sorted array in descending order so let's quickly check how this output look like so here you have sorted array in ascending order so that is one two five seven eight right from smaller to the higher number so let's quickly make a small change here so that it will give us the descending order let's try to work on it right if you could see here key is greater than array element then you will be getting the descending order that is eight seven five two one so you can change it likewise okay i didn't change the printing statement so i'm just changing descending order right run the same that's been declared so this is how incision sort will work in python and the code if you could see it is very small and quickly it is eliminating all the variable initializations we make anything and everything you just want to have the function pass the data get it sorted and the output is done so this is all about incision sort in python now let's talk about insertion sort time complexity so in the worst case, when all the elements are in haphazard manner and we need to sort them one by one. So obviously we are talking about first the outer loop, which runs from one to n, and then the inner loop, which runs backwards. And in the last, first we consider, in the first iteration, we only consider the zeroth element. Then as we move along, it will be running from n to zeroth element, right? We will be considering the whole n elements. So in that case, the time complexity in the worst case will be order of n squares because we have two nested loops that is one is for loop and inside that for loop we have that we have that while loop right so this is the in the worst case and it happens also in the average case where some part uh, or the sorted part is already there and it is let's suppose we have five four five six seven eight and then we have the unsorted part so half of the elements are sorted and half of the elements are not sorted. So it will be n square by two. So we are not considering the case where we talk about constants and we are negotiating the constants. And in that case, the average time complexity will be n square, right? But the most important thing that is there in this time complexity is the best case. That means when your elements, that is five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, when the elements in the array are already sorted, what happens in this case? If you observe the for loop that runs from one to n will be always there. So n is always there. The time complexity, the big O notation, big O of n will be always there. But in this while loop, wherein we were checking for if j is greater than or equal to zero and if AR of j is less than 10, right? In that case, 
this will never be executed because this ARR of G will always be less than, will always be greater than 10. Why? Because we are talking about this element and we are checking if this 6 is less than 5. No, it is not. If this 7 is less than 6, no, is it, it is not. So this condition will always be false for all the elements. So in nutshell, we are just checking these steps only once in every iteration. So that is for the reason that the whole time complexity in the best case will be big O of n and not big O of n square in the best case. Okay. Now let's talk about insertion sort space complexity. If you have observed in algorithms and in implementation, we never talked about any auxiliary memory, right? We were not using any extra space either in the form of array, linked list, stack, queue, or anything, right? So that is for the reason the space complexity of insertion sort is big O of one. That is constant amount of space. Now let's talk about insertion sort analysis, wherein we will be analyzing comparisons, number of swaps, stable or unstable, in place or out place. So first let's talk about number of comparisons required. In this, we will talk about two scenarios wherein we will talk about worst case and average case. In worst case, the number of comparisons required is n square by 2. Now, if you talk about average case scenario, it is n square by 4, which is twice as much as this, right? It is two times. If you talk about number of swaps that are required in insertion sort in again, we will talk about two scenarios, average and worst case. In average case, it is n square by eight. And in worst case, it is n square by four. These are the number of swaps required. And if you want to check those, if these statements hold or not, if these equations hold or not, you can always take an example wherein you will be considering both the cases even as well as odd. So take an example and run through it. Now, if you talk about stability of insertion sort, it is a stable algorithm. What do you mean by stable? So if you have an array which contains one, three, one dash and five in this array, the relative position of these two ones, that is this one and this one, let me change the color and let me show you the relative positions of this one and this one will remain intact. What do you mean by this thing that whenever you are sorting it, you can sort it in two different ways, right? This is also sorted and this is also sorted. That means you can either have one, one dash three and five, or you can have one dash one and three and five. This is obviously that this, this number is repeated, but this is the first number. This is the, uh, this occurred here the first time and here it is the second occurrence. Now you want to keep their relative positions intact, right? So both of these are sorted, right? But if you talk about stability, this is known as stable and this is unstable. Okay. Now insertion sort, whenever you are trying to implement insertion sort, it is stable. That means the relative positions of both these ones will be intact. Okay. So if someone asks you if insertion sort is stable or not, you will say yes. Why? Because the relative positions of the number that are of the numbers that are repeated remains intact. Now, what about this in place or out place? Since we are not using any auxiliary memory, right? We didn't use any stack, queue, linked list or array. That is the reason that whenever you are not using any extra memory, it is supposed to be in place algorithm. So if an algorithm is sorted within the array that was there earlier, that means you're not using any extra space. That algorithm is known as in place algorithm, which is evident now in insertion sort as we are not using any extra memory. So insertion sort is an in place algorithm. Now let's look at the example wherein we will implement insertion sort. If you can see, we have this example over here, wherein we have six, five, three, two, eight, 10, nine and 11. And we have been given this key. What this key signifi signifies that the maximum 
swaps or comparisons needed for this three either on the left side or on the right side right the number of positions that it this three needs to get to its original position is three so this is a question that is known as nearly sorted array or k sorted array we do not need to sort all the elements in the array but we are specifically looking for those elements which are not at its original position and if we want to get them to their original position the maximum comparisons or swaps that we require is 3 so if you see this 3 the original position of this 3 is this 5 that means in the sorted array it will be here similarly if you talk about this 2 the number of swaps that it should do is 1 2 and then it will it will be at its original position or you can say that 1 2 and 3 so max it can go to 3 positions okay so similarly it will be the same for all the elements so at most 3 okay and at least it can be that it will have it doesn't move, need to move at any location that it will have its own original position just like in 11 you see 11 is at its own position in the original array as well as in the swapped array so at most you have three positions let's try to understand what is sorting and why do we require sorting so sorting is a mechanism wherein we will be sorting or arranging our data either in ascending order or in descending order right so let's suppose you have a students you have 10 students and all those students have uh, roll numbers allocated from 1 to 100 and you want to know which roll numbers are present and which are absent and which have left the college or school right so in that scenario you can easily implement sorting right and you can understand when you have that sorting uh, arrangement in place you can easily detect which elements or which students are absent or not right so herein you can use sorting so in this tutorial we are going to understand quick sort algorithm it is one of the most widely used algorithm it follows a paradigm of divide and conquer what do you mean by divide and conquer basically we will be dividing our array in such a way that every time we will be dividing let's suppose this is an array and now we will be dividing into two then further we will divide it into two then further we will divide it into two and so on right so we'll see in the algorithm part how we can implement this divide and conquer paradigm and in this tutorial we will be implementing this quick sort using recursion we'll see how we will recursively call those functions based on some pivot element now in this recursive call we'll choose a pivot element let's suppose you have this array and we were choosing this element as pivot obviously you can choose any element as pivot right so it can be first element it can be uh, last element it can be any random element but once we have chosen those that pivot now what we will do in each iteration right in quick sort what happens in each iteration this pivot will have its original position that means this will be the position in the original array as well let's suppose this is our pivot now this pivot will have its original position after one iteration after that iteration is over and all the elements that are less than this pivot are on the left hand side and all the elements that are greater than will be on the right hand side now then we will be choosing another pivot now what are those pivots we'll see in the algorithm more, uh, more extensively what are how we can choose that pivot now well, let's suppose we chosen that we chose this pivot and this pivot is here and after the second iteration what happens this pivot this will be our next pivot and this will be our next pivot now we will be having two pivots so this is how we induce that we are implementing divide and conquer approach okay with each step our problem gets reduced to two which leads to quick sorting quick sort right or quick sorting algorithm okay so now we'll be dealing with this sub array and we'll be dealing with this sub array and now we'll be implementing the same procedure on this sub array that means this is the pivot and this is the pivot right now let's try to understand the algorithm of quick sort so now we have this first of the method that is there that is known as quick sort in which 
we will be calling this quick sort recursively again and again but first time around what happens we will check okay now we have this array always we will check beginning should be less than end because that way we can keep the track of things that okay this is a part that is already sorted and this is the part that is unsorted right and now we will be checking and after checking that we will be calling this method we will see what this method is we will see the algorithm and we will see how this partition happens and we will get the index of the let's suppose we pick this element as pivot and after partition what happens this pivot has its original position at index 3 right and that will be returned and that will be contained in this pivot index right and now what happens now we know that this is its original position in the original array wherein we will get the sorted array this will be its original position that means this element let's suppose is 8 8 will be at index 3 and this will have its original position after each iteration now first time around what happens this partition is called next time around what happens this quick sort algorithm is called again recursively first time on the left hand side that means this portion now in this portion this will be your pivot okay you see beginning is uh, we are sending the arguments as beginning and pivot index minus one that means we are not including this element because this has been already sorted we are not including this element and we are calling this function on this sub array again and this time around this will be our pivot and same thing happens similarly when we are done on the left uh, with the left hand side now we'll be moving to the right hand side that is we will be implementing it on pivot index plus one that means this element from this element that is there to the end of the array and this time around this will be our pivot okay now with that being said this is what happens when we are implementing quick sort but now what about this partition method let's see how that happens so in partition what happens we will be setting up the pivot element that is setting up the element which is our pivot obviously you can choose any element but in this tutorial what i am going to use and what you should try first that we should try to pick pivot as the last element obviously you can pick any element and it's time complexity and depends on which pivot you will be choosing we'll see that in the time complexity part okay now we have set this pivot as the last element and now what we are doing we are saying that okay the pivot index this uh, this step refers to what this is the index from let's suppose this is the pivot index and what happens this will be our pivot okay what happens this pivot index maintains that order okay from this index from this index everything on the left hand side is less than the pivot and everything on the right hand side is greater than the pivot so we'll see when we we will see an example and therein i will show you how this pivot index is very important okay now what we will do obviously at start it is at this position that means we are not we have no such scenario wherein we have some elements that are less than pivot and we have some elements that are greater than pivot okay so now let's suppose this is our array and this is our pivot right and this is our p index that is the index pivot index and it is minus one right now okay now these two steps are done now what happens in the third step now we will iterate from beginning that is this point and we will check if any element is less than pivot if that is the case then what we will do we will increment this and swap those elements that is the area and the first element and the index that is present at that means now if you see this step now we have incremented it first right now let's suppose if any element that is less than pivot we first increment the pivot index that means that pivot index will be here and we will be swapping it with ARR of i and ARR of i is also at this location. So this element will be swapped with itself. Now you might be thinking, okay, so why we are doing this, right? Why we are doing, why we are swapping this with its own, uh, with its own position. You won't get the intuition in this step, but in the next step, you will definitely get the intuition. Now let's suppose this is the thing that happens in the for loop. Now let's try to reiterate this. Now, if an element is not less than pivot let's suppose there was here we had five and here we had three so it was less than and we swapped it with itself now let's suppose we have this element six and it is not less than pivot right 
and what happens over here so we will not be we will not execute this if block right and then we'll have this arr of i now i will be here now i will be incrementing and this time around we have two and p index is still here right now this time around it is less than two right and now what we will do we'll increment first the p index it will be pointing here and then what we will do we'll swap swap these two elements right these two elements will be swap so now you have two here and you have six over here right so you see this is the reason why we have this pivot index at in place and why we are swapping them so in the first step it was uh, it was that it happened due to the fact that the element was less than pivot and if the element would have wouldn't have been less than the pivot then we have incremented the i pointer and p index would have remained on one now finally what happens now when once the entire iteration is complete and let's suppose we have 8 over here and we have then 10 now once the iteration is completed now what we will do we'll swap these two elements that means 5 and 6 will be swapped and we have 5 here we have 6 here we have 8 here we have 10 here and we have 3 here and we have 2 here so you see after one iteration all the elements that are less than pivot will be on the left hand side and all the elements that are greater than will be on the right hand side and finally we will uh, return pivot index uh, that is p index plus one that means we will be returning this index so that this element is not considered or will not participate in any further iterations or any further recursive calls because you see if you observe carefully that we were sending pivot index minus one that is without five all the elements on the left hand side and plus one that means without this index all the elements on the right hand side okay this is how partition works now you might be confused a little bit now let's try to demonstrate this with the help of example so you see we have an example over here right we have 5 10 9 6 and 7 these are the elements in the array and we have this pivot here the last element we have chosen last element to be the pivot and after that what we are doing we have this end pointer and we have this beginning pointer also we have that pivot index which will be somewhere around here right that pivot index which will be minus one now this seven will be checked okay is five less than seven yes five is less than seven so it will be swapped with itself and pivot index will be incremented first and then swapped with itself now pivot index will be here next time around our, AR, our i pointer will be here first it will be here then what it will be incremented now we'll be again we'll again check okay is 7 is 7 less than 10 no it is not so our i will be incremented i will be now here at this position right now again it will be checked no again it will be checked yes so now what happens 7 and 6 uh the 6 will be replaced with what 10 so you have this 6 in here obviously pivot index will be incremented first and then we have the 6 over here and it will be swapped with 10 so 10 will be here right done and finally when we are the end uh, once the entire iteration this is the step one once the entire iteration is completed we have 5 6 and then 7 will be the last swapping that we did the last swap that we did if you observe here carefully this swap that we are doing this is the one that is responsible for swapping this seven with the pivot index that is pivot index plus one that is this location and we have this seven over here and it will be replaced with nine so that is why we have nine over here and ten was here and this is the array after first iteration now you might be thinking okay now this element is fixed now we will not never talk about this element because this is as its original position in the sorted array as well now what we will be dealing with we will be dealing with this left part and will be dealing with this right part so now what happens in this part right and what happens in this part you see now we have new this is our beginning and this is our pivot because this is the last element that we will be picking and this is our end similarly this is our beginning this will be our pivot the last element in the in this sub array and the end will be here now we'll be again doing the same step and this time around we'll be checking okay pivot is less than no nothing will happen and then we will be we will be swapping this thing 
with itself right and now once this entire subarray is completed will not go any further because this time around beginning is not less than end both elements are at zero and zero is not less than zero and now if you observe carefully this is the condition that we were setting at the start of the of the function that is the quick sort function and we'll be checking we were checking if beginning is less than end right so this is the importance of that Similarly, the same thing will happen over from this this side. And again, beginning will not be less than index end part, and we will not go any further. So after two iterations, our entire array is sorted. Right. So this is the step one. After step two, our entire array is sorted. After learning what is quick sort, let's quickly implement the same in Python. So here we are using Python ID that does Google Colab, one of the ID mean to say, and then we'll implement that particular program there. So let's quickly hop into the ID now. So here is the program for quick sort in Python. So let's understand how this program works, right? The first part we need partition to be made right any array in quick sort to be broken into two halves and we will start sorting in that particular different pieces so partition positioning will be done with the help of array low and high variables so at the right most always we'll consider the element as pivot element right most element of the array is a pivot element that is the consideration so in order to do that we'll use pivot is equal to arr of h right so then pointer for greater element so whatever the element is greater in order to compare we'll be using this pointer in order to traverse from all the elements inside an array keeping one payout element in consideration with comparing with that particular element we use this for loop system right if smaller than element is present which is uh, smaller than payout we'll use this i is equal to i plus one and immediately we'll swap the element in the position which is there in i with j right that will be done with the help of arr of i and j is equal to j and i will exchange if you could see here i j is being changed to j and i so we're exchanging the elements if it is smaller than the pivot element then swap pivot with i if it's greater than pivot right if any element which is greater than pivot element wherever the i is pointing to that element will be swapped between the element and pivot right in order to do that we'll be using this particular condition then we'll get back to the initial position where we started the partitioning right where we broke that array into two parts the partitioning is done there we'll go back and we'll try to start initial position then the quick sort function will come right so here in quick sort again we need three different elements array low and high if low is less than high that is smaller element than pivot is present it will all go towards the left side if there is greater element than pivot is present it will go to right side so partitioning is done accordingly so this is a recursive call which we follow for quick sort right we'll be having again array low pi minus one pi is pivot minus one so Again, for the right of the pivot, we have a recursive call function, which is declared here. Once all these things are done, we have to give data in order to sort something, right? We are here presently concentrating on sorting the array, which is given in the ascending order, right? So the data set here is mentioned and it has been assigned as D, right? So the set has been assigned as D, 9, 8, 7, 2, 10, 20 and 1 so these are the elements which we are trying to sort right we are printing the unsorted array that means however the input is present here that is printed as it is unsorted is array is equal to so and so which is already there which, which we are not performing any functions then we have print d that means immediately it will print then size is equal to length of d we'll consider in order to print while we are printing right we have to print element wise so again we have to print it nine first eight next seven next and then two followed by up to one 
so after that is done we will send this particular data raw data which is unsorted data to the function called quick sort which we have created here right so that has been sent once that is sent it will follow all the procedures which is mentioned here all the functions will be passed with the data and then finally we will print sorted array in ascending order which is uh, sorted using quick sort right so let's quickly run this program and check out what is the output so it will take some time in order to take the output so let's quickly see okay so that is what i mentioned unsorted array is nothing but the array which has been given by the user and sorted array is also given after performing all the functions assigned for the quick sort so if you could see it is in ascending order starting from 1 and ending at 20 so this is all about quick sort in python now let's try to understand the time complexity of quick sort algorithm in quick sort algorithm we have now seen that partitioning of elements takes place and we are partitioning all the elements that means all the n elements if there are eight elements all the eight elements will be we iterate through all the eight elements right so partitioning them takes n time that is order of n time and then quick sort problem divides it into the factor by the factor of two right every time we are dividing it by two so the entire process or the time complexity of quick sort in best case and in average case takes order of n time that is big o of log n and same thing happens when we are talking about the average case as well but why this is n square in worst case that is the question right so let me clear it out so the question is that why this thing happens if you are picking either the smallest element in the array or the largest element in the array as pivot in that case you are traversing through all the elements again that means this n is already there for partitioning them that means you will be iterating through the array but the extra n and that means inside that n you are again traversing through all the elements and swapping them because you have picked your pivot in worst case you can either pick it as smallest or the largest element in the array in both these cases you are you will be swapping all those elements with itself that this element will be swapped right this is this is the largest element right this is let's suppose this is eight so nothing will happen right so these are the, this is smallest then it will be swapped with itself this is smallest this is this will be swapped with itself this will be swapped with itself this will be swapped with itself so all the elements will be swapped and finally this element will have its original position at the end right so this thing will happen if you are picking your pivot as the smallest element or as the largest element in the array okay so in this in these two cases this is not the case you are picking your pivots as random uh, you are picking your pivots randomly okay in nutshell when you are picking your element that is your pivot element as smallest r or the largest element in the array in that case that will be your worst case time complexity and it will be big o of n square now let's talk about the space complexity of quick sort now you might be thinking okay we are not using any extra space right we are not using any auxiliary memory like in the form of array stack queue link list or anything right but for calling this function that is the quick sort function we are using recursion right we are calling this quick sort again and again right two quick sort calls are there for maintaining the call stack we require order of n space that is the time complexity will be big of n when we are using this approach and in the worst case this will be the scenario that all the elements will be on the call stack okay so in worst case the space complexity will be big of n but if we modify this approach of of storing the elements and calling the call stack and maintaining the call stack we can reduce it to big o of log n now let's try to analyze quick sort algorithm let's first try to understand the stability so let's suppose if you have this array 1 3 1 dash and 4 now an algorithm is said to be stable if both these one and this one both these in the sorted array will maintain their relative positions now you have the sorted array right 
and both one this one and this one are maintaining their relative positions which were earlier in the unsorted array right so if that thing is maintained right that thing is maintained the algorithm is stable else it is not stable obviously you can have another way with which this is also sorted but this is not a stable this is unstable algorithm and if you are sorting in such a manner and you have these things placed this algorithm is unstable so if you talk about quick sort algorithm quick sort algorithm is an unstable algorithm although we can do some modifications and we can stabilize it or we can add we can make this algorithm as stable but as of now if you talk about quick sort algorithm it is an unstable algorithm what about in place and out place since we are not using any auxiliary memory right we are not using any extra space explicitly right in the form of array or linked list or stack right or even queue we're not using any extra memory right so this algorithm quick sort algorithm although we are maintaining a call stack wherein we are you uh, maintaining a call stack and we have a space complexity of big o of n but since we are not explicitly mentioning this these uh, ex, uh, these ex auxiliary memories this algorithm is an in place algorithm and these are the two analysis that can be done on quick sort so in nutshell if you talk about quick sort right it is unstable algorithm what is merge sort if we talk about merge sort let's try to understand first sorting so sorting is a mechanism of giving order to your values right so let's suppose you have some values random values 10 30 and then you have 5 2 1 and so on right you have these values and now you want to maintain some order so in order to visualize this data let's suppose you want to see uh, the ascending order of it or the descending order of it that is what we mean by sorting so let's suppose you have a class and in that class you have several row numbers and some of the row numbers are not present and then you want to sort those row numbers uh, in terms of ascending or descending order that is when you require sorting so this is the basic intuition behind sorting trying to give order to some kind of values or some kind of a data set right so in this particular tutorial we are going to talk about merge sort so merge sort is a classical sorting algorithm in this sorting every time your problem is divided into sub problems so that your problem set is reduced and then you will be focusing on that sub problem similarly every time when you are dividing your sub problems you will keep on dividing it unless and until there is only one element left right if you compare it with simpler sorting algorithms like bubble is there insertion is there selection is there quick is there when you talk about its time complexity as compared to these algorithms this is very much efficient now it follows a paradigm of divide and conquer what does this mean this means that first you keep on dividing your sub problems and then you will conquer those problems and then you will combine those things okay so here in we will see when you are trying to divide your sub problems and then when you have your problem set and those problem sets are conquered that means those problems are further when you talk about in this example those sub problems are sorted in this case and then you have conquered them and then you will combine them that is your merge phase wherein you will be combining your problem again and then for forming again a single sub problem so every time you will be dividing that sub problem you will be conquering it and combining it so this is how this divide and conquer paradigm works so basically when you are dealing with merge sort you are focusing on two functions that is your merge function and your merge sort function So now let's talk about this divide. That means you are dividing your sub problems, which continues unless and until there is only one element left, because one element in itself is sorted, right? Now this is your divide phase. What about conquer? Basically, you are conquering those individual sets and then merging those two sub problems into a single problem. And finally, you will be doing it on each step. And finally, you have your original array, which is sorted. now let's talk about merge sort algorithm so first let's talk about merge sort method so in this method what we are doing we are dividing our 
array into further sub arrays how we are going to do that we are basically if we have this array right and this array let's suppose this contains eight elements right this is our array and let's suppose this is our left pointer and this is our right pointer and now what we are doing we are dividing it so we need some kind of a in a iterator wherein we will store the sum of and we try to calculate the mid value how would you do it in simple words we calculate left plus right divided by two that's it right so we have this division and then we will divide this part because we are calling this function again right on the left hand side so this is going to call on this side that is we will be talking about now only three elements so this is uh, let's suppose or uh, let's take four elements on this side and four elements on this side so our mid will be 3.5 so we'll be talking about elements from 0 to 3 so we will be talking about four elements and then further these two steps are remain why because we are implementing this in recursive fashion so now let's suppose this is our first function call and you have these three steps one let's name it one two and three okay so in the first function call one two and three so this is the first function call and in this we'll calling again this is the second function call and we are calling again these two remain right and we are calling again one two and three right so in this case again we are calling it on these four elements and it will be divided into further two elements zero and one right and in this case again this is called this will be called on this these two elements right here we are talking about only two elements so this is the third function call and again we will be dividing it these two and three steps are still remaining so in the fourth step what we are doing with only single element right and in this case we are talking about only this element right and further we will not be able to divide it and in that case our left is not greater than our left will be greater than or equal to right and in this case it will be equal to so we will return so now it will be returned right and then whatever was the left over right now we talk about this single element the other element that was left behind we'll talk about that so again that will be divided into one right and again this will the second option i'll just erase it because it looks a little bit messy so now what happens let me just put it again in red so here we call this fourth time and this time it returned right so in this case now we will be on the second step now again it will be called on that single element and again left is not great will be greater than or equal to in this case it will be equal to and then we return so again we are returning so we have these two elements one and one that means not one and one element but there is only a single element in both these arrays right why i'm saying that in these two arrays will be we will check when we talk about merge okay we'll see how that is implemented okay so now these these two function calls are done and then we deal with merge now before going into the merge let me show you a demonstration of how things look so you have these elements and here you have how many elements you have five elements right and now you're dividing it into three and two now this is your first step the second step will be this so now will you go ahead and create this as your third step that means you will move on to this no because we saw unless and until left is not there is no left left right we will not go to the right so this is your second step then this will be your third step this will be your fourth step now you will move on to your fifth step right and now once you don't have anything on the left nothing on the right then what happens will this be your sixth step no your sixth step will be merge so let's move on to merge now so in the merge function if you see the algorithm for that is simple that you create two sub arrays that is the one is your left array and another is your right sub array now in this you have obviously in the last case if you have seen we have a single element here and a single element here now once we have deduced out the length of these arrays what should be the length of these sub arrays and we have declared the length or declared these arrays and then we have initialized these arrays once these three steps are done with then what we are going to do we are going to create three iterators i j and k and those iterators deal with i iterator will deal with the left array j iterator deal with 
right array and k with the original array which helps us to insert the elements so once we we have everything in place what we are going to do the next step is comparing the values right if this element that is the element in left array is less than the element in the right array we are going to insert that in the original array so now let's suppose you have 10 here and 23 here so 10 is less than so we are going to insert this and we increment the k pointer and now also our i pointer pointer will be incremented it was earlier it was 0 and it will go to 1 right and now what happens now our our i is pointing to 1 and our length is also 1 so now that in that case when one of the array is exhausted the next array whichever is the left whichever is left right it can be either the left array or the right array those elements will be directly inserted in the original array because we know for the fact that both of these left as well as right arrays will be sorted in itself okay so let's see what is the next step in the demonstration so here we had our steps right and this will be the sixth step wherein we are going to merge this thing now will we will this be your seventh step no your seventh step will not be this your seventh step will be here this will be your seventh step now sixth step is done now you will be dividing it and you will be creating all those arrays now once you have your right array and there is no right because this left is already done and now you had your right left now this is also done now your eighth step will be this that you will be merging it this will be your eighth step then you will be merging it now will this be your ninth step no you have your this array that is your left array in place but what about the right array is this in place no it is not so now let's try to calculate that now what will be your ninth step this left is done this is your ninth step then what will be your tenth step this is your tenth step well now there is no left right now we'll move on to this right so this is your 11th step because this is the right side of it right and now when you don't have anything on the right now you will be merging these two steps and this will be your 12th step which is over here so this is your 12th step that means you will be merging these two and the final sorted array is this array and it you will get this array in the 12th step so you see 10 11 16 20 and 30. now if you observe carefully you have these individual arrays one and one so now while you are merging them you are also sorting them so the left array is sorted and same thing happens on the right hand side as well if you see three and four these two elements are sorted in this left array so this is the reason in the right array right not the left array so now when you are merging them you will get again an array which is sorted in itself you see 10 16 and 23 so if one of the array is exhausted the next array elements can be directly inserted in your original array let me erase this and you see you have your left array which is sorted and then you are merging it with the right array which is also sorted now if one of the arrays is exhausted the next array either it can be left array or the right array the elements from that array can be directly inserted in the original array because we know the elements itself in either of the arrays either the left or the right are sorted okay so this is how you execute your merge function so here is the program for merge sort in python so how does this merge sort work generally one single array will be broken into two different pieces again those two different sub arrays will be broken into sub sub arrays so after that whatever the answers we get at the last will be combined together in, in order to finish the sorting of that particular array so we are merging all the answers which we got from the sub arrays to make a final result so quickly let's see what do we do in order to have a merge sort in python so first we want an array which has been passed through this merge sort function so what happens inside this function first the length of the array is been calculated once that is calculated it has been divided by two so it gets left and right parts of an array right so after sorting uh, the array into two different halves we have merge sorting left side of an array merge sorting right side of an array right then we'll perform the while operation uh, here with the help of the looping systems so we'll first try to check out whether 
we have the right array less than the length of an array of the left and then again left array it is less than length of the right array so we will try to merge and we try to solve the elements then and there itself so later we'll go back to the left and right parts of while loop here we have length of an array towards the left side we are checking whether it is lesser than or greater than and accordingly we are deciding where we have to merge the answers what we have got from the subarrays right so then we'll always have a printing option of this particular arrays we'll do that in the last before that in order to merge all the answers we have got from all the sub arrays we'll be using for loop here right so all the array answers will be submerged and we'll get the final sorted array which is of uh, so many elements which is there in the uh, input given by the user say for example five different elements were there in an array so after combining all the sub arrays answers we will get the five sorted ascending order elements in the array by using merge sort so let's quickly have a look at it how does this particular merge sort will work so uh, this is set of an array with eight different elements inside that which is not sorted we have to sort that once this array is been passed through the merge sorting function it will perform all the operations finally it will merge all the sorted arrays and it will display in the print list right so let's quickly run this program and check out even though if if it is we are mentioning the words array but we are using list here in python in order to store it right so this is the sorted array which we get so here we could see we don't have a sorted array but here it is sorted in ascending order that is smallest to the highest so this is all about the merge sort next we move to python for machine learning this is where you will learn to manipulate analyze and visualize data using powerful libraries like numpy pandas matplotlib and seaborn unlocking insights from complex data sets Now we'll start off with this library called as NumPy, which stands for Numerical Python. And as it is stated over here, it is the core library for numeric and scientific computing. So whatever numeric or scientific calculations you'd have to perform, NumPy should be your go-to language. And this library called as NumPy consists of multi-dimensional array objects and a collection of routines for processing these arrays. So let's go ahead and create our first NumPy array. So you can have a single dimensional numpy array or a multi dimensional numpy array now we'd have to start off by importing this library so to import numpy we'll type in import numpy as np so this np which you see over here is known as the alias so we are importing the library numpy with this alias np now this numpy library has a lot of methods and one method is called the array method and with the help of this we will be able to create the numpy array All we have to do is type in np dot array, and inside this, I am passing in the list of values starting from ten, going on till forty, and I'll store it in this object called as n one. And when I print it out, I get the result ten, twenty, thirty, forty. Similarly, I go ahead and create a multi-dimensional array. So here we are passing in a list of lists. So here we had a single list. Here we are passing in a list of lists. So as you see, we have a list over here, and inside this we have two more lists. The first list comprises of the elements ten, twenty, thirty, and forty, and the second list comprises of the elements forty, thirty, twenty, and ten. And when I print it out, this is how I get this multi-dimensional array. The first list is present in the first row, and the second list is present in the second row. Now let me go to Jupyter Notebook and implement these two. Let me just add a comment over here. I'll name it as numpy. Now I'd have to import the numpy library, so I'll have import numpy as np, and let's just wait till this library is loaded. Now that this is loaded, I can go ahead and create the numpy array. So for this, I'll have to use np dot array, and inside this, I'll be passing in a list of values. So I'll pass in ten, twenty, thirty, and forty, and I'm storing it in this object called as n one. Now let me print out n one over here. 
And as you guys see, I have successfully created this NumPy array, which over here, the values are 10, 20, 30, and 40. And just to be sure, I'll go ahead and check the type of this NumPy array. So I'll have type inside this, I'll pass in N1. And as you guys see, we get the result NumPy.ND array. So ND array stands for N dimensional array. Now we'll go ahead and create a multi-dimensional array over here. So to create a multi-dimensional array, we'd have to pass in a list of lists inside this np.array method. So I'll have this outer list. Inside this, I will create two lists. So the first list, let's say, comprises of the elements so 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the second list comprises of the elements 4, 3, 2, and 1. Now I'll just print out n2 over here. And I have created this multi-dimensional array where all of the elements from the first list are present in the first row and all of the elements from the second list are present in the second row. Now that we have created these NumPy arrays, we'll now see how to create or how to initialize a NumPy array with different ways. So now let's say if I want to initialize a NumPy array with only zeros, then we have a method called as zeros. It's very intuitive, isn't it? So. Here we are importing the NumPy array, then we are using np.zeros and it takes in two parameters. So these two parameters basically indicate the dimensions of the NumPy array. So if I want to create a one cross two NumPy array where all of the values are zeros, then I can just go ahead and type in np.zeros and inside this I'll pass in the dimensions which is one comma two and I get a one cross two NumPy array where the values are only zeros. Similarly, over here, I am creating a phi cross phi numpy array where all of the values are zeros. So I'll just use np.zeros and inside this I'll pass in phi comma phi. Now let me go ahead and implement this in Jupyter Notebook. Here I'll add the comment np.zeros. Now I'll go ahead and uh, let me just create this in n1 and inside n1 I'd have to use the np.zeros method and over here I'd have to pass in the dimension so the dimensions would be 1 comma 2 and let me go ahead and print out n1 over here so as you guys see I have successfully created this numpy array now if I want maybe a numpy array with a different dimension so the method would be the same. I'll have np.zeros over here and inside this, let's say I want to create a 3 cross 3 numpy array which consists of only zeros and this I'll go ahead and store it in this object called as n2. Now let me print out n2 over here and we have a 3 cross 3 numpy array which comprises of only zeros. Now if I want to initialize a numpy array with the same number then we can go ahead and use the full method. So here I am using np.full and this takes in two parameters. The first parameter is the dimension of the numpy array. The second parameter is the value which we'd want to insert into this numpy array. So here we are creating a two cross two numpy array where the value is filled with 10. So as you guys see, it's a two cross two numpy array where we only have tens. So it's time for np.full. I'll just type in np.full. I'm adding a comment over here. Then let me add np.full and I'd have to give in two parameters. Let's say I'd want a four cross eight numpy array and I'd want the value phi inside this. Now I'll store this in this object called as n3 and I'll just print out n3 over here. And as you guys see, I have created a 4 cross 8 numpy array where the value is only 5. Now similarly, if I want to initialize a numpy array within a particular range, then I can go ahead and use the a range method. So here, as you guys see, I am using np.a range and this again takes in two parameters. The first parameter is the initial value from which the range has to start. So here, when I give in 10, as you guys see, the range starts from 10. And when I given 20, so here again, you'd have to remember that 20 is exclusive or maybe the second parameter is exclusive. And since this is exclusive, we'll only have values starting from 10 and going on till 19. And that is why 20 is not included in this result over here. Now we can go ahead and add another parameter. So here the initial value is 10, the final value is 50 and we have the skip value. So the skip value is 5, which would mean that after 10, we'll have 15. So 15 plus 5 becomes 20, 20 plus 5 becomes 25. And that is how this keeps on proceeding. 
Now, when we reach 45, when you add 5 more to 45, that becomes 50. And since 50 is exclusive over here, that is why we ended 45. But on the other hand, if we had given the final value as 51, then we would also have the element 50 over here. So let's go ahead and implement a range method over here. NP dot a range. And I'll store this in N4. Now I'd have to use NP dot a range and I'll go ahead and give in the initial value as let's say 100. Then I'll give the final value as 200 and I'll print out N4 over here. And as you guys see, we have all of the numbers in sequence starting from 100 going on till 199. Now, if I actually want the value 200 to be included in this as well, let me make the final value to be 201. And as you guys see, this time the range starts from 100 and also includes 200 over here. And we can also add a skip value. Now, let's say if I give him the skip value of 10. So here after 100, we have 110, then 120 and this goes on till 200. Now, instead of 201, if I keep the final value as 200, we see that this NumPy array ends at 190 because 200 is exclusive. Now we can also go ahead and initialize a NumPy array with random numbers. And to initialize NumPy array with random numbers, we can use random.randint. So here we are invoking np.random.randint and over here we have three parameters. And over here we have three parameters. The first parameter is basically and over here we have three parameters. The first two parameters basically indicate the range from which we would want the random numbers. So we would want the random numbers in this range of 1 to 100. And this third parameter would tell the Python interpreter how many random numbers do we need. So in the range of 1 to 100, we would need 5 random numbers. And as you guys see, this is the result which you get over here. So we have 95, 88, 26, 22 and 76, which are 5 random numbers generated between the range of 1 and 100. I'll add this comment random. Now let's go ahead and initialize an umpire with some random numbers. So I'll have np.random.randint because I want a random set of integers. And this will take in three parameters. Let's say I would need values between 50 and 100. And I would need 10 random values over here. And let me store this in N5. Let me go ahead and print out N5 over here. And as you guys see, I have 10 random values which are generated between the range of 50 and 100. Now similarly, if I go ahead and run this again, I'll get a different set of values. As you guys see, we have a different set of values again. When I click this, we again have a different set of values. That was all about initializing a NumPy array with different methods. Now you can also go ahead and check the shape of a NumPy array. And check the shape of a NumPy array. We have the shape method, which again is very intuitive. So here we are creating a NumPy array where we are passing in a list of lists. So in the first list, we have one, two and three. In the second list, we have four, five and six. So obviously we will have a NumPy array where we'll have two rows and three columns. And this is what the N1 dot shape gives us. Now, if we want to change the shape of this, then we can use the same method. So here what I'm doing is I'm typing in N1 dot shape and I'm changing the shape from 2 comma 3 to 3 comma 2. That is instead of having two rows and three columns, I will have three rows and two columns. So this same shape method can be used to check the shape of the NumPy array and also reshape the dimensions of the NumPy array. So let me create a NumPy array over here. So we would have to create a multi-dimensional NumPy array. So this will be n6 is equal to I'll have np.array and inside this I'll have to create a list of lists. So in the first list I'll have values 10, 20 and 30 and in the second list I'll have values 40, 50 and 60 and I'm storing this in n6. 
Now, once that is done, let me just print out N6 over here. So you guys can see this NumPy array. Now I'll also go ahead and check the shape of it. So I'll have N6 dot shape. And we get the result that this is a NumPy array where we have two rows and three columns. Now I can also go ahead and change the shape of this. So I'll have N6 dot shape. And over here, I am changing the shape to be equal to 3, comma 2. Then I'll go ahead and print out N6. And as you guys see, we have converted this from a 2 cross 3 NumPy array to a 3 cross 2 NumPy array. So you had 10, 20, 30 in the first row. We've got 10, 20 in the first row here. So similarly, this is how this has been changed. Then we have some stacking methods over here. We have vStack, headStack and column stack. So let's just start with vStack. So we are creating a NumPy array n1 where we have the values 10, 20 and 30. Then we are creating the NumPy array n2 where we have the values 40, 50 and 60. Now when we use vStack over here, this again takes in two parameters where we'll just pass in two NumPy arrays inside this. So as you guys see, we are vertically stacking over here so when i say vertically stacking i have one numpy array on top of another numpy array so because i'm using n1 comma n2 n1 comes at the top n2 comes at the bottom so this is how vertical stacking works then we can also go ahead and horizontally stack two numpy arrays so n1 and n2, we've got the same NumPy arrays over here. And instead of using vStack, I'm using the head stack method. I'm passing in n1 and n2. And as you guys see, 40, 50 and 60. So n2 has been stacked horizontally to n1. Then we have the column stack. So if we want to stack these NumPy arrays into separate columns, so we have n1 and n2. And when I'm using column stack over here, as you guys see, N1 goes into the first column, N2 goes into the second column. And this is how we can work with these stacking methods. So I'll have to create these two NumPy arrays over here. I'll have N1, which will be np.array. And inside this, I'll have 1, 2, and 3. Then I'll also go ahead and create N2. So this will be np.array. And inside this, I'll have 4, 5, and six so i have my n1 and n2 ready now i'd have to i'll start off with vertical stacking so i'll use np dot v stack and inside this i'm passing in n1 and n2 and let's see what would be the result so we have vertically stacked n1 with n2 n1 is at the top n2 is at the bottom you can also change how these are stacked. So instead of giving N1, N2, let's say if I give in N2 and N1, you guys would see that N2 is at the top and N1 is at the bottom. Now we can similarly work with the head stack method. So here I'll type in NP dot H stack. And inside this, again, I'll pass in N1 comma N2. And as you guys see, I have stacked N2 at the back end of N1. Now, if I want N2 first and N1 second, I just have to change the sequence. So inside np.h stack, I'll give in N2, comma, N1. And I have 4, 5, 6 first and N1 is attached at the back end of N2. Then we have column stack. So I'll just have np.column stack over here. And inside this, I'll pass in N1, comma, N2. And as you guys see, I have N1 in the first column, N2 in the second column. Similarly, if I give in N2 comma N1, you will see that I have N2 in the first column and N1 in the second column. So this is all about stacking the NumPy arrays. Now we'll also work with intersection and difference methods. So here again, we have two NumPy arrays. So in the first NumPy array, we have the values from 10 to 60. And in the second NumPy array, we have the values from 50 to 90. And if I want the common elements between these two NumPy arrays, then I can use the intersect 1D method. 
So here in the intersect 1D method, I would just have to pass in these two NumPy arrays. And as you see in the result, we get a new NumPy array comprising of the common elements in these two NumPy arrays. Then over here I have N1 and N2. If I want to find out all the elements which are unique to N1, then I can use the set diff 1D method. So here in N1, we have the elements starting from 10 going on till 60. In N2, we have elements starting from 50 going on till 90. So here, as you guys see, 50 and 60 are common in N1 and N2. And if I want the elements which are unique to only N1, then I would have to use set diff 1D and I'll pass in N1 and N2. As you guys see, I get only 10, 20, 30 and 40 because 50 and 60 are present in both the NumPy arrays. I can also change the sequence over here. So instead of passing in N1, N2, when I pass in N2, N1, then this will give me all of the unique elements which are present in N2. And since 50 and 60 are common in both the NumPy arrays, the resultant will be 70, 80 and 90 because these are the only unique elements in N2. So let's go ahead and work with intersect 1D and set diff 1D. I'll just add a comment over here, intersect 1D. And I would have to uh, create two new NumPy arrays. I'll have N1 over here. So I'll have NP dot array and inside this I'll pass in one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'll have N2 and inside this I'll go ahead and create a list of elements where the elements start from 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. So I have these two set over here. Now that my two NumPy arrays are ready, if I want to find out the common elements which are present in these two NumPy arrays, I'd have to use intersect 1D. So I'll have NP dot intersect 1D and inside this I'm passing in N1 comma N2 and when I hit on run, we see that the common elements between N1 and N2 are 5 and 6. Now if I want only the elements which are common to N1, then I can use the set diff 1D method. So here I'll have NP dot set diff 1D. And inside this again, I'll be passing in N1 comma N2. And as you guys see, I have 1, 2, 3 and 4, which are common to only N1. Now, similarly, if I want all of the elements which are only common to N2, then I can have NP dot set diff 1D and I'll just change the sequence over here. Instead of passing N1 comma N2, I'll have N2 comma N1 and the only unique elements which are there in N2 are 7, 8 and 9. Now we'll go ahead and perform some simple NumPy array mathematics. So we'll see how to add two NumPy arrays. So again over here we have two NumPy arrays in N1 we have 10 and 20 in N2 we have 30 and 40. Now if I want the total sum of all of the elements which are present in both of these two arrays I can just directly use the sum method. So I'll have np.sum and inside this as a list I'll pass in N1 comma N2 and you will see that the resultant value would be 100 because 40 plus 30 plus 20 plus 10 is equivalent to 100. Now, if I want to find out the individual sum along the rows and along the columns, then I can use the additional parameter called as axis. So if I want to sum the values along the column, then I'll set the axis to be equal to zero. So when I have the axis value to be equal to zero, as you guys see, I have 40, 30 plus 10 equal to 40 and 40 plus 20 equal to 60. Similarly, if I want to sum these up along the rows, then I'll set the axis value to be equal to one. And over here I have 10 plus 20 equal to 30 and 30 plus 40 equal to 70. I'll add a new comment over here, addition of NumPy arrays. And let me create new N1 over here. So I'll have np.array and inside this I'll have 10 and 20. Then I'll go ahead and create N2 and inside N2 I'll again have np.array. And over here I'll have 30 and 40. I'd have to pass this on as a list of values. So I'll have 
30 and 40 inside a list. So I have created N1 and N2. Now it's time to find out the total sum which is present along all of these. So I would have to use NP dot sum and inside this I'll just pass in N1 comma N2 and actually I'd have to pass this as a list. So I'll have N1 comma N2 over here. And as you guys see the resultant comes out to be 100. If I want to add the values along the column, so I'll have NP dot sum, then I'll have this list over here, I'll have N1 comma N2, then I'll have this new attribute called as axis and I'll set the axis value to be equal to 0. And I get the resultant 40 and 60 because 30 plus 10 is equal to 40 and 40 plus 20 is equal to 60. Now going ahead, if I want to add the values along the horizontal rows. So here it will be np.sum and over here I'll have n1 comma n2 again and this time I'll set the axis value to be equal to 1 and I have 30 and 70 because 20 plus 10 is equal to 30 and 40 plus 30 is equal to 70. Now we'll see how to do some scalar operations on these numpy arrays. So here we have a numpy array where we have values 10, 20 and 30 and if I want to add the scalar value 1 to each individual element of the numpy array. All I have to do is add this value 1 to this numpy array and as you guys see n1 plus 1 becomes 11, 21 and 31. Similarly, if I want to multiply each individual element of a numpy array with a particular value. So here if I want to multiply it with 2, I'll just write down n1 into 2. So 10 becomes 20, 20 becomes 40 and 30 becomes 60. And if I want to subtract a value, all I have to do is perform n1 minus 1. So 10 becomes 9, 20 becomes 19 and 30 becomes 29. And if I want to divide it, I'll just have n1 divided by 2. So 10 becomes 5, 20 becomes 10 and 30 becomes 15. So this was some basic idea about NumPy. Now, uh, let me just see what is there in n1 over here. Let me actually add some more elements inside this. So I'll have n1 is equal to np.array and inside this I'll have 10, 20, 30 and 40. Let me also print out n1 over here for your reference. So now that we have n1, what I can do is I will just go ahead and add some scalar values to it. And let's say if I want to add 5 more to each individual element of this numpy array, so I'll just write down n1 plus 5. And as you guys see, 10 becomes 15, 20 becomes 25, 30 becomes 35 and 40 becomes 45. Similarly, if I want to subtract a value, I'll just write down n1 minus 5 over here. And 10 becomes 5, 20 becomes 15, 30 becomes 25 and 40 becomes 35. We can also go ahead and multiply something to this. So I'll have, let's say, n1 into 10. Let me print this out. And as you guys see, we have multiplied these values with 10. Similarly, I can go ahead and divide this with something. So if I have n1 divided by 10, so we see 10, 20, 30, 40 becomes 1, 2, 3 and 4. So this is some basic scalar operation on top of the NumPy arrays. And we can also go ahead and use some mathematical functions. So we have this mean function over here, which would give us the mean value of all of the elements which are present. So the mean value of all of these elements comes out to be 35. Similarly, if we want to find out the median, then all we have to do is use this median method. We have to use np.median, we'll pass in this numpy and we see that the median value comes out to be 55.5. And if you want to find out the standard deviation, I'd have to use STD and I'm passing in N1 inside STD and the value becomes 36.59. So we have N1 over here and if I want to find out the mean value, I'll just have NP.mean and inside this I'll be passing in N1. And as you guys see, the mean or the average value of all of the elements which are present in N1 comes out to be 25. Let me go ahead and create another NumPy over here. So I'll have np.array and inside this I'll be passing in some random values. 
So let's say these are all of the values which are present in N2. And if I want to find out the median of all of the values which are present, so I'll just use np.median method and inside this I'll be passing in N2 and the median of all of these values comes out to be 5. Similarly, if I want to find out the standard deviation, so here I'll have np.std and if I want to start, find out the standard deviation of this particular NumPy array, so I'll pass in N2 and you would see that the standard deviation of all of the elements of N2 would be 2.397. So till now we've worked with some basic NumPy arrays. Now let's go ahead and work with a NumPy matrix. So here we are creating a 3 cross 3 NumPy matrix and to do that you'll again need a list of lists. So over here we'll have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7, 8, 9. So this first list goes into the first row, second list goes into the second row and third list goes into the third row. Now that we have created this NumPy matrix, let's see how can we access individual rows and columns from this entire NumPy matrix. So here, let's say if we want to access the first row, again, you'd have to remember that the indexing in Python starts from zero. If we want to extract the entire first row, we'll just have N1 and inside parenthesis will pass in zero. And as you guys see over here, I have successfully extracted the entire first row. Similarly, if I want to extract the entire second row, then the index value for second row will be one and I have extracted the second row. And if I want to extract a column, then I'd have to do something like this. So in a column, I would want all of the rows. So here from this NumPy matrix, I would want the second column and all of the rows from the second column. So here, since I would want all of the rows, I'll just put in a colon over here. And since I want the second column, I'll give in the index value as one. And as you guys see, I have extracted the entire second column over here. Similarly, if I want to extract the entire third column, the index value will be 2 and I have extracted the entire third column. Let's perform this in Jupyter Notebook. So I'll just write in NumPy matrix over here. Now that this is set, I'll have np.array and over here, I'll have a list of lists. So in the first list, I will have 10, 20 and 30. In the second list, I will have 40, 50 and 60. In the third list, I will have 70, 80 and 90. And I will go ahead and store this in N1 again. Now I'll go ahead and print out N1 and let's see what would be the result. So this is our NumPy array which we have just created. Now if I want to access individual rows from this, I'll have to give in N1. And inside parenthesis, let's say if I want to extract the third row, then the index for the third row will be two. I'll just have two over here. And as you guys see, I have successfully extracted the entire third row. Now, similarly, if I want to extract the entire third column, then this time I would have to write N1. And over here, since I would want all of the records from the third column, so I'll just have a colon over here, then over here. So here you'd have to understand whatever is given on the left side of the symbol would indicate rows and whatever is given on the right side of this comma would indicate all of the columns. So I'd want all of the rows and all of these rows need to be from the third column and the index for the third column is two. And I have successfully extracted all of the elements which are present in the third column. Now we'll see how to transpose a matrix. So what is transposing? Transposing basically means when you're interchanging the rows and columns. So here, as you guys see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. Now the rows should be interchanged with the columns. So here, one, two, three, which is present in the first row comes into the first column. Four, five, six, which is present in the second row comes into the second column. Seven, eight, nine, which is present in the third row comes into the third column. Let's go ahead and perform transpose as well. So all I have to do is use np dot transpose and inside this I'll just pass in n1 over here. So as you guys see initially I had 10, 20, 30 which was in row. This became in column 40, 50, 60 was in second row became the second column 70, 80, 90 was the third row which became the third column over here. Now we'll see how to perform two matrices. So over here we have N1 where we have the elements starting from 1 going on till 9. Then we have N2 where we have elements starting from 9 going on till 1. 
Now, if we perform the dot operator on this, which is basically matrix multiplication, this is how the multiplication happens. So the multiplication is row by column, which would basically mean. So here we have one, two, three. Here we have nine, six, three. So it will be one into nine plus two into six plus three into three, which will give you a result of 30. Then again, we'll have row by column. So here it will be one into eight plus two into five plus three into two, which will give you a result of 24. Then it will be one into seven plus two into four plus three into one, which will give you a result of 18. And this is how this progresses. And finally, we'll get this result over here. And the dot product of n1 into n2 and n2 into n1 will be different. So as you guys see, this is the dot product of n1, n2, and this is the dot product of n2, n1. Both of these will be different. So I already have n1 over here. Let me go ahead and also create n2. So here I'll write n2 is equal to np dot array. And over here, I'll have the elements in reverse order. So I'll have 90. 80 and then I'll have 70 going ahead. I'll have 60 50 and 40 After this I'll have 30 20 and 10 and I am storing this in this object called as n2 Let me also go ahead and print out n2 for you guys over here So this is what we have now if I want to perform the dot product so I'll have n1 I'll actually have if I want to perform the dot product here, I'll have n1 dot dot inside this. I'll pass in n2. And as you guys see, this is the dot product of n1 cross n2. But we know that n1 cross n2 and n2 cross n1 is different. So when I perform n2 dot n1, the result will be different from n1 dot n2. So this was about matrix multiplication. Now we'll go ahead and see how can we actually save a NumPy array and then load it from somewhere else. So here we are creating this NumPy array where we have elements from 10 to 60. Then to save this NumPy array, we just have to use the save method. And over here we are saving this NumPy array with this name called as my underscore NumPy. So this takes in two parameters. First parameter is the name by which we'd want to save this numpy array second is the array which we'd want to save now once that we save this to load this numpy array we will have to use np dot load and over here we'd have to give in the name by which we save this numpy array so we save this numpy array as my underscore numpy and we'd have to give the extension which is dot npy which basically stands for numpy and we go ahead and store this in n2 and we print out n2 we see that we have successfully loaded this numpy array over here. Now I'll go ahead and save this. So I'll have np.save and this as we have seen takes in two parameters. The first parameter is by which I save this. So I'll have save n1 and I would want to store n1. So I have saved this. Now if I want to load this, I would have to use np.load. And over here, I'd have to get the name of the NumPy array. So it will be save underscore n1 dot npy. Let me actually remove this over here. And I will store this in, let's say, n9. Let me click on run over here. So we have an error over here. We have this error because I'd have to give this inside single quotes. Now, if I click on run, we'll get the result. Now, if I print in N9 over here, we finally get the result. So Panda stands for panel data and is the core library for data manipulation and data analysis. So if you want to perform any sort of data analytical task, Panda should be your go-to library. And Pandas provides single and multi-dimensional data structures for the purpose of data manipulation. So the single dimensional data structure is known as the series object and the multi-dimensional data structure is known as the data frame. We'll start off by understanding about the series object. So series object is a one dimensional labeled array. So we have already worked with the NumPy array. So in NumPy array, we had no labels along with it. It was just a simple blank array where we had stored some values. But over here in a series object, as you guys see, we have labels. 
or you can consider them to be indexed with labels over here for these. So first we'd have to start off by importing pandas which is the library and we are giving this alias as pd. So import pandas as pd then if we want to create a series object we'll have pd.series and inside this I am passing in the values 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and when I print it out I get this series object. So when I check the type of this type of s1 this gives me pandas.core.series.series. Now over here you'd have to keep in mind that s is capital over here. So if you're given a small s you will get an error. So let's go ahead and create our first series object. So I'll just add the comment pandas. Now our first task would be to import the pandas library. So I'll go ahead and type in import pandas as pd. Let's just wait for this to be loaded properly. Now that we have loaded the library, I can go ahead and create the series object. So I'll type in pd.series where s is capital. Inside this I'll pass in the list of values. So let's say I'll just have 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50 and I'll go ahead and store it in this object called as s1. Let me print out s1 over here and as you guys see I have created this series object. Let me also check the type of this. So inside the type method when I pass an s1 you guys would see that this is a series object. And over here we have the labels. So the labels are 0 to 4. So by default the label or the index starts with 0 over here. So 10 is present at label or index 0, 20 is present at index 1, 30 is present at index 2 and that is how it proceeds further. Now since we have labels in a series object we can change the how the label of the index looks like. So over here we just had numbers starting from 0 but instead of numbers let's say if I wanted alphabets over here then I can add a new attribute called as index. So over here with this index attribute I am setting the values to be equal to a b c d e. So here initially we had index 0, 0 has been changed to a then we had 1, 1 has been changed to b. We have 2, 2 has been changed to c and that is how it proceeds. So now over here let me go ahead and change these index values so it is the same command over here and with the same command all I'm doing is adding a new attribute called as index and I'll pass in a list of values for the indices so I'll have a b c d let me have d over here and I'll have e now when I click on run and I print out S1 over here, you guys would see that I have changed the indices from 0 to 4 to A to E. Now we can go ahead and see how to create a series object from a dictionary. So we have already worked with dictionaries. We know that the dictionary is a key value pair. So here we'll just give in pd.series and over here we have three key value pairs. A10, B20, C30. So here automatically the keys are taken as the labels and these values are taken as the series values over here. Let me create a new dictionary. So I'll have D1 and inside D1 let me have four key value pairs maybe. I'll have A and 10. Then I'll have B and 20. After that I'll have C and 30. Going ahead, I'll have D and 40. Now, I'll just go ahead and print this out. As you guys see, I have successfully created this dictionary. Now, I would have to create a series object out of this. So, I'll just have pd.series and inside this, I'll pass in D1 and let's see what would be the result. So, these four keys which were present became the labels and these values over here in the dictionary became the series values as well. Now we can also go ahead and change the index position. So similarly as we had actually changed the index values from numerical to alphabetical. So when I given the index values as B, C, D, A, this sequence is maintained. So I have B and C first. So for B I have the value 20, C I have the value 30 and D we had not created any key with this particular index. So that is why we have N, A, N over here. 
and then we have a for which we have the value 10. So this is how we can maybe add a new index position or change the existing index positions. So this is what we had over here. This was our series object. And now what I'd want to do is, so instead of A, B, C, D, I would want, let's say C, B, A and D. And if I click on run, you guys see that the sequence has changed over here. Now we'll also see how to extract individual elements from the series object. So here we have all of these elements starting from one going on till nine. And again, you'd have to keep in mind that the indexing starts from zero. So if I want to extract this particular element over here, so the index value for this would be three. So zero, one, two, and three. And when I give in the index value as three, I am able to extract this particular element. And if I want to extract a sequence of elements over here, so if I want the first four elements, then I'll have S1 colon four. This would mean that I have been extracting all of the elements starting from index number zero going on till index number four. And since four is exclusive, so that is why we will only have till index number three. So we'll have index number one going on till index number three. And if you want to extract elements from the back side, here we'll have S1 and we'll type in minus three over here. So minus three basically means third element from the end, third element from the end. When I give in colon, this would mean third element from the end going on till the end. So this is the third element from the end over here. So that is why I'll have seven, eight and nine. And this is how I'll be able to extract a single element, a sequence of elements from the beginning and a sequence of elements from the back. And let me just create a new series object over here. So I'll have S1 is equal to PD dot series. And inside this, I'll pass in a list of elements. I'll have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 and 70. Now that I have this, let me extract this element, which is present at index number three. So I'll have S1, I'll have parenthesis, then I'll just go ahead and give in the index value. So index value will be three. And as you guys see, I have successfully extracted this particular element. Now, if I want to extract the first four elements, then I'll just give in the colon over here and I'll have four. And as you guys see, I have extracted the first four elements. Now, if I want the last three elements over here, then I'll have S1, then I'll have colon and I'll type in minus three, which would mean the third element from the last going on till the last element over here. And I have 50, 60 and 70, which are the last three elements. Now we can also go ahead and perform some simple operations on top of the series object. So if I want to add a scalar value, so initially we had this series object where the number started from one went on till nine. And if I just wanted to add the scalar value phi to all of the individual elements, which are present in the series object, all I have to do is use plus phi. And as you guys see, one becomes five, two becomes seven, three becomes eight and so on. And we can also go ahead and add two series objects over here. I have S1 where the elements are from one to nine and S2 where the elements are from 10 to 90. And when I perform S1 plus S2, this would add the elements which are present at the same index position. So here we'll have 10 plus 1, 11, 20 plus 2, 22, 30 plus 3, 33. And this goes on till the last index position over here. So let's go ahead and perform some basic operations on top of the series object. So I already have S1 over here. And these are the original values which are present in S1. Now I'd want to add 10 more to these existing values. So I'll just type in S1 plus 10. And as you guys see the values, all of the values which are present in the series object have been incremented by 10. Now also I can add two series objects together. So in the series object, I have seven elements. I'll go ahead and create S2 where I'll have seven more elements over here. So I would have to type PD dot series. And inside this, let me just have seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Let me print out S2 for your seek over here. So we have S1 and S2. And when I perform S1 plus S2, this is the result which we get. 
So 10 plus 7 becomes 17, 20 plus 6 becomes 26, 30 plus 5 becomes 35 and this proceeds to the last index value. So that was all about the series object which was a single dimensional labeled array. Now we'll work with a data frame which forms the major part of all of the machine learning data science projects. So what exactly is a data frame? It is a two dimensional labeled data structure. And if you'd have worked with SQL or maybe Excel, you would have dealt with tabular data. And a data frame helps you to deal with tabular data in Python seamlessly. So a data frame, because this is a tabular data, consists of rows and columns. Now, let's see how can we go ahead and create a data frame from a dictionary. So to create a data frame, we'd have to use this particular method over here. We'd have to type in pd.dataframe where D is capital and F is also capital. So by any chance, if you give maybe D as small or F as small, you'll get an error. So both of them have to be in capital case. And over here, I have two key value pairs. So the first key is name. And then we have a list of values, which are Bob, Sam and Annie. Then we have the next key, which is marks. Then we have the list of values for marks, which are 76, 25 and 92. So here, as you see, the keys become the column names and the values become the records over here. So name and marks become the column names and these values over here, the list of values, Bob, Sam and Annie, which are the values for this key become the records of this particular column. Similarly, these values are there for this particular key and these become the records for this particular column. So let me go ahead and create a first data frame over here. So I'll just go ahead and type in data frame. Now to create a data frame, I'd have to type PD dot data frame and D and F both have to be capital. And inside this, I'll create a dictionary. So to create a dictionary, I would need curly braces. So the first key would be name and I'll go ahead and give in a list of names over here. Let's say the first name is Sam. Then we have Annie going ahead. We have Jennifer. Now, once we have the first key value pair, I'll go ahead and also add their marks over here. So the second key would be marks and I'll have a list of values over here. Let's say Sam has scored 50 marks, Annie has scored 60 marks and Jennifer has scored 70 marks. And I'll go ahead and store this in DF. Let me print out DF over here. And we have created our first data frame where the column names are name and marks and the values are these over here. And let me go ahead and also show you guys the type of this object which I've just created. So inside this type method, I'll be passing in DF. And as you guys see, this is pandas.co.frame.dataframe, which basically means this is a data frame object. Now that we have created our first data frame, we'll perform some basic functions on top of a data frame. We've got head, tail, shape and describe. So we'll just implement all of these. Now to implement this, we will be performing them on a data set called as the iris data set. Now to read any CSV file, we have a method called as pd.read underscore CSV. So here I'll have pd.read underscore CSV. And inside this, I'll give in single quotes and given the name of the file. So the name of the file will be iris.csv and I'll go ahead and store this in a new object called as iris. Now let me hit on run. Let me check the first five records which are present in this iris data frame. So if I want to check the first five records which are present in this iris data frame, I need to use the head method. So iris.head, as you guys see, I have the first five records. So this iris data frame comprises of five columns, which are sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species. And we'll have three different species, which would be setosa, worsi color, and virginica. So this is how we can work with the head method. Now, similar to the head method, we would also have the tail method, which would give us the last five rows, which are present in a data frame. So here I'll type iris.tail and when I click on run, you guys would see the index value over here. The index value starts from 145 and goes on till 149 because there are 150 records in this iris data frame. So we have extracted the last five records and we have printed it onto the console. 
Then if you want to check the number of rows and number of columns which are present in this iris data frame, we can just use the shape method. So here I'll have iris.shape and as you guys see, this gives us a dimension value of 150 comma 5, which means there are 150 records in 5 columns. Then we'll have the describe method. So here I'll have iris.describe. And now when I click on run, we have all of these numerical quantities over here. So let's say if I want to find out what is the minimum value which is present in the sepal length column. The minimum value present in this sepal length column will be 4.3. Similarly, what is the maximum value in sepal length column? It will be 7.9. What is the mean value? It will be 5.84. So these are some interesting metrics which we can find out with the describe method. So now that we know this, let's actually see how can we extract individual records or individual columns from a data frame. So for that purpose, we can use the dot I lock and lock methods. So let's start off with the dot I lock method. So dot I lock method with the help of it, we can extract rows and columns on the basis of index. So here I lock basically stands for index location. And over here, as you see, I have a comma and on the left side of the comma that would indicate all of the rows and the right side of the comma that would indicate all of the columns. So from this entire iris data frame, I am extracting the first three records. So here the rows would be zero to three and three is exclusive over here. That is why I'll have the records where the index values are zero, one and two. And similarly, the columns would be zero to two, which would mean the column which is present at index zero, which will be sepal length and the column which is present at index one, which is sepal width two again over here is exclusive. So let me go ahead and extract some rows and columns with this iLock method. So we already have this iris data frame with us. Let me again print out the head for you guys. So that will be easier for you to have a glance at this. Now, let's say from this entire data frame, I would want the records from index number 30 going on till index number 40. And I would want the columns which are present at maybe index number three and index number four. So index number three will be zero, one, two, and three. This is index number three. This is index number four. So here I'll have index number three going on till the end because this is the last column. Let me print this out and show you guys the result. As you guys see, I have extracted all of the records starting from index number 30 going on till index number 39 and the columns which you see starts from index number three which is this particular columns index and goes on till the end over here. So this is how we can extract individual rows and columns with the dot I lock method. Now we have the dot lock method. So instead of giving the column index, if I want to extract columns on the basis of their names, then I can go ahead and use the dot lock method. And over here, when it comes to rows, you see that I've given zero to three here. When it comes to dot lock, you'd have to keep in mind that three is inclusive. This is the only case where maybe you will find that the final value over here is inclusive. So when I given zero to three, you will get all of the records starting from index number zero going on till index number three, which is also inclusive. And over here, I'm giving in the column names, which are sepal length and petal length. And that is what I'm extracting over here. So I have this iris data frame. Then I'll just go ahead and use this dot lock method. Now from all of these records, let's say I'd want all the records starting from index number 10 going on till index number 20. And the columns which I'd want to extract are sepal length and petal length. I'll just have sepal dot length over here and the next column which I want would be petal dot length. Let me hit on run and as you guys see I have all the records starting from row number 10 going on till row number 20 and 20 is also inclusive over here and the columns which I've extracted are sepal length and petal length. Now we'll see how to drop a particular column. So many a times it would happen that not all columns which are present in a data frame are important. So from this entire data frame, if we want to drop a particular column, then we can just go ahead and use the drop method. So here I'll have iris.drop 
and I am dropping or removing the sepal length column from this entire data frame. So here when I set the axis value to be equal to 1 this would basically mean that I am dropping a column. So if you want to drop a row then you would set the axis value to be equal to 0 and if you want to drop a column then you would set the axis value to be equal to 1. So if I if from this entire iris data sets again I'll show you guys the head of this so that you guys can have a glance at all of the columns which are present over here. So from all of the columns, if I want to drop the species column, all I have to do is type in iris.drop and inside this I'd have to give in the name of the column which would be species and I'd have to set the axis which will be equal to 1 because I'm dropping a column. And as you guys see, I have successfully dropped the species column from this entire data frame. Now similarly, if I want to drop some particular rows which are present in this data frame, so here, as you guys see, the index value, it starts from 0, goes on till 4 over here. But if I want to drop the row indexes of 1, 2 and 3, here as you guys see, I have two parameters. First parameter, I'll give in a list of all of the indices that I'd want to drop. So I'd want to drop the index value 1, index value 2 and index value 3 and the resultant which you see over here after 0 we directly jump on to the index number 4. So now from this entire data frame this is what you see over here I'll just use iris.drop and I would want to drop the index values of 1, 2 and 3 and I'll set the axis to be equal to 0 and when I hit run you would see that after 0 we are directly jumping on to index number 4. So this is a very simple example of how to drop some records and how to drop some columns from your data frame. Now we'll go ahead and work with some simple pandas functions. So from the iris data frame if I want to find out the mean values of all of the columns I can just go ahead and use the mean method. Similarly, if I wanted the median values of the records of all of the columns, then I'll just go ahead and use the median method. Similarly, if I wanted to find out the minimum value, I'll use the min method. And if I wanted to find out the maximum value, I will use the max method over here. So very basic operations. So when I use iris.mean, this would give me the average values of all of the columns. So average sepal length of the entire data frame is 5.8 average sepal width is 3.05 average petal length is 3.75 and average petal width is 1.19 similarly if i want to find out the minimum value of all of the columns so i'll have iris.mean and this will give me all of the minimum values and if i want to find out the maximum values I'll just go ahead and type iris.max and this would give me the maximum value of all of the columns over here. So I've got the mean value, the minimum value, the maximum value and I can also find out the median value. So I'll just type in iris.median and when I click on run over here this would give me the median values with respect to all of the columns which are present. Now we will get on with this library called as matplotlib which is mostly used for data visualization. And with the help of this library, we can create stunning plots such as bar plots, scatter plots, histograms and a lot, lot more. So we'll start off by creating our first plot, which will be a line plot. So we would require two libraries over here. The first library would be NumPy because we would want to create our data with this NumPy library. Then we would import this pyplot submodule from this matplotlib library. So we'd have to type in from matplotlib import pyplot as plt and the alias which I'm giving for pyplot is plt. Then I'll create two numpy arrays over here. The first numpy array will be x and I'm creating this numpy array with the help of this np.a range method and the range will be from 1 to 10. And then I'll create the next numpy array, which is basically two times of x. So all I have to do is multiply x with two and then I'll get y. So here we have one, we have two, two becomes four, three becomes six. And this is how it proceeds. Now, once we create the data, all we have to do to create a line plot is use this plt.plot. So we'll have the 
plot method in this pi plot module. So this takes in two parameters which are x and y. So we have already created our data x and y. So x will be plotted on the x axis, y will be plotted on the y axis. And as you guys see over here, x goes from 0 to 10 and y goes from 1 to 20 over here. And we see that there is a linear relationship between x and y or in other words, as the value of x increases, the value of y also correspondingly increases. So let's go to Jupyter Notebook and create a first line plot using matplotlib. So I'd have to start off by importing the required libraries. So I would need numpy here. I'll type import numpy as np. And after this, I would also require matplotlib. So I'll type from matplotlib import pyplot as plt. Let me write the spelling properly over here. And once I've imported these two libraries, I'd have to create the data. So first I'll have X and this I'll be creating with NP dot a range and the range will be from one to 10. Since I want the numbers from one to 10, I'd have to give the value 11 because 11 will be exclusive over here. Then let me just go ahead and print out X for you folks over here. As you see, we have the numbers starting from one going on till 10. Now, if I have to create Y, Y will just be two times of X. So here I'll have two into X and then let me print out Y for you folks over here. And as you guys see, this is all of the elements are just two times of the elements which are present in X. Now, since I have to create a simple line plot, I would have to use plt dot plot and this would take in two parameters, which are X and Y. So this data would be plotted onto the X axis. This data would be plotted onto the Y axis. And I'll just show this as a result. So as you guys see, we have this object X mapped on the X axis, this object Y mapped on the Y axis, and this is the corresponding line plot. Now that we have created this, we can also add the title X label and Y label. So we'd have to use this title method. So we'll have plt dot title and inside this will give the title as line plot. Similarly, we can also add X label and Y label by using these two methods. And as you guys see, we have added these two labels over here. So let me add the title X label and Y label plt. So I'll copy this entire code over here and then I'll paste it over here. Now, after this, I'd have to add the title. So for that, I'll use plt.title and I'll just give the title as first line plot. Then I'll have X label. So here I'll have plt.x label and here I'll give the X label as X axis. Then I would have the Y label, so PLT dot Y label and inside this I'll give the Y label as Y axis. Let's run this and wait for the results. So as you guys see, initially this was just a bland plot without the title and the X and Y axis labels. Now, with the help of these three methods, we have added the title, the X axis label and the Y axis label. Now we can also go ahead and change some more attributes with respect to this line plots. So we have color, line style and line width. So initially, as you see over here, the color of this line by default is blue. But if I don't want the blue color and if I want some other color, then I can just use this color attribute and assign it a new color. Since I'm giving it a value of G, which basically means green color. And as you guys see, this is a green color. Similarly, we have this next attribute called as line style. So initially we have a solid line, but instead of a solid line, if I want a dotted line, then I can go ahead and use a colon over here. And as you guys see, we have a dotted line right now. And by default, also the line width is one. So we can go ahead and increase or decrease the line width. So here we are setting the line width to be equal to two. And this is the final result which we get. So let's go ahead and add some color line plot and line width. I have the same code over here. Now what I'd have to do is add in some color. 
so i'll have this attribute called as color and i'm setting let's say i'll give it orange color to this now i would have to change the line style so i would want a dotted line instead of this solid line so i'll give in a colon over here and i'll also change the line width so i'll give the line width as 3 so as you guys see initially this was the line which we had but now i have changed it to this so from blue we have converted it to orange from a solid line we have converted it to a dotted line and also you see that this is a thin line and we have increased the width of this line by two points now we have only created one line in one plot but we can also have two lines in the same plot so for this purpose i'll have two y variables so x variable will be the same which will be the number starting from 1 going on till 10 but i'll have two y variables y1 and y2 y1 is two times of x y2 is three times of x so now that we have y1 and y2 ready i'll have to make two plots because i'd want two line plots in the same graph so first i'll have plt dot plot and this line will be between x and y1 so this first line which you are making it will be between x and y1 and for this particular line i'm setting the color to be equal to green the line style to be equal to so this will be a dotted line then we'll set the line width to be equal to 2 then we'll have our next line which will be between x and y2 and the color of this line will be red and this will be a dashed line and we are setting the line width to be equal to 3. Then again we have the title x label and y label and we also have this new method called as grid. So in the earlier plot as you guys see we don't have any grid over here but when we set plt.grid to be equal to true we'll have a grid as well. And this is the resultant line which we get. So here we have the green line over here which is this dash line. Then we, then we also have this uh, next line over here which is between x and y2 and this is the line. And since I've also set the grid to be equal to true, we also have a grid over here in this particular graph. So I'll go back. We already have x now. Let me just print out x for you guys over here. This is these are all the numbers which are present in x. Now we, I, y1 I'll set it as 2 times of x and then I'll have y2 which will be equal to 3 times of x. So I have y1 and y2 ready. Now after this I would have to make a plot between x and y1. So I'll have plt dot plot and onto the x axis I'll obviously have x then onto the y axis I'll have y1 and the color for the first line I'll have green and let's say the line width I'll set this to be equal to 2. Then I'll have the next line which will be then I'll have the next line which will be between x and y2. So here I'll just write down x comma y2 and for this line I'll set the color to be equal to red and I'll change the line width over here again. So I'll set the line width to be equal to 5 and I would just have to print it out. So it will be plt dot show and I would also want a grid over here. So before this I'll set plt dot grid and I will set this to be equal to true. Let's hit run and as you guys see I have two lines in the same plot. Now in the earlier example we had two lines in the same plot but if we actually want two subplots itself that is as you guys see over here this is one subplot this is one subplot and this line is present in the first subplot this line is present in the second subplot. So this is also something which we can create. So first we have x, y1 and y2. So these would be the same variables. Once we have our variables ready, we would have to use the subplot method. So we'll have plt.subplot and inside this I am passing in 1, 2, 1. So here 1, 2 basically means that I would have two plots over here 
and those two plots would be present in this way. So I'll have one row, two columns. As you guys see, I have one row and two columns. So this is column number one, column number two, which are present in the same row. Then I will give in the index of this subplot. So this is index number one. And for this first index, this will be the plot which we'll be creating. So for the first index, the plot will be between X and Y1, color will be green, line style will be dotted and line width will be two. And as you guys see, at index number one, we have this green colored line between X and Y1. Then we'll have PLT dot subplot, which is our next subplot. And the first two parameters will be the same. The third parameter here will set the index value, which is two. So this is what we'll be getting over here. And the second index will have the line plot between X and Y2 and the color as you see is red line style is dotted and line width is equal to two. Then we'll just go ahead and print it out. So we already have X, Y1 and Y2 ready with us. Now, after this, we would have to start off by creating a subplot. So here I'll have PLT dot subplot and I'd have to give in the and here I'd have to give in the dimensions over here. So I'll have one, two, comma, one. So I'm creating my first subplot over here. PLT dot plot. And this plot will be between X and Y1. And I'll set the color to be equal to yellow. Then after this, I'll go ahead and create the second subplot. And the first two parameters will be one and two because I'd want these two plots along the columns and I'll set the index to be equal to two. Then I'll have PLT dot plot and the next plot will be between X and Y2. And over here, I am setting the color to be equal to orange. Then I can just go ahead and show you guys the result. So as you see, I have two subplots over here. The first subplot is between X and Y1 and the color of this line is yellow. The next subplot is between X and Y2 and the color of this line is orange. Now, if I want the subplots along the row and not along the column, that is also I can set. So all I have to do is make this change over here. I'll set this to be equal to two comma one. And similarly over here, I'll make this to be two comma one, which means that I will have the plots along the rows. I'll have two rows and only one column. When I hit run, as you guys see, I have two rows and only one column. This is the first subplot. This is the second subplot. So that was a line plot, which helped us to understand the relationship between two numerical entities. So whatever we mapped onto the X axis was a numerical entity and whatever we mapped onto the Y axis was also a numerical entity. Now we'll go ahead and work with something known as a bar plot, which would help us to understand the distribution of a categorical column. So for this, we are creating a dictionary called as student and it comprises of three key value pairs. We have Bob 87, Matt 56 and Sam 27. Now we'll go ahead and extract the names and values individually. So the names of these students are basically the keys. So I'll have student dot keys, which will give me all of these keys. And I'll go ahead and convert these keys into a list. So I'll pass this into this list method and I'll store the result in this names object. Similarly, I'll extract all of the values. I'll convert all of the values into a list or I'll store all of the values into a list and I'll store that list in this object called as values. So I've got names, I've got values and to create a bar plot, all I have to do is use PLT dot bar and this takes in two parameters. The first parameter will have the categorical values. The second parameter will have the numerical values. Since the first parameter comprises of the categorical values, I'll pass in names over here and the second parameter will be the values. And as you guys see over here on the X axis, I have the names which are Bob, Matt and Sam. And on the Y axis, I have the corresponding values. So we see that Bob has scored the highest marks followed by Matt followed by Sam. Now. Since we are creating a bar plot, I'll just add this comment bar plot over here and I'd have to create a dictionary so that we get the data for this bar plot. 
so I'll name this dictionary as student and we can create a dictionary with these curly braces over here so I'll have the first student who is Bob let's say Bob has scored 45 marks then we'll have the second student Sam and Sam has scored let's say 97 marks then we'll have Matt and let's say Matt has scored only 23 marks so we've got three key value pairs. Now that this is done, I'd have to extract the keys. So I'll type in student dot keys and I will convert this into a list. So I'll cut this, I'll put this inside the list and I will store this in a new object called as names. Now that I have names of all of the students, I'll go ahead and also extract marks of all of the students. So I'll have, I'll store that in this object called as values. I'll have to convert the result into a list. And inside this, I would basically have to extract all of the values. So it will be student dot values. I have names and values ready. And to create the bar plot, I would just have to use plt dot bar. The first parameter will be names and the second parameter will be values then I can just go ahead and show out the result. So we have Bob, Sam and Matt mapped on the X axis and their corresponding values. And we see that Sam has the highest marks and Matt has the lowest marks. And now the plot which we had created earlier was very bland and we can go ahead and add the title X label and Y label to it and also assign a grid. So we'll be using the same methods to add the title. We'll have plt.title and to add the X label and the Y label, we'll be using plt.x label and plt.y label. And we'll also set the grid to be equal to true. I'll copy these two set of commands over here and I would have to set the title. So here I'll have plt.title and I'll set the title to be equal to marks of students then I'll have something on the x-axis plt dot x label and I'll just have names and the x-axis then I'll have something on the y-axis here I'll just write down plt dot y label and on the y-axis I'll just write down marks and I would also have to set the grid to be equal to true so it will be plt dot grid and here I'll set the value to be equal to true. And as you guys see, I have names on the X axis, marks on the Y axis, and I've also set the grid to be true. Now, after this, we can also create a horizontal plot. So the plot which we had created earlier was a vertical plot. So here we are basically doing two things. So if we have to create a bar plot, we have to use bar H instead of using just bar and we are adding a color as well. So by default, we had the blue color. And if I want to change the color from blue to green, I'll use this color attribute and I'll map the green color to this. Rest everything will be the same. Let me add a new comment over here, which will be horizontal bar plot. Now that I have added this comment, let me go ahead and copy everything. I'll paste it over here. And instead of just having bar, I'll have bar H and I'll set the color to be red. And we have this bar plot over here. So it's just that we have to interchange the labels. So on the X axis, now we have the marks. So let me keep this as marks. And on the Y axis, we'll have names. Let me change this to names. And as you guys see, we have successfully created this horizontal bar plot. Now that we are done with the bar plot, we will head on to the next geometry, which will be a scatter plot. A scatter plot again is used to understand the distribution between two numerical entities. And these, and these entities are represented in the form of data points. So we'll be creating two lists over here. The first list will be storing in X, which basically comprises of the elements starting from 10 going on till 90. Then we'll have the next list A, which comprises of some random elements. 
and here you'd have to keep in mind that both of the lists have same number of elements else there'll be an error and to create a scatter plot we'll just use plt.scatter we'll pass this over here we'll pass this over here as a second parameter and then we'll just show off the result let me go ahead and add a comment over here so this will be a scatter plot now to create this scatter plot i'd have to create the data so i'd have to store something onto the x axis so in x i'll just have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and 9 and then i'll have y and then y i'll just have nine random numbers over here so let me just store some nine random numbers which is done now to create the scatter plot i'll have plt.scatter and i'll just pass in x comma y and i would have to show out the result plt.show and as you guys see, I have created this scatter plot. Let's start off with this particular point over here. This particular point indicates these two. So I have X, Y, which is basically one and five. So this intersection between one and five is where we'll be getting this point. So I have X, I have Y, and this is the point I have. Then I have two comma two. So the intersection of two comma two, I'll get this particular point. Then we have this point over here, which is the intersection between nine and seven. So as you guys see, I have nine and seven over here. Now we can also go ahead and add some aesthetics or change the aesthetics of the existing points. So we had same X and A, these are the same list which we have. It's just that we are adding new attributes over here. The first attribute is marker. Initially, we just had solid circles. So instead of having solid circles, if I wanted a star, then with the help of this marker attribute, I'll add star over here. Similarly, to change the color, I'll just have C and I'll assign green to this attribute C. And also I can change the size of this and to change the size of this, I'll be using S. Let me copy this entire thing. I'll be pasting it over here. So these two will be the same. I'll add this new attribute called as marker and I'll set the marker to be equal to star and I'll change the color. Color will be, let's say I'll have orange again and I'll have size to be equal to 200. Let me print it out. And as you guys see, this is the result. Just to show you guys what happens if we increase the size instead of 200, if I keep it to be 500, you guys see that the size has increased again. Now, instead of 500, what happens if I keep it to be 50? You would see that the size of the stars has decreased. Now, as we did with the line plot, where we had two lines in the same graph, we can perform a similar sort of thing over here, where we'll have two different sets of points in the same plot. So for this, we would need a new list. We already have X and A, then we'll create a new list called as B. Again, we'd have to keep in mind that the elements which are present in this list or the number of elements which are present in this list should be equal to the number of elements which are present in A as well as X. Then we'll go ahead and create our first scatter plot by using plt.scatter and the first scatter plot will be between X and A and the first scatter plot here, these dots will be represented with stars. Then we'll go ahead and create the second scatter plot which will be between X and B and these will be represented with circles. And also we have different colors for both of these scatter plots and also the size of the different data points will be different. I'll copy this entire thing over here and I'll paste it down. I'll change this to be equal to Y1. Then I'll have a Y2 as well. And then Y2, I would need uh, some bunch of elements over here, random nine elements. So let me just have some random nine elements. 
let me just check how many elements do we have so i have one two three four five six seven eight and nine so these three lists are ready after this i'd have to go ahead and create the first scatter plot which will be between x and y1 then i'll go ahead and create the second scatter plot which will be between x and y2 and i'm not adding the marker because we have already added the marker for the first one i just change the color for this so the color for second one let's just keep it to be blue so i don't have to add the color as well and i'll change the size of this so for this i'll set the size to be equal to 500 so as you guys see, I have two sets of points over here. The first set of point is being denoted by the small stars. The second set of points is being determined by the solid circles. Now, instead of having those set of points on the same plot, we can go ahead and create two subplots as well. So we'll be using the subplot method as we had used during the case of line plots. So here we have these three lists, then I'll have plt.subplot, then we'll have the same three parameters. And since I want these plots to be present column wise and not row wise, I'll have one comma two, which means that I'll have one row, two columns, and then I'll give the index. So at index number one, we'll have this scatter plot, which will be between X and A. So this is the scatter plot between X and A. Then I'll go ahead and create the next subplot and the next subplot will be between X and B. I'll copy this entire thing. I'll paste it over here. It's just that I'd have to create a subplot now. So I'll have plt dot subplot and I want these plots column wise. So I'll have one comma two comma one and the first subplot will be this. Then I'll go ahead and create the second subplot. So I'll have plt dot subplot and here I'll be writing one comma two comma two and this is our first subplot and this is our second subplot so that was all about the scatter plot a categorical column but when it comes to histogram we'll be using that to understand the distribution of a continuous numerical column and we'll be creating this continuous numerical column or continuous numerical data with just a list over here. So this is a very basic example. I'm just creating a random list which comprises of all of these numbers and I'm storing it in this object called as data. And to create a histogram, all I have to do is use this hist method. So inside plt.hist, I'll pass in this list. And when I show out, this is the result which I get. So here, let's actually have a look at this particular bin. So in a histogram, these are known as bins. So here, for this bin, for the value 3, we have this value 4 or for the value 3 on the x axis, we have this value 4 on the y axis, which would mean that this number 3 is occurring 4 times. Similarly, if I look at this 1 over here, so for this 1 on the x axis, we also have the value 1 on y, which would mean that 1 is occurring only once. Similarly, we have 4. So this number four is occurring two times. Then we have eight, which is occurring three times. So let's go ahead and create a histogram in Jupyter Notebook. I'll just add a comment over here. Histogram. And let me go ahead and create a list. So I'll store this list in L1 and I'll have some random numbers over here. So I have created my list. Now that this is ready, I can just go ahead and build out the histogram by using this method called as plt.hist and inside this I'll be passing in L1. Then since I just have to show this out, I'll just have plt.show. And this is the result. So as you guys see, this number three is occurring four times. Then we have this number six, which is occurring three times and the rest of the numbers are occurring only once. Now we can also go ahead and change the number of bins which are present or the color of the histogram as well. So to change the color, we'll just use this over here. So the, for the color attribute, we are mapping in G, which will give us this green color. 
and initially we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bins over here. But instead of seven bins, let's say if I want to reduce the number of bins, I'll just use this attribute and set the number of bins to be equal to four. And this is the result which I get. I'll copy this entire thing. I'll paste it over here. Now that I have created this histogram, I would want to change the color of this. So I'll set the color to be equal to green and instead of so how many bars do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and nine. So instead of having nine bars, let's say I would want only three bars over here or three bins over here. I'll set the bins value to be equal to three. And as you guys see, I have only three bins. Now let me set it to be five. And I have one, two, three, four and five bins. This was all about histogram. Now the earlier histogram which we had created was with respect to a single list. But if you want to create a histogram on top of a data frame, then let's see how can we do it. So here we'll be building this histogram on top of the iris data set. So if you have to load any data frame, we'll have to use read underscore CSV since this is a CSV file. So inside read underscore CSV, I am passing in the name of the file and I'll store it in this object called as iris. And when I use iris dot head, this will give me the first five rows which are present in this data frame. Now after that, to create the histogram, we'll just use plt.hist and inside this. So here we were passing in the list of numbers, but here instead of passing in the list of numbers, I'll pass in the column. So we have this sepal length column which is present in the iris data frame. So I'll just pass in the sepal length column and I'll set the number of bins and I'll also set the color to be equal to something. And when I show it out, this will be the result which I'll be getting. So here I'd have to load the iris data frame first. So in the iris object, I'll just have PD dot read underscore CSV and inside this, I'll give in the name of the file, which will be equal to iris.csv. I'll click on run. So I'd have to import the pandas data frame as well to use read underscore CSV methods. So I'll have import pandas as PD. And we have, let's just wait till this is loaded, both the library and also the data frame. Now in the while it is loaded, I'll go ahead and write in the head method as well. Now, if I click on run, we'll have a glance at the first five records which are present in this data frame. And as we see, we have sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and the species column. And now I'd want to create a histogram for, let's see this petal length column over here. Then I'll just have to type in plt.hist and inside this, I'd have to pass in this petal length column. So here, so I'd given the name of the data frame first and using this parenthesis, I'll given the name of the column. So the name of the column, let me keep this to be small. It'll be petal length and I'll set the number of bins to be equal to, uh, let's say 50. And after that, I'll set the color of the bins to be equal to green again. And we can just go ahead and show the result. So this should be color and not C. I'll keep it as C O L O R. All right. So as you see, we have successfully created this histogram for this petal length column. Now we'll head on to the next geometry, which is a box plot. So this box plot basically gives us a five number summary. So here in this result, what you see, this is the minimum value. This is the 25% value. This is the 50% value. This is the 75% value. And this is the maximum value. So we'll be understanding more about this as we progress through the session. So first, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and create three lists. In the first list, we just have numbers from one to nine. In the second and the third list, we have randomly given some numbers over here. And then we'll create a list out of all of these three lists. So inside this list method, I am passing in one, two, and three 
as a list and I'll store the resultant list in this object called as data. Then if I have to create a box plot, I'll just use plt.boxplot and inside this I'm passing in this data object which I just created and when I show it out, this is the result which I get. Now when I compare these three boxes, let's actually understand the inferences over here. So for this plot or this plot, this box basically refers to this particular list. This box tells us that the median value of the numbers which are present in this list is 5. The maximum value is 9. The minimum value is 1. Similarly, if we look at this particular box, so this box refers to this particular list. And this box tells us that the median value will be 3, the maximum value will be 5 and the minimum value will be 1. Then if we have a look at this particular box, this would tell us that the median value will be 7 for this list. The minimum value will be 4. The maximum value will be 9. So it's time to create a box plot. I'll add this comment over here. Box plot. And after this, I'd have to create three lists. So I'll have L1. And inside L1, I'll just have all the numbers starting from 1 going on till 9. Then I'll have L2. Inside L2, I'll just randomly give in 9 numbers. And again, I'll have L3. And also in L3, I'll just randomly give in some numbers over here. Now, once we have L1, L2 and L3, I'd have to create a list of lists. So inside this, I'll just be passing in L1, L2 and L3 and I will store this in a new object called as data. So now that we have created data, I can just go ahead and build out the box plot. So I'll have plt.boxplot and inside this, I'll just pass in data. Then I can just show it out to you guys. So we have these three box plots over here. So the first box plot represents this particular list. We see that the median value is 5, minimum value is 1 and the maximum value is 9. Then we have this second list over here. So for this, the median value is 5, the minimum value is also 1 and the maximum value is 8. So and for this particular list, it seems that the median value and the 75% value is same. So for this, the median value is 8, the minimum value is 5 and the maximum value is 9. So one another geometry which is analogous to the box plot is the violin plot. So the only difference is to create a violin plot will be using violin plot method instead of box plot method. And this is the difference between how these boxes and violins look. And we can, uh, so normally if we don't set the show medians to be equal to true, we'll not have these lines or these indicators over here. So we'd also have to set this to be equal to true. So now here, I'll just copy this entire thing. I'll paste it over here. And instead of having plt.boxplot, I'll just have plt.violinplot and I'm printing out the same data. And as you guys see, I have created this violin plot. And now if I want the median, so I'll have show medians and I'll set this show medians to be equal to true. And as you guys see, I have added the medians as well. And after the violin plot, we'll have the pie chart. And pie chart again helps us to understand the frequency or percentage of different categorical values. So here we have two lists. The first list comprises of all of the names of different fruits. So we've got apple, orange, mango and guava. Then in the second list, we've got the quantity of these fruits. So we've got 67 apples, 34 oranges, 100 mangoes and 29 guavas. And if I want to represent this relationship of the quantity of these fruits in a pie chart, this is how I can do it. So I'll be using plt.py. And here first I'll be passing in the numerical entity. So the numerical entity is this quantity and I'll be passing that over here. Then I'll have the categorical entity over here, which is fruit. So I'm assigning fruit to labels. Then I can just go ahead and show the results. And as we see in the result, we see that the 
maximum percentage is of mango and the minimum percentage is of guava. So I'll have to create two lists over here. I'll create the first list. I'll have fruit and the first fruit will be apple. The second fruit will be mango. The third fruit will be orange and the fourth fruit will be lychee. Now that we have created all of these fruits, I'll also assign the quantity. So let's say I have 53 apples. I've got 43 mangoes. I've got only 12 oranges and I've got 97 lychees. So I've got these two ready. Now after this, I'd have to create the pie chart. So I'll have plt dot pi first i'd have to give in the numerical object which will be quantity then i'd have to give in the categorical object so i'm mapping fruit onto the labels then i would just have to show out this pie chart so plt dot show as you guys see this is the resultant pie chart so the maximum portion belongs to lychee and the minimum portion belongs to orange because we have 97 lychees and we have only 12 oranges. Now we can also go ahead and change the colors of these different sectors and also add the actual percentage in these different sectors. To add the percentage, we'll be using auto PCT. So here for this auto PCT attribute, I am using 0.1 F. Now, what this basically means is the 0.1 basically means that I'll have the decimal values to one place. So if I have 0.1, this will mean I have decimal values to one place. If I'll keep it as 0.2, then I'll have decimal values to two places. And after this, I'm just adding this new attribute called as colors and the coloring, it starts from the first label, which is apple over here. Orange, then I've got blue, which is for mango. Then I've got black, which is for guava. I'll copy this entire thing over here. I'll paste it over here. Now to add the percentage, I'll be using auto PCT and here I'll have to use percent 0.1 F. Let me add percent percent. And after this, I'll also have to set the color over here. So the colors I'd have to give in a list of colors. So let's say for apple, I'd want to give in green. Then for mango, I'd want to give in yellow. Then for orange, I'd obviously want orange. And for lychee, I'd want pink. Now when I hit on run, let's see what would be the result. Let me change this to colors instead of color. So as you guys see, I have the percentage over here because I had used auto PCT attribute and it seems that we have out of all of the fruits, 47.3 of them are lychees and this is the color indicated. Similarly, out of all of the fruits, only 5.9% of them are oranges. So we have created the pie chart. Then something which is very similar to pie chart is the donut chart. And to create this donut chart, we'll be using two pie charts over here. So the data is same. We have fruit and quantity. It's just that first we'll go ahead and create our first pie chart, which comprise of quantity and labels. And I am adding a new attribute inside this, which is the radius. So I am setting the radius of this to be equal to two. Then I'll go ahead and create another pie chart here inside this i'll just pass in so first we'd have to pass in numerical entity so i'll just have a list which comprise of only one element or one value which is one and this entire value or this entire list comprise of only one color which is white and i'll set the radius to be exactly half of the original pi so i'm setting the radius to be equal to one and as you guys see this is the outer pie chart this is the inner pie chart so the outer pie chart has a radius of two the inner pie chart has a radius of one and since i've given a color of white this is what i have over here so you can give in any random number over here that doesn't really matter so you can give one ten five it is all the same it's just that keep the color as w because since a donut 
it just basically looks like a donut, we'd have to give in the white color. I'll copy this entire thing. I'll paste it over here. I'll set the radius for this to be equal to, let's say four. Then I'll have a new pie chart over here. I'll just give in a random value. Let's say I'll give in five over here. And after this, I'd have to set in a color. And since there is only one value, I'll just give in white color over here. And after this, the only thing which I have to set is radius and I'll set the radius for this to be equal to two. Let's hit on run. And this is the donut chart, which we get. So as you guys see, the radius for the outer pie chart is four, the radius for the inner pie chart is two. Let me reduce this. Let me keep this to be two actually. And let me keep this as one. And this is the resultant donut chart. So Seaborn is another visualization library which is built on top of Matplotlib. So if you want to work with Seaborn, then we'd have to import Matplotlib as well. So to import Seaborn, we'd have to type in import Seaborn as SNS. And since this is built on top of Matplotlib, we'd also have to import Matplotlib. So we'll have from Matplotlib import PyPlot as PLT. And Inside Seaborn, we have this method called as load data set, and we have some built in data sets inside the Seaborn library. And one such built in data set is the fMRI data set. And I'm storing this in this new object called as fMRI. And then I'll have a glance at this first five columns of this data set. So we have these columns we've got subject, time point, event, region, and signal. Now, out of all of these columns, I'd want to make a line plot between the time point column and the signal column. So to make a line plot with the help of the Seaborn library, since I've given the alias for the Seaborn library as SNS, I'll type in SNS dot line plot and onto the X axis, I am mapping the time point column and onto the Y axis, I am mapping the signal column. And then I'll have a new attribute called as data. So basically I am building this line plot on top of this fMRI data set that I just go ahead and show out this line plot. So let's understand this properly. So if you look at this line plot closely, you would see that till the time point of five seconds. So let's say if this time point is in seconds, so till the time point of five seconds, the signal value is increasing. But from time point of five seconds to 10 seconds, you have the signal value to be increasing. And after 10 seconds, this sort of stabilizes and only increases to so here, if the value is minus 0.05, so from minus 0.05, it goes up to close to zero. So now that we are done with matplotlib, let me go ahead and create a new notebook over here. And I'll name this new notebook to be equal to Seaborn. Let me rename it. I'll delete this. I'll name this as Seaborn demo. And we'd have to load the required libraries. The first library is obviously Seaborn. So I'll have import Seaborn as SNS. Then I'd also need pyplot. So I'll have from matplotlib import pyplot as plt. Let's just wait for these two libraries to load. And once we have Seaborn with us, we'll be working with the fMRI data set. So to load the fMRI data set, we have the load data set method, which is part of the SNS library. So I'll have SNS dot load data set. And inside this, I'll be passing in the name of the data set, which is fMRI and I will store it in this object called as fMRI and let me have a glance at the first five records of it. So I'll just type in fMRI.head and these are the different columns which are present and I'd want to make a line plot between the time point column and the signal column. And for this purpose, I'd have to map the time point column onto the X axis and the signal column onto the Y axis. SNS dot line plot and onto the X axis, I am mapping time point and onto the Y axis, I am mapping signal and the data is obviously fMRI, then I would just have to show out the result. So I'll have SNS, 
I'd actually have to give in plt dot show over here. Let's hit run. So we have successfully created this line plot. And as we had already seen, so till five seconds, there's an increase in the signal value from five to 10 seconds, there's a drop and then it sort of stabilizes. Now we can also add a new attribute or new aesthetic called as hue. So here we had only one line and this one line arbitrarily the color of this was blue. But if I want the color of the lines to be actually determined by a column, what I can do is I can map a column onto the hue aesthetic. So we have the event column and we are mapping the event column onto the hue aesthetic. So now the color of the lines would be dependent on this event column. And since we have two events over here, we have the stim event and we have the Q event. This blue color line represents the stim event and this orange color line represents the Q event. And if we look at this blue color line over here, you would see that till time point of five seconds, the signal value, it goes up till maybe 20 and then it drops down to a minus 0 0.1. And similarly, if we look at this Q event, you see that the peak is not so high. So for the stem event, it was almost 0 0.2. And when it came to Q, it is only 0 0.05. But you'd also notice that the drop is not so steep. So for the drop of the stem event, it came from 0 0.2 and it will drop down to minus 0 0.10. But for this particular signal Q, the drop is very small. It dropped from 0 0.05 to only minus 0 0.05. And also if you see the increase of it, so once it dropped, the increase of Q event is much higher when compared to the increase of the stim event. So this is the same set of commands. It's just that I am adding a new attribute called as hue and I'm determining the color of the lines on the basis of this attribute and I'll be mapping the event column on top of this. So as you guys see, I have this event column and this is the same column which I'm mapping onto this hue aesthetic. Event, we see that we don't have the event column. So what I'll do over here is I will cut this out. I'll paste it over here. I'll put in a comma. And since this is a column, I'd have to put this in double quotes. Now when I hit run, so it seems like we have an error again over here. I have two commas. Let me go ahead and delete this comma. And we have successfully produced these two line plots over here. Now we can also go ahead and change the style of how these lines look. So now if I want these lines again or the style of these lines again to be dependent on a column, I can just go ahead and add a column onto the style aesthetic. So the color is also being determined by the event column and also the style is being determined by the event column. So it will be the same command and I'll be adding a new attribute to this. I'll have style and to this I am mapping the event column. And you see that the Q event is being represented with this dotted line and the stem event is being represented with this solid line. So now that we have created that, we can also add markers on top of it. So all we have to do is set the markers to be equal to true. Here in this command, I'll have this new attribute called as markers. And when I set this to be equal to true, you will see that. So I have markers now. When it comes to the stem event, the markers are solid circles. And when it comes to the Q event, the markers are crosses. So that was all about line plot with the help of the Seaborn library. Now we'll go ahead and create a bar plot with the Seaborn library. So to create this bar plot, we'll be actually needing the Pokemon data set. So we'd have to start off by loading the Pokemon data set. So we'll have pd.read underscore CSV and we'll store this Pokemon.csv file in this Pokemon object. And once we store it in this object, 
we can go ahead and create a bar plot for this is legendary column. So this is legendary column is a categorical column and that is why we are creating a bar plot. And this is legendary column, we have two categories 0 and 1. So 0 indicates that the Pokemon is not legendary and 1 indicates that the Pokemon is legendary. And onto the Y axis, I am mapping the speed column. And from this bar plot, it is very evident that legendary Pokemons or the speed of the legendary Pokemons is higher when compared to the speed of non-legendary Pokemons. So now I'll have to go ahead and load up the required data set. So to load the data set, I would need pandas. So I'll just type in import pandas as PD. Now, once I have this, I need to load the CSV file. So I'll type in pd.read underscore CSV. And inside this, I'll give in the name of the CSV file, which will be pokemon.csv and I will store it in this new object called as Pokemon. And once I've stored this, let me have a glance at this. So I'll just type in Pokemon.head and I'll show you all of these columns. So these are the different columns which are present over here. So against bug, against dark, against dragon, all of these columns basically tell us how does a Pokemon perform against these types of Pokemons. Then let me scroll it to the last. So here we have this is legendary column, which would tell us if the Pokemon is legendary or not. Then we have this generation column, which would uh, tell us the to which generation does this Pokemon actually belong to. Then this column tells us what is the weight of this Pokemon in kg. Then this type one tells us what is the primary type of the Pokemon. Type two tells us what is the secondary type of the Pokemon. And then we've got other columns as well. So now for this bar plot, we'll be only working with this is legendary column and then the speed column. So I'll be using SNS dot bar plot and onto the X axis, I would have to map is legendary and then onto the Y axis, I'll be mapping the speed column and the data onto which I'd want to build this bar plot is the Pokemon data set. Then I can just go ahead and show this out. And when I hit on run, you would see that I have successfully created this bar plot. And again, it is very evident that the legendary Pokemons, the speed of the legendary Pokemons is higher when compared to the speed of non legendary Pokemons. So now we'll create a bar plot between is legendary column and weight in kg column. So is legendary column is again mapped onto the x axis. It's just that here for the y axis, we are mapping weight kg column. And this time it is very, very obvious that legendary Pokemons, their weight is much, much higher when compared to non legendary Pokemons. I'll cut this out. I'll paste it over here. And instead of mapping speed, I have the weight kg column. And when I hit on run, you would see that the weight in kg of a legendary Pokemon is much higher when compared to the weight in kg of a non legendary Pokemon. Now we can also go ahead and determine the color of these bars on the basis of a column. And we already know to do that we will be using the hue aesthetic or the hue attribute. And I want the color to be determined by the generation column. So this time I'll be mapping the generation column onto the hue aesthetic. And as you guys see, we have seven generations over here, starting from generation one, going on till generation one. And since we have two different legendary status, so zero indicates that the Pokemon is not legendary. One indicates that the Pokemon is legendary for these two categories. I'll have seven bars each. So for those Pokemons, which are not legendary, I'll have these bars, these seven bars indicating to which generation does the Pokemon belong to. Similarly, for all of the Pokemons which are legendary, I'll have these bars indicating to which generation does the Pokemon again belong to. And again, on the Y axis, since we have mapped speed, we have the speed values corresponding to whether the Pokemon is legendary or not legendary. So the same set of command. I would have to use the hue aesthetic and onto this, I'll be mapping the generation column. 
and as you guys see so this denotes all of those Pokemons which are not legendary this denotes all of those Pokemons which are legendary and it is very clear that legendary Pokemons they have much much higher weight when compared to non legendary Pokemons and we have the distribution of Pokemons which belong to the different generations with respect to both legendary Pokemons and non legendary Pokemons. Now going ahead we can also change how the different palettes look for these bars. So we will use the palette attribute. So we've got these three different palettes over here. So again the bar plot is between is legendary column and weight column. And it's just that instead of using a column to map it onto the hue aesthetic, we are using a new aesthetic called as palette. And we can directly use different predefined palettes. So first we have the blues D palette with a capital B. This is how it looks like. Then we have the rocket palette and this is the resultant. And then we have the VLAG palette. Let me delete this hue attribute over here. And instead of that, I'll have palette attribute and the first palette which I'll be using is blues D. And as you guys see, this is the blues D palette. Similarly, if I want maybe a more of red color, then I'll be using the rocket palette. Then if I want maybe a light shade of bluish gray, I'll be using VLAG. And this is what I'll be getting. Now, instead of maybe using a palette or maybe mapping a color onto the hue aesthetic, I can just go ahead and use the color attribute and assign one single color for all of the bars which are present. So I'm using the color attribute and I'm mapping the orange color to both these bars. I'll remove palette and instead of palette, I'll have the color attribute and I will set the color of these two bars to be equal to orange. And this is the result. So we are done with bar plot as well. Now we'll go ahead with the next type of plot, which is scatter plot. And we have already learned that a scatter plot is used to understand the relationship between two numerical entities. And over here, we are building the scatter plot on top of the iris data set. So we'll load this data set up, then we'll be using sns.scatterplot and onto the x axis, I am mapping the sepal length column and onto the y axis, I am mapping the petal length column and the data onto which I'm building this scatter plot is the iris data set. And again, it's very clear that as the sepal length of the iris flower increases, the petal length of the iris flower also increases linearly. So here I'd have to load up the iris data set first. So I'll have pd.read underscore CSV. I'll give in the name of the file, which will be iris.csv. Now that I have loaded this, let me show you guys the first five rows of all of the columns. And this is the resultant. And to create the scatter plot, all I have to do is use plt.scatterplot. And since I want the scatter plot between sepal length and petal length, and I want sepal length to be onto the x axis. So to x, I'll be using sepal dot length. And on the y axis, I would need petal length. So let me give in the name of the column over here, which will be petal length. And the data which I'm using is obviously iris. Then I can go ahead and show out the result. So let me just keep it as scatter over here. And again, this has to be equal to small d and not capital D. Let me hit on run over here. And this is the resultant value. Now, as you see over here, we can go ahead and add in color and also change the style of this. So initially we just had a simple plot between sepal length and petal length, but now I want these dots to be determined or the color of these dots to be determined by the species column. So that is why I am mapping the species column onto the hue aesthetic. And after that, similarly, I am mapping the species column onto the style aesthetic as well. So here, as you see, we've got three different colors, blue, orange, and green. 
the blue color is being determined with the setosa species then we've got this orange color which is for the voci color species then we've got this green color which is for the vojnica species similarly we've got three different styles over here for setosa we have solid circles for voci color we have crosses and for vojnica we have solid squares the same command which i've copied i've pasted it over here i'll add two more attributes the first attribute will be hue and on to hue i'll be mapping the species column similarly on to style as well i'll be mapping species column and when i hit on run so i'll have it as hues now when i hit on run seems like we have an error over here let me check it properly and this over here has to be just hue now when i hit on run this is the resultant scatter plot which i get and now let's say instead of having the colors to be determined by a categorical column if i actually want the color to be determined by a numerical column i can also do that so pure since petal length is mapped on the y axis and i want the color to be with respect to the petal length i'll go ahead and map the petal length onto the hue aesthetic and as you guys see over here as the value of petal length is increasing the intensity of these points is also increasing so here on this lower left side over here we have all of this very light shaded circles and at the top right you have this high intensity or high intensely colored circles over here i'll copy this i'll paste it over here now i'll want the hue or the color to be actually determined by petal length itself let me keep the l to be capital and when i hit on run you would see that as the petal length value increases the intensity of the color also increases let me just go ahead and also add the style over here so this time the style will be determined by the species column and you would see that we have three different styles for setosa this is setosa you have solid circles for voci color you have crosses and for vojnica you have solid squares so this was about a scatter plot now we'll go ahead and make a histogram or a distribution plot so a distribution plot you can consider this to be a combination of a frequency curve and a histogram and we've already worked with histogram where it came to matplotlib we know that a histogram is used to understand the distribution of a continuous numerical value so for this we'll be using the diamonds data frame so we'll load up this diamonds data frame we'll store it in this diamonds object and then we'll have a glance at it after that we'll to create this distribution plot we'll use dist plot and inside this i if i want to understand the distribution of the price column i'll just pass it over here so i'll have diamonds of price and as you guys see this would show us the distribution plot and as i've told you the distribution plot is a combination of a histogram and the frequency curve over here i'll just add this comment and i'll add distribution plot now over here to create this distribution plot i would need to load up the diamonds data set so i'll have pd.read_csv and inside this i'll be passing in the diamonds.csv file and i will store it in this new object called as diamond now that i've loaded this data set let me have a glance at the first five records of this so diamond.head and these are the different columns which are present so i've got carrot which obviously tells about the carrot of the diamond then we've got the cut type of the diamond we've got color clarity depth table price so this is price of the diamond in us dollars so the price would mostly range from around 300 dollars to around 18000 dollars then we've got x y and z x over here denotes the length of the diamond in millimeters y denotes the width of the diamond in millimeters and z denotes the depth of the diamond in millimeters so once this is clear i'd have to 
make a distribution plot and since distribution plot is used for continuous numerical values i'd want to make a distribution plot for this particular column so i'll have sns dot disk plot and inside this i'll be passing in diamond i'll have square braces over here inside this i'd have to pass in the column which is price and i would just show this out i'll have plt dot show and you would see that I have created this distribution plot over here. Now, in the distribution plot, let's say if I want only the frequency curve without the histogram, that also can be done. It's just that in the same command, I would have to set hist to be equal to false. And when I set hist to be equal to false, I'll only get the frequency curve. I'll copy it, I'll paste it over here and I'll add a new attribute called as hist and I'll set this to be equal to false and when that is done you would see the difference. So this was a distribution plot which had both histogram and the frequency curve. Now this is a distribution plot which comprises of only the frequency curve. Now similarly we can go ahead and add a new color to this and to add a new color we'll just use this color attribute and add this so this was the distribution plot which we had created and to this if I want to add color I'll use this color attribute I'll assign it red and you would see that I have assigned it the red color now if I want a distribution plot without the frequency curve which would mean I'd want only the histogram then here I will set KDE equal to false. So in the distribution plot, either we can have both the histogram as well as the frequency curve, or we can just have the histogram, or we can just have the frequency curve. To just get the frequency curve, we'll set his to be false. To just get the histogram, we'll set KDE to be equal to false. And we can also go ahead and vary the number of bins which are present. To vary the number of bins, I'll use this attribute called as bins and over here I'm setting the number of bins to be equal to 10 and I'm just setting the color to be equal to green. I'll select this over here, I'll paste it and I'll set KDE to be equal to false and when I do this, you would see that I have only the histogram without the frequency curve. Now if I want to change the number of bins which are present, so since there are 150 records, I'll have 150 bins, but instead of uh, having all of this, so let's say if I want only 50 odd bins over here, I'll set 50. And as you guys see, I have only 50 bins. Now, let's say instead of 50, maybe if I want only 10 bins, so you will see that I have only 10 bins. Now, let's say if I want only five, that also something which can be done. I'll set the value to be equal to five and we have only five bins over here. And after this, Let's say if I want to plot it on a different axis. So till now we've been creating this distribution plot where on the X axis or basically this was based on the X axis, but instead of having it to be based on the X axis, if I want to map it vertically, then I would just have to set vertical to be equal to true. I'll have the same command over here. And here I'll set vertical to be equal to true. I'll remove this KDE equal to false from this. I'll also remove this particular attribute from this. Now, if I hit on run, you would see that I have mapped this distribution plot onto the Y axis. Next, we have a new geometry called as a joint plot. So this joint plot is a combination of a scatter plot and a histogram. So as you guys see over here, I have a scatter plot in the center and I have a histogram at the top side and the right side. And I'll be creating this joint plot on top of this iris data frame. So once I've loaded this iris data frame, I want to create a joint plot between sepal length and petal length. So I just created a scatter plot. So for scatter plot, we are just use scatter plot method. For joint plot, it's just that we have to use this particular method. We are passing in the same columns. Now, 
when it came to scatter plot we had only this particular part but when it comes to joint plot here what you see for sepal length you would have the histogram of the sepal length column as well similarly for petal length you will have the histogram for petal length column as well so this is an interesting point about joint plot we already have loaded the iris data frame now I'll have to use SNS dot joint plot and onto the X axis I'll be mapping sepal dot length and onto the Y axis I'd have to map something so onto the Y axis I'll be mapping petal dot length and that is pretty much it i actually have to give in the data as well so the data on which i'm making this is the iris data set then here i'll have plt dot show and when i hit on run so it seems like we have an error over here so sepal length so l has to be capital let me make it capital l and you would see that I have successfully created this joint plot where I have the scatter plot in the center and I have corresponding histogram for sepal length on the top, corresponding histogram for petal length on the right side. And over here, if I want to change the color, that is also something which can be done. And we've already seen this throughout. So all I have to do is use this color attribute and I have to give in a color for this. And if I like the olive color, that is what I'll be going ahead and mapping it onto this attribute. I'll add this color attribute and I'll have olive and as you guys see I have mapped the olive color for this joint plot. Now for this if I want a regression line through the scatter plot and also through the histogram I'd have to use this new attribute called as kind and for this new attribute kind I am assigning this value reg. So as you guys see, I have this regression line which is passing through the sepal length values and the petal length values and also it is passing through both of these histograms. So here, I'll have kind and I'll have the value reg set for this kind attribute. Let's wait for the result and you would see that I have added a regression line which goes through the histogram and also goes through the scatter plot. Once I have done this, let's go ahead to the next geometry which is a box plot. And to create a box plot, we'll just be using this box plot method and we'll be creating this box plot on top of the churn data frame. So we'd have to load this data frame first. So this data frame tells us about the different features of a telecom company and on the basis of this features we'd have to find out if the customer will churn out or will stick to the same company. So here we have the churn column and the tenure column. The churn column I'm mapping onto the x axis, the tenure column I'm mapping onto the y axis and obviously I'm building this box plot on top of the churn data frame. Uh, one interesting attribute about a box plot is that box plot can be mostly used to understand how does a categorical value change along with a numerical value. So that is why here we have mapped this categorical column churn onto the x axis and this numerical column tenure onto the y axis. And we see that. So this what you see is the median value which we have already seen so when it comes to people who do not churn out it seems that those people who do not churn out their median tenure or their tenure in general is longer than those people who actually churn out so i would have to load this data frame first i would have to store it in this churn object so churn is equal to pd dot read underscore csv and inside this i'll have churn dot csv and then let me have a glance at the first five records of all of the columns and these are all of the columns and for all of these columns i'd have to make a box plot between this tenure column which would go on the y-axis and this churn column which would go on the x-axis sns dot box plot and on to the x-axis I'd have to map obviously the tenure column 
on to the y axis i am mapping the churn column then i'd have to use the data which is churn and i'd have to show it out so i'll have plt dot show so i've actually made a mistake over here so tenure will go on to the y axis and churn will go on to the x axis now if we get this box plot and we've already seen the inference it seems that those people who do not churn out this their tenure seems to be longer than those people who actually churn out and now this time we'll be creating a box plot between the internet service column and the monthly charges column so we have the monthly charges column onto the y axis and the internet service column onto the x axis and we've got these three different categories in this internet service column so the internet service can either be dsl fiber optic so this no means that the people don't have or the people haven't subscribed to internet service and it is very clear that those people whose internet service is fiber optic they would have the maximum monthly charges similarly those people who do not have internet service their monthly charges is minimum so when you compare this box to these two boxes it is very evident that people who don't have internet service their monthly charges are very very low i'll copy the same command over here but on the y axis i'll have monthly charges and on the x axis i'll have internet service and this is the resultant box plot which we'll be getting now we'll go ahead and make another box plot between the contract column and the tenure column tenure column would go on to the y axis contract column would go on to the x axis and we can have three different types of contracts month to month contract one year contract and a two year contract and if we look at the tenure of it so let's actually look at the median values of the tenures so it seems that if the contract is of month to month then the median tenure is the lowest similarly if the contract is of two years then the median tenure is the maximum and we are setting a palette over here so again we can have different palettes so the palette which i'm using is equal to set 1 on to the y axis i'll be mapping the tenure column on to the x axis i'll have the contract column let me write in contract column over here and uh, the data will obviously be the churn data set and uh, what i'd have to do is i'd have to use a palette and the palette which i am using is equal to set 1 and this is the resultant box plot now you see these boundary lines over here if we want to change the thickness of these boundary lines we can do that with the help of this line width attribute so here i am setting the line width to be equal to 3 if you compare this particular box plot with the earlier box plot it is very clear that the thickness has increased the same code I'll actually have tenure and contract over here. On to the x-axis, I'll be needing contract, and I will use this line width, and I'll set this to be equal to three. And you would see that the line width has increased substantially. and after this let's say if i want to change the order of how these boxes are present so here initially the boxes were present in the order of month to month one year two year but instead of this order let's say if i want two year first followed by month to month then after that if i want one year then i can use this attribute called as order and inside this i'll pass in the list which will comprise of the order in which i would want these boxes to be present so here i'll remove the line width and instead of line width i'll use this attribute called as order and first i'll have two year after that i'll have month to month then finally i'll have the last box which will be one year 
and you would see that I have changed the sequence. Now, if you want to add colors on the basis of a column, which we've been doing throughout, that can be done with the help of this hue attribute. And I want the color of all of these boxes to be determined by this payment method column. So here I am mapping this payment method column onto this hue aesthetic. And as you guys see, I have these four different payment methods. I have electronic check, mail check, bank transfer and credit card. So electronic check. So this particular box or wherever all of these boxes, where the color of the box is purple or dark blue, that denotes electronic check. Then we have the box where the color is orange. That would denote mail check. And if the color of the box is green, that would denote bank transfer. And if the color of the box is red, that would denote credit card. So here I'll add this attribute called as hue and I want the hue to be determined with the help of this payment method column. And you would see that I have four of these over here. So I have four boxes with respect to these three different categories. Ready to explore the forefront of technology? Generative AI is our next stop. We will demystify how AI can create new content and show you how to implement these advanced models using Python. Think of a magical box that could materialize everything you could imagine. A box that can create a new video, write you a story, draw a lovely picture or even record a song. It sounds like something from a storybook, isn't it? Well, it's generative AI, not magic. Hello and welcome everyone to this video where we are going to examine how this incredible technology functions, how it is changing the world today. Are you prepared to discover AI's magic? Let's get started now. So let's start with quickly understanding the evolution of computers. When the computers were created, they were created as calculating machines for mathematicians and bookkeepers. Then it evolved to understanding programming languages so that it can understand instructions, human instructions. But now it has evolved to incorporating human-like intelligence as well as creativity. Mimicking human-like intelligence is nothing but artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence combined with creativity is nothing but generative AI. So let me make you understand with a very simple example what is generative AI. Transport yourself back to your childhood. You had a lot and lot of toys to play with. You would keep that toys in one box. Now also imagine that if you wanted some toy which is different, you would not get in the market. But what if I tell you that this box is a magical box and if you input your understanding of what you want in your new toy with instructions, it can create a new toy for you, which is not available in the market. Now, this toy can be a beer with unicorn features and wings. What if it generates for you? This magical box generates a toy which is very unique for you. This magical box is nothing but generative AI. Generative AI actually is not a magic. It's a fast and rapidly evolving artificial intelligence system which creates, generates, transforms content that can be text, video, audio, image, etc. based on your input. So if we want to understand it technically, Generative AI or Gen AI functions by employing a neural network to analyze data patterns and generates new content based on those patterns. Neural networks are nothing but a mimicry or a replication of your biological neuron based on how it gets from brain, the activity from brain and you do your work. It's nothing but a mimicry of that. Based on that mimicry, it analyzes data patterns and generates new content for you. Let's now quickly see what is the difference between discriminative and generative AI. Suppose you have a 
data set of different images of dogs, cats. You provide this as an input to your discriminative AI, which acts like a judge and it classifies all this into set of images between cats and dogs. This is discriminative AI. It classifies. Now let's understand what is generative AI. You have the similar set of cats and dogs, but now your generative AI is acting like an artist. It creates a new species of dogs for you. That's why generative AI is nothing but AI system that transform, creates, generates your own content based on your instructions like an artist. Now that you have understood what is discriminative AI and what is generative AI and what is the difference between the two, let's understand why is generative AI or gen AI trending. Gen AI has impacted various fields, be it text, audio, video, any input, and those inputs in various domains like data, management, tech, healthcare, and entertainment. It has creative applications such as DALI, ChatGPT, where you can input what you want and get output from it. For example, if you want to create an image, what you think or perceive as a concept and you want it, you give a prompt for your generative AI model and it will create that image for you. So your input is a text, but your output is an image. That's why it's trending. It does not depend how traditional AI is dependent on what form of input you give. The same form would be your output. However, Gen AI works on your inputs, on your instructions. That's why it's trending. It is impacting a lot of fields, be it creative field, be it research field, be it business. Professionals are using tools like ChatGPT to create or generate code so that they can create something new. The researchers are actually developing new and new large language models based on which we can create new generative models and can do new and new tasks each and every day. That's why generative AI is evolving rapidly. And that's why it is close to magic for everyone. Now that you have understood why it is trending, now let's understand how it works. We give an input to generative models. Gen AI works on generative models. We give an input, it can be text, audio, video, any format. Those generative models are then pre-tained on the data and they are fine-tuned to do the task that you want. It can be text summarization, it can be sentiment analysis, it can be image generation, it can be audio generation for your YouTube channel or analyzing your customer feedback if you are a brand or a marketing firm. It can create codes, whatever you want. You give a prompt what you want, explaining it that what you want and it fine tunes and gives you that task for you. So this is how, in nutshell, generative AI model works. So now let's see what are the different types of generative AI. First one is Generative Adversarial Network, GANS. It's a type of AI where two models, one generating the content and one judging it, work together to produce realistic new data. Second is Variational Autoencoders. This AI learns to recreate and generate new similar data. Third is Transformers. Transformers is an AI which learns to produce sequences using context. Fourth is Diffusion Model, which generates data by refining noisy starting until it looks realistic. Now that you have understood what are the different types of generative AI, let's quickly walk through different applications of generative AI. First one is content generation. It creates, it generates whatever textual or any code that you want. Customer support and engagement, if you are brand firm, it helps you with that. 
data analysis and data science. It helps with visualization. It helps with analyzing any data. It be it any data you want. You are a brand firm or you are a technology firm. It will help you analyze your data and create new automated task for you or it would create new perceptions for you to take over. Then it is code generation and software development. We have research and information retrieval as well where it helps different researchers, it helps different professionals to grow and retrieve, extract information required from different or various data sources. Then we have machine translation. If you are a person who do not understand a language and you are watching something or reading something which is in different language, you can use generative models to translate text or audio or anything into the language that you require. Then we have sentiment analysis, which actually takes feedbacks or any text that you have to give you. Is it a positive, negative or neutral sentiment? And so that you can analyze and take decisive decisions. Other domains here include healthcare, transport, everywhere it helps. Generative models, generative AI is helping each and every domain in their perspective, how they are applying this technology change in their domain. So let's now quickly conclude what we have learned in this video. We learned AI is a superset. We have a subset called machine learning, which trains your machines to do what you want. But there, the machines need your input. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning which incorporates neural networks which mimics your neurons so that it can imitate human intelligence. Then comes generative AI which involves creativity, introduces creativity in artificial intelligence system. Then comes large language models. Large language models are basic bits that you will learn in our upcoming videos so stay tuned. Just before we conclude, let me tell you different generative AI tools which are in the market and which you can explore. Some of it are ChatGPT by OpenAI, Claude by Anthropic AI, Copilot by GitHub, Gemini by Google. You can go and explore the world. However, stay tuned to our channel so that you can learn more about generative AI, large language models, prompt engineering and several different buzzwords that are there in the system. Let's start with the first topic, overview of Python. When you hear the name Python, you know the various applications of it. First and foremost thing, it is a high level programming language, which is very unique compared to other high level programming language. Why? Almost it will use English like statements in order to execute the code. It's very easy to learn as a beginner this particular Python language. Now, why do we use Python in generative AI? It's not about generative AI. It's about Python is already having a well supported set of libraries which is already in use since years with respect to domains like data science, machine learning, natural language processing, deep learning, etc. Now, artificial intelligence and generative AI is grabbing the libraries which we have already in Python. Other programming languages are also used, but I could say Python is a versatile programming language which makes life easy for the people working in this technological domain. After understanding an overview of Python, let's quickly hop on to the next topic. Introduction to Generative AI Applications, which is the core concept which we have to learn. Generative AI refers to algorithms which enables machines to produce content that is not only new and original, but also includes a reflective data and it will be always trained according to the requirement. Right? Generative AI deals with a lot of models. What does these models include? GANs, that is Generative Adversal Networks. VAEs, variational autoencoders, and transformer based models such as ChatGPT. Right? 
what do we do with this generative AI applications? It's very important in order to train the algorithm or the machine in order to keep it updated. The more you interact with this, the more it gets trained. That's how simple it will work. And generative AI helps you to generate your own models. How you want to train that particular model, you can train it accordingly. Just like simple example, how does the scientist train the robots? Each robot will do its own different work, right? Hope you would have seen the requirements are different. The catering of requirements is different. Hence, the models will be trained accordingly with the help of generative AI. Yes, it includes a lot of other technologies, deep learning, neural networks, etc. But still, generative AI is also a base of it. What is the significance? Creativity boost. It creates analysis processes by providing very good content ideas, new content ideas, the new way to approach the problem. Efficiency, it is giving a helping hand to human beings in order to be more efficient. The more good you use, the more productive you will be. Automates the content creation or saving time is very much important. It's an important resource now. It aids to this particular saving time resource. Then personalization. It generates particular personalized content as per your requirement, as per the prompts you give to chat GPT. That's how it works, right? So it will cater various applications for the same. This is the overall picture of generative AI applications. Now let's talk about the next concept development environment setup. How do we do this? What is it all about? You have to have a platform in order to work with. You need to have a basement in order to build a building, right? So let's learn how do we build this particular basement. So what does this thing consist? It consists of few steps in order to set up a particular environment. It is not dealing with much higher softwares or something from moon and stars. It's very simple. You have to go to Python official website and download the latest version. For now, it is 3.12. You can download that Python into your local system and you can execute this via command prompt. Right? First step, we have to open command prompt, which we have in our local system. And then we'll have to navigate to the location where the Python is installed. Hope everyone are having a clear idea of how do you work with Linux and Unix. At least basic commands like cd change directory, mk make directory. So only these two commands are mostly used in this complete session. I'm not going deep into advanced level of Unix, Linux and all. If you want to work with a command prompt, you have to just use cd and mk command and you can make directory or change directory. Simple as that. If you are using Windows, you can use command prompt or PowerShell. For Mac OS or Linux, you can use terminal. This is the platform you need in order to work with. After navigating to the location where the Python has been installed, you can install all the libraries using pip command, right? So, pip install is a basic command and you can change the libraries you want accordingly. First, we will talk about NumPy. NumPy is very well known amongst the domain called data science. Why? The first thing is NumPy will always cater in order to help the mathematical calculations, also working with high level data structures and give you the complete access to the functionalities and arithmetic and logics. That is why data science is dealt with a lot of data, numbers and other elements. We use NumPy for the same. Then we talk about Flask. When you hear the word Flask, it is a library which is related to Python where it is web-based framework. You can create web application using this particular Flask framework. That is the major help of using Flask. The next one is Streamlit or Stream LIT. This particular library deals with visualizing the models created. Then you have Torch, Torch Vision and Torch Audio. Basically, this library caters computer vision models. You can 
work with the model creation you can view the model and also you can add certain multimedia to the model created right you have this torch library in order to cater computer vision projects models etc you have transformers next transformers will always help you in classification text summarization many other aspects again dealing with data and majorly we use all these libraries in machine learning artificial intelligence nlp natural language processing and deep learning also computer vision this is the applications of where this particular library will be used using pip install we are always installing all this library single handedly not in mass library installation every library will be installed along with the execution output command stating it has been installed it will show you it is installed now still you don't trust how do you check it verification of the installation is very important because since we are working with machine sometimes it might help you to have a better vision when you verify if you don't verify if the installation is crashed you never know it will affect your project so better verify once you install it's very simple in order to verify as well you can open command prompt and type python double hyphen version it will ensure it returns the installed python version what is this particular version you are working with next you verify the installation of the libraries for that you have to just go open python interactive shell type python and then import every library which you have already installed if it is imported properly without any error then it is installed properly right so this is the overall development environment setup idea which you have to have and which you have to create in order to do coding in order to create certain applications or work with a project now we are in the command prompt in theoretical aspect we have known about various libraries in python that is numpy flask streamlit torch transformers let's install the same libraries with the help of command prompt first if you could see it's in a general path it's in my personal path but yeah it is in c drive now in my personal laptop the location of the python is been fetched for that i have to use cd command change directory paste the location where your python has been installed and then press enter when you do this the command prompt goes to this particular folder let's start with the first command pip install numpy now since i have already been working with python a lot many times for many projects you will get a output just wait and watch i click on enter it might take some time it will try to analyze what's happening what they are trying to install and requirement already satisfied this is what you'll get the output that means numpy is already installed in your particular system because we were already working and there is a warning message you could notice if you want to upgrade the particular library which you are using you can go for the version mentioned I am currently using twenty one point two point three. It is suggesting upgrade for twenty four point one point two. Then, what is the command for the same? Is also been mentioned here. You can use that command. We have now installed numpy, which was already existing. It has given the message. If in case it's a new installation of library, how it will display? Let's try with other libraries as well. Pip install. flask i am giving enter let's wait for the results again if you could see it states flask is already present that is satisfied again you have a warning regards to the version i have almost installed all the libraries but let me check for the next one streamlit if you could see how it is downloading the streamlit library 
if you are trying to install the library which is not in the current local system in your python this is how it will start loading if it is already existing this is the message which you got for numpy and flask when you try to install streamlit library which is not present in your python this is how it starts downloading and it takes 5 to 10 minutes at least to complete the download depending upon your system configuration likewise you can install all the libraries required for you into your system right so i have given two examples one how it will download the library which is not in your system if you already have downloaded the library how the message will pop up that is requirement is already satisfied that means it is already installed right so this is how you import your libraries in python now in order to verify is your particular library is installed or not first it will try to prompt you that it is already existing if it is not it will start downloading as mentioned now again in order to verify that you have to go to python interpreter so i'll click on to the same particular location type python here when you click enter it will go to the python interface where you can execute your code now what you do is you try to import numpy when you try to give this particular instruction to the python prompt inside the command prompt which we have logged in it will try to enter or import this numpy library which is already existing when you type the statement import numpy if your numpy is present it will not throw up any error it will look just like this this indicates your numpy is there in the python library folder this is how you verify the libraries which is already installed before using it or else if you mention in your code as well it will throw up an error if it is not installed before make sure you install the libraries then use it in your code this was a simple demonstration of how you install and verify if the library is present in your python with the help of command prompt now let's understand introduction to open ai gpt api how this particular thing works and what is open ai first of all what is open ai it's a company where it will cater in order to work with chatbots generative ai applications different kinds of models llms etc basically it is dealing complete artificial intelligence domain which is booming nowadays open ai has a platform where you can generate the api keys and you can integrate those into your applications api features what are the features it will cater for text generation completion and conversation capabilities so talking about text generation it is always dealing with providing a new text which is not in your imagination with one small question say i want a poetry on so and so it will give you a complete poetry where it is not plagiarized it has been trained in that level it can think about writing poetry it has lots and lots of data behind how it is dealing with that what is to be categorized there comes classification summarization and many other machine learning and data science models artificial intelligence models which is giving you the answer priya next completion if you give a prompt in a incomplete way it will try to complete that if you give with a spelling mistake it will correct your spelling and ask you back was this your idea do you want to search so and so thing it will question you back in a interactive conversational way what we do with chat gpt it's the conversation how it will answer us with the help of already available data it has been trained on and it is updated every time you talk to it that's how the model works with so these are the few features we have next comes to fine tuning and customization for specific task 
say you are building certain module which has been integrated to your application you are using open ai platform you can generate your own model it can cater to your own set of questions say for example chatbots in uh, some or the other shopping websites or jewelry shop websites it will try to ask you what you want the lots of chatbots which will address and also will help certain percentage of customer care services without human intervention which can be done with the help of machine 100% it will be solved other aspects it cannot a very good example for this is swiggy right you can give a set of questions which is already present where is my order delivery guy is not moving so when you put this my order is getting delayed it will give a set of answer which is already there what is the current status still if you are not convinced by the bot answer you can go for a agent talk you can talk to a human being where they'll interact they'll call the delivery guy and ask what is the situation and update you something like that might happen before in introducing your particular chat to directly to the agent they'll try to solve with the help of bot that means we are trying to reduce the work which is put upon humans we are using the technology in order to address the same this is a best example for the feature which is currently in use in the apps which we use in our day to day life how do we get start with this api we have to just log on to open ai website create your account sign up or if you already have an account sign in log in generate a api key and keep it why you have to generate a api key i'll let you after 5 dollars of content you have to pay in order to improvise your api key in order to improvise your api key usage right you want to know more about what is open ai how does it help for gpt api everything you can just go to the official api documentation and understand more about this now let's understand how do we generate a open ai api key for that you have to go to google type open ai login once you click on login if you have already logged in you will get two options one is to go to chat gpt another one is to for api you click on api once you click on the api this is how your open api platform look like you could see a menu here towards your left stating api keys if you click on that it will launch api keys before that i would like to tell you i was talking about the gpt models right so these are the models available for now gpt 3.5 turbo 0125 1106 and 16k these are the models you can select the model and you can work on let's come back to api keys i'll click on the api keys this is how the api keys generation look like and if you want to create a new api key click on create new secret key and you can name that particular one i am naming it as demo you can also give the restrictions if you have to control certain things it can be a read only restricted or all just like the share option you have in your google drive for your google content right so create a secret key and it will generate and display the secret key there you can copy and paste it in one particular notepad so that you can use it again and again it is taking certain time to generate the key once it is done it will display and you will also have an option called copy for it here we are it states api key is generated and you can copy the key you can press as done see you have to save the secret key somewhere because it won't be viewed again due to security reasons that's why you have to keep it discreet and noted in a notepad separately you cannot get it back again if you want to again you have to create a new api you cannot copy this complete api key again the created api key is listed in the list here again you have the options to edit the key you can just change the name and permission nothing else 
you don't have access to again copy the complete key and you can also delete the existing key. This is how your API key page look like in OpenAI platform. Hope you are clear how to generate these and save it in a place and use it for your coding. Now let's talk about Flask Chat GPT app. We are integrating OpenAI source to our application. That is the main agenda of it. Let's understand more about this application. How do we work with this and also look at the demo for the same. What is the basic setup we need is as simple as that which is mentioned before. You have to have Python installed in your system and all the libraries mentioned to be installed in your system. That's the basic ideology for all the demonstration which is carried in the session hereafter. The components we need is Flask for web framework. As I mentioned, we use Flask of Python library for web framework. And then open AI GPT API for generating responses. A simple logic, we are taking a API key of open API, putting that in your Python code, and then we are trying to execute the same. First, we will check how this particular code look like and what are the in detail step in our Google Collab. Note, I am not executing this in Google Collab. I am executing this in command prompt. But for a better clarity, I am using the online coding platform that is Google Collab in order to have a good interactive and bifurcation between the text and the code. Right? Google Collab is a very good place in order to work in order to have a good python content on let's check out the code and understand what all does it do in order to create chat gpt app using flask library in python now here we are on the google collab first step we have to is set up the environment as i told we will activate the virtual environment of python what is this python m v and v let's understand one by one python invokes the python interpreter which is already installed in your system then m v and v this option always tells python to run v e n v module as a script this module is used in order to create virtual environments on that that is why we try to invoke this next again you have v e n v this is the name of the directory where the virtual environment will be created and it is not mandatory that you have to keep the second venv as it is you can change this to be abcd also or you can also put it as virtual environment it is not mandatory that you have to use the same name but with m you have to use venv this is mandatory and the second venv is optional you can change the name accordingly naming convention can be changed according to the requirements next after doing that setup, we create the Flask application. As I told you, we are using only two commands of Unix since we are working in command prompt. First is make directory, mkdir. That is, we are creating a folder with the help of command prompt. That's it. There is nothing great that's happening. Creating a new folder, the folder name is GPT chat app. And you are trying to change the path, change directory cd to that particular location. And remember, wherever you have installed your Python software, that folder itself, these things to be created. We have to first navigate to that particular Python location. Then only we can create a new folder. Else there will be an execution problem and path issues. After doing the folder creation, we will have to create code file. First is a Python code file, which I would like to name it as app.py, application.py. Again, this is not mandatory. You have to have app. You can name it accordingly, but you have to remember what you have named. While you are executing this, you have to remember the exact Python file name, including the cases. It is case sensitive. Okay. First, we will import the flask elements first is flask library next request jsonify 
and render template. Then we will import the requests and also import time. These are the libraries we'll try to import, which is available in Python to our particular code. We will try to use request and render template, also the timing, in order to have the conversation between the system, that is chat GPT, which we are trying to create, and our questions. Then we will initialize the Flask application. This is the Flask application initialization syntax. We will try to give a open API key. This is a secured key which you should not share with anybody else or else they can utilize and you have to pay the bill for the same. Better you keep the API keys very discreet. This is a random API key. It's a sample API key or else you can just put in your code, enter your API key here. This is far better rather than giving people your original API. Once you put this API key, you will next define the route of the home page, where it has to interact from. Obviously, you cannot show this backend code to the user. You have to have a front end. You have a front end that is called index.html. There comes the second core file. First one is having app.py core python file. Next, it has to be integrated to the front end that is index.html. Right? We will render the particular HTML template. That is why we will be using render template library. Okay? We have usage of these libraries everywhere. Then, we will define the route for chat endpoint which accepts the post request. Post request is nothing but what message you put to the GPT and what it has to respond back. And this complete thing will happen with the help of JSON. Then you get the response from GPT-3. And remember, there's lots of GPT models. Which one you are using, you have to have the knowledge about it. You have GPT-3.5 Turbo 16K. You also have just GPT-3.5 Turbo. You have many kinds of model. The current model which we use, you have to mention it here. And you also have to carry the input given by the user from the front end to the back end with the help of this messages. The data should be transferred from the front end to back end. What is the maximum limit of the response is 150 letters, characters. It's not words. Okay, it is very minimal. If you want to make it more, obviously you can make it 300. Again, it is according to the requirement you are catering for. Then. You have to attempt to get a response from API, which tries in case if it fails. Now comes the word of error handling. The code which is not having error handling capacity is not a worthy code. Simple as that. If something goes wrong, first you have to let the system give you the message that something is wrong, not directly land to a error page. It should be interactive. And it should tell the user whatever you have entered is wrong or something has happened. What has happened? This particular responses should always be there. For example, I am giving you possibilities. It's not that every coder will be knowing everything what they have to do, right? But still, there are few standard error handling techniques when you work. You have status code 200. When this particular 200 status code comes, 404 error comes, 429 comes, right? How do you handle that? What is the error? What is the particular response you give? For example, if it is for 200, we can return the message to the user. Rather than going to a random wrong page, you have to give a message. An error occurred while processing the response from open API. That means if your GPT is not connected properly, it is not able to give response, then you have to just not push that particular code to a error page. You have to send an error message. You have to tell this. Next, you have 429. Here, we are trying to request open AI if fail status. Again, we are trying to re-attempt. How many times back off retrying attempts are two? We will try to do two time attempts and then we will go for sleep. 
that means we are putting this particular system into sleep that it is not able to solve the more you work with it the more limit exceeding will happen and 429 also deals with if your particular open ai is out of limits it is not having any uh, limits left it is exceeded you have to buy new you have to put your billing again it will say you have exceeded your current quota please check your plan and billing details so that's how you have to try to give error message to the user so that they understand something is happening we have to go and address because nobody will go to back end and debug what is the error right in the front end itself you have to show what is happening so this is sample example of error handling then if any other error comes more than this there are two errors which i have listed if anything else comes up you have to just give the status code directly 404 error or internet disconnectivity error anything might come an error occurred while communicating with open ai is a standard default error message you can send if you don't know what you have to do just put there is an error please decode then comes the run the flask application this is the main method which we create for this code and the code execution starts from the main method here now comes the second part of it the front end which we had discussed already there and what are the complete content of that we will have a quick overview that is index.html here you can see people who know html will always know this doctab html you have head you have html lang english and meta characters that is always there you have style for your particular page and you also have the body here you have a chat box you have a text box you want a button it's a simple thing you have to have a text box where the user will put their input click on send button so that it will interact with the chat gpt in order to display the chat gpt message you have to have a label or again a text box so that's how it will work it's a simple javascript which is being used in order to have this interactivity that is fetching the information from the input and putting that to gpt and taking the response from the gpt and putting back on the front end to view for user so this is the simple fundamental function that happens in this script section how do you run this just you have to be in the location where you have created the folder that is gpt chat app right i'll just go back and just give you a overview gpt chat app that is the location where the command prompt should be pointing out then you can execute python app.py when you do this you will be able to access a browser where it is loading in this particular address what is this address why only 5000 why not 4000 you might question as you all know http 127.0.0.1 will always deal with local hosting when you do this local hosting you have separate ports for every library or every kind of execution you do 5000 is the port number which is allocated in every local system for flask library of python any flask web framework code execution you do it will launch on the chrome with this particular address hope you had a complete detailed view of how this particular application will work a quick recap you have to install python and necessary libraries then you have to create a main python code file that is app.py then client side that is front end interface you have to make it index.html again this is as per your requirement this is a common name which we keep that's why i have used the same you can create a simple html interface to interact with the chat gpt then you can run the application and check for the output right so now that we have understood what is the code at the back end front end and every aspect let's execute this code and check for the output before going to the demonstration of flask chat gpt app let's understand the folder structure i am here in the location where my python has been installed since we have already worked on you could see many folders here we are trying to create gpt chat app right according to our steps we already done it so if you go to this particular 
folder you can find two different elements one is templates another one is app what is template template is actually the index file which we had discussed the html file app is a main program once you execute this the back file will be created if the execution is successful or not successful doesn't matter once you run this through interpreter it will generate automatically that's why it is present if you are executing for the first time this will not be there okay now let's hop on to the command prompt and check how does we work with this here we are in the command prompt and in the location where our file is am i right no i'm actually wrong we are in the location where python is now we have to enter to the folder created what is the folder we created we have to change directory to that particular folder gpt underscore chat underscore app this is the folder name which we generated right let me enter to that see now we are in that folder how do we execute the steps which i mentioned we have to type python and we have to mention the app.py or the name which you have given to your main python file you have to mention that and click on enter once you click enter after executing this app.py file this is how the output looks like are we in the right output screen no it is just indicating that it has been executing it is running the location is we have to go to http 127.0.0.15000 the port number let's quickly hop on to that location on our search engine any browser you can use you can go to this particular port number let's hop on to that once you go click on http the same id where it has been launched across you will find the interface now what you have to do you have to communicate with the gpt so i'll press hi and click on send button it will say hello how can i assist you today the next question which i ask is how are you when you do this you send this and just a computer program so i don't have any feelings but thanks for asking how can i help you so this is how it is trying to interact with the human being if you try to give something which is not existing still your chat gpt is not trained to that level it is a normal basic model i'll say where do you live i'll click on the send button you have exceeded your current quota please check your plan and billing details it will not throw up this error really if your limits are exceeded right that is when it will show this error it will try to do that error handling which i have already mentioned so for the third conversation itself how did we get this message you might be having this particular doubt the thing is open api api key is not very much free to everything you only have access for 5 dollars worth of conversation that can happen api key that can generate that is how you can converse after it exceeds 5 dollars it will try to ask you to fill up and select the plan and do the billing right the payment should be done for the same so this is just a simple example you can enhance create you can buy a paid version and start building the projects and help your small scale business if you own any in order to have a private chatbot so customers can interact without any actual agent service required customer service you need not take it you can use the bots there on your website right this is a simple idea this is how the execution looks like by now we have understood how does chat gpt while using flask how we can execute what are the code required and how the outputs look like now that we have understood and also saw the demonstration how does a chat gpt app work when you create with the help of flask library using python now let's check out the next topic using the same flask how do you use text to image application here the simple idea is text to image generation involves creating images for textual description using ai models 
you will give a simple description here we are not focusing on description we are trying to get a image for the word which we give as i told cat dog any animal or what you want to fetch for significance of this particular application enhances creativity and design processes useful in various fields like advertising entertainment and virtual environment say you want to uh, get an image you can give a description cat which is sitting on a mat or dog which is sitting on a bed you can give certain description you will get images in certain way or sketched cat image drawing of a cow so you can give a certain description to ai it will generate back the output for you how do you implement this particular text to image app first is we build a web application that converts text description into images again if you want to build a web framework it is about flask then you use open ai again html css for the front end that is very much mandatory and basic what are the prerequisites you want for this first is python to be installed in your system next you have to have a required library that is flask and open api and you have to have a api key from open ai this is the basic requirements it should have in order to start off with the development of this application now let's understand what is the code for this particular app what is that purpose and what all we use here then later we will execute this hope we are clear now let's quickly hop on to google collab understand more about this application here we are on the google collab first step if your python is not installed install your python if already exist ignore simple as that again create virtual environment we already had the description about each and every element of this particular code statement then we activate the virtual environment by using this particular code here next comes installation of flask and open ai it's very important to install the libraries which is necessary for your coding first place we'll be using pip command to install flask open ai it's a simple statement here the code line you can just execute the same then we have to create the project directory again nothing but the new folder the, it is named as flask underscore text underscore to underscore image if you want to put some other name it's left to you you have to go to the folder which you have created then only you can start creating your python code file and html code file first thing is main python application code file which is again named as app.py it gives you a proper signification it will not mix with the previous one because the folder is different so again we have to import the necessary libraries when initializing the flask application you have to have a open api key you can replace this your open api key into your original open api key how do we do that then you have routing which has to go that is index html in this html file you have all the designs related front end related that has been fetched and you will be routed with the help of function call generate image as a post method we will be using json post method means the response which you get from chat gpt right either it might be your user input also acts as a post and also the response will be also post use open api to generate image based according to the prompt which has been received the size should be only this much and the number of images generated at once should be one only then the prompt which is given by the user will be pushed to open api it will get a response and then that particular image will be displayed if you want a detailed explanation of what is every line means i have it for you you can just read it what are the different elements we use and why do we use right next you have to create this html interface that is the front end again you have to have a text box a button and where you print your prompt and then you will put that inside the gpt it will fetch the output on the same screen right you have to have a simple text box and a button that's it if you want to do more styling you can more welcome use css files and you can do it this is a 
general basic setup or the front end which you need. And you have a script, again, you have a function called generate image. Here, what happens? It will fetch the information, the prompt from the user, and then it will put that particular prompt to OpenAPI. Once you get the response from OpenAPI, it will push back the response on the front end. This is the code for the same, right? It's just an interaction code between the front end and back end. We'll be using JavaScript. This is about the HTML file we'll be using. Again, if you want to run this code, you have to type python app.py and you have to be on the same folder where you have created at the start. If you go somewhere, navigate to some other location on your command prompt and if you try to give, it will not execute. Let's have a quick recap here. First is we'll be installing python. Next the library is called flask and open AI. Later, we will create a flask application that is app.py. Then we will also try to include the functionality of converting text to image that whatever the text we have given related image will be provided. So we have to root for that and you have to have a simple HTML interface in order to have the connection between the user and the system. Then you have to access and run the code, start the flask server and again you have to go to the same location that is the same IP address which ends with the port number 5000. So this will be your particular location address it will run there you can execute the same now let's quickly check how does this work in our demo now here we are in the python location of the local system we are trying to execute flask text to image app if you try to go to that particular folder you could find the same folder structure it is having a main python code and then you also have index in the template right once it is executed, back file has been created. So that is why they are here. This is the structure. Now what we have to do, go to command prompt, type this particular location and try to execute with the help of python app.py command. So I am copying this location completely, going to command prompt and changing the directory to the copied location. Now we are in the folder flask text to image application, which has been generated. We straight away Try to execute this with the help of python app.py command. Once we do that, we will click on enter. This is where the Flask server is been running. It is active now. We have to go to the location, which is mentioned right here with 5000 port number. Let's hop on to that particular location. Once you come to this location, you could see the basic HTML design which we have made. And it's our time now to give certain description regarding the image and try to generate the image. I'll give just one line of description. If you want, you can give in detail description so that the GPT will give you a right perfect required image as per the command. I'll try to give mountain with skylight. Okay. So, Let's mention the color also. That is that will be good. So mountain with green skylights. This is my description of an image which I need. I'll try to generate. Okay. This is how we got the image from the GPT. It has given the lights which is in green color on the sky and mountains are right here. So this is how the descriptions will be taken care of. The more precise description you give, the more precise image you will get as an output. So this is how text to image application will work with the help of Flask Open AI in your Python, which also help to generate the images for digital content creators or any kind of creative people who work in that particular field. Let's understand how does LangChain apps work? What is LangChain in Python? Overview of LangChain. LangChain always streamlines the development process of the application and utilize the LLMs by offering a extensible architecture. Generally, simple words, LangChain is a library of Python just like NumPy and others. Okay. It supports wide range of use cases. Generally, we use LangChain in order to create assistants, chatbots, and many complex NLP tasks and data analysis aspect. This is the application of using LangChain. Then the framework is built 
with highly customizable interiors of the code and then we also develop to tailor specific needs and we also integrate the same tailored code or module to the external data sources using API keys. This is the simple work which we do with the help of Langchain app. It is just that we are using this library in order to create good model which acts to be a chatbot or personal assistant or any other requirement will be catered with the help of Langchain application. Now, in order to understand more about this, we will try to know the case study for this Langchain app. Let's explore more. Again, I'm going towards Google Colab. Let's understand the code and later part, we execute that in the command prompt. Here, you have to note one thing. We are not going to the Google Chrome where the IP address ends with 5000. We are executing this in the command prompt itself. This is one of the differentiation between what we have already seen and what we're going to see. Let's hop on to Google Colab. Now, here we are on the Google Colab. What we are trying to understand, what is the case study? First thing, personalized story generator. That means it will try to take certain inputs from the user and try to generate the story for the user. This project will take inputs, might be the character names, settings and theme of the story. It will generate unique story every time you try to communicate with chat GPT 3.5. Why I'm struck with 3.5? There is 4 and 4.0 that's coming, right? But when you go to open API, it's still at the 3.5 version itself. It is having 16K, 1105. There is some other codes that's going on. It's just a turbo GPT 3.5. You have many kinds of models. But for now, it is 3.5 in open API platform. Not talking about the chat GPT 4 or 4.0. Okay, don't get confused with that. Steps in order to create this project, very simple. Set up the environment, collect the user inputs, generate story using AI model and display the generated story. Simple as that. First, when we talk about the installing of libraries, here we have to install OpenAI Langchain. It is related to OpenAI, also related to Python. So, pip install OpenAI and Langchain. Both of these libraries we have to install. Then, in order to collect the input from the user, you have to have two different Python files here. So, that is the differentiation. Previous demonstration, we had only one Python file, one front end file we used to work with the code. Here, you have two files. What does this do? First one says user input.py. That means we are trying to welcome the user and take the input from the user. Here you could see, welcome to the personalized story generator. You have entered the main character's name. Please enter that. Then enter the setting of the story and enter the theme of the story. For example, adventure, mystery, horror, anything as such. Return the character setting theme to the particular file called storygenerator.py. You are taking input with the help of one Python file and you are trying to give that particular collected input to another Python file that is story generator py. From langchain import chain prompt text model, then user input. As I told you, user input file, you have to take all the user input, get user inputs. What is collected? Character name, settings and theme. This is collected. You have to take this as an input and import that into this particular story generator python file. This is the function where you can just create certain story according to the inputs given by the particular user. Then you will have a prompt. You will have to work with a text model. As I told you, this is GPT 3.5 Turbo here. And here comes your open API key. You have to put your secret key here. And then you have to execute this particular main block. It will try to give you the story generated here in the print statement. Generated story is so and so. A paragraph of a story will be displayed for you. So, this is how the main block will get executed. And these are the commands or the codes which we use. Every code is having a self explanatory comment that you can read and understand once again if you don't follow it here. Okay, this particular 
learning material or code is always provided no worries you can go back rework on this again then what do you do in order to display the story you have to execute the file how do you execute story generated dot py here why are we not using python we have to use python right it should be python story generated dot py that's how it will execute simple as that you will have a quick recap here first is environment setup that is you are having python in your system you have two libraries that is open ai and langchain then you have to have your own api key which is discrete you have to create main script that is story generator and you also have to create a subscript that is user inputs then you have to generate the story functionality that is open as chat gpt you have to use that and you have to give them the character name setting theme etc it will develop the story and if you execute it will give back the story which is already developed as simple as that hope this is very clear for you now let's see the demonstration what is the output and how it will work we are trying to execute personalized story generator which we have already discussed that we are using the library called langchain here it is you have two different python files one is story generator one is user input it is already explained user input is used to take the input from the user and story generator is the main app you should not execute python user underscore input dot py you have to execute story underscore generator dot py that's how you will get the output screen this is kind of special execution that every output is seen on the command prompt itself we need not navigate between any other locations for output what is this py cache if you click on this folder after you compile your code this is actually generated compiled python file will be generated so that is why it is here now let's quickly hop on to our command prompt and try to execute this particular code file in order to do that first what we need is we have to copy this location where it is actually situated the folder of your app now we are on the command prompt we are changing the directory and pasting the location which we copied and clicking on enter we are in the folder called personalized story generator what we have to do we'll try to execute python story underscore generator dot py once you click on enter this is how it starts executing welcome to the personalized story generator and i'll type a name of the main character as alice and it will ask setting of the story where it has to happen i can say enchanted forest i'll give the location visualization idea for the gpt i'll click on enter it should be a mystery one or adventure one or horror one whatever you can mention that i'll mention as adventure story i'll click on enter see the story is generated in this form you can read the story pausing the screen but yeah it will include the main character the setting of the story also what kind of story what is the theme of the story it will try to give you the complete paragraph which you can use it for your requirement this is how a story generator will work using lang chain you can create much more applications this is of one basic example hope this is clear for you we have executed the code we saw the output how does the story will be generated with the help of gpt which we have connected with the help of the api key let's make life easier with python for automation you will learn to automate repetitive tasks and even building user friendly guis what actually testing is let me take you to that right here okay so from the one simple word which we have here testing okay let's first of all not go too much into the uh, into the technical definitions or something like that if i just simply talk about that what testing is in simple general language right what do we say testing is basically to test out something right so testing means that let's say you are having any idea or any app or something you have developed on to your own right now you just want to test that out that okay is this a thing which is ready to go in the market is this a thing that i can give to the people or something like that right so 
in the same procedure in the same way when we talk about testing in software development field what we say that whenever you are developing out any software any product any component let take it as a a uh, website take it as a application anything you are developing any product i'm talking about here right what we have to do we have to analyze that right we need to see that okay what are the features i have added into that right after that we need to evaluate that okay what are the components in which basically we are having the errors or the bugs that are faced out why is that necessary to do that is necessary to do so that whenever your product goes into the market it is delivered into the market it is totally free of the errors or the bugs we all are familiar with that if there okay let's say you made out a login page let me just quickly take an example here let's say you made out a login page right in that login page basically let's say everything is totally and clearly mentioned and uh, you had just attached out some database to that as well fine now whenever you are just running that out let's say whatever the username or whatever the password a person is saving onto that login page that is not getting saved again and again that is showing the error and you have already sent that in the market what is that that is a type of error which is coming into your product which you have already sent into the market right so that doesn't uh, go in a right way so that is the use for testing that why you new uh, use to and why why basically you just need out to do out the testing and if you have done out the testing at your end first of all you have just removed out all the errors you have removed out all the bugs which you were having into that after that now when you were just figuring out and giving it a test in that case what you just figured out that okay when i'm entering the username and when i'm entering the password so that is not getting out saved so i just need to figure this thing error figure this error or figure this bug whatever is there into that so that whenever it just gets delivered into the market whenever a person buys out this application or whenever someone logins on to this particular page so that particular person does not faces out any error right this is what we actually want what we want is that whatever the things which we are making that are absolutely correct and if a person is using those things a person does not should not actually face any type of difficulties or any types of error in that so this is the use this is the point where you need out our testing right right now here we are just general talking about the testing thing we are not going that you are testing for a software or you are testing for a app or you are testing for anything we are just not going into that particular thing right so when whenever we just develop out a software component or you just develop out any project we need to analyze that we need to inspect its features we need to go through the features you, which you have added we need to evaluate whatever the Uh, what are the components you have put on to that particular application we need to analyze we need to evaluate that are these components are these features which you have added into this application added into this product are that errors or bug free and if yes so whenever and why why basically we just need to check out that is that error or bug free so that whenever you just get whenever this product of yours get delivered into the market whenever the user uses that project product actually so they do not face any types of er errors or bugs it is totally free of any error or any bug right so now this is the point where we actually need out the extensive testing of the software if i just talk about the software or if i talk about product so this is a place where you actually need out the soft testing of the software right now when is testing done i just explained you that what testing is what's the use of testing now when is that actually done so testing is done whenever your application is built out right whenever you have built out your application after that you just test out give it different test cases give it different databases that all will be discussing in the um, a little while so i would just give you an idea that you just give out different test cases you just define like give it out different databases and all those things so whenever your application is actually ready okay whenever your application is completely built out and that is ready to uh, ready to be get tested so in that case we just do out the testing and we just deploy that into the different test servers or the test environments which we are having so that whatever the testing is to be done with that particular application we could just perform that out right 
let me just again quickly go over that what testing is and when is that done and why do we need that so once you develop out a software component or a product so we have to analyze and inspect its features and also evaluate the component for potential errors and bugs so that when it gets delivered in the market it is free of any bugs and errors it is the point where we need extensive testing of the software right and when is that done so testing is done when the application is built is ready to test and deployed in the test servers or the environments right this is what we uh, i could just like say about the testing that testing is basically to test out its features that do you have any errors or bugs if yes then to clear that out and if no then it is absolutely ready to go into the market and it's totally free of bugs and errors right hope you first of all just got the idea regarding what is testing now we'll be discussing out that what manual testing is so we discussed already we had seen that what is testing now there are two types of testing which we have here in the selenium first of all is the manual one and second one is the automation so here we'll be discussing about the manual testing let's get started let me just move on to the second one fine now um, again i would see you that let's not go too much into the technical things right here let's simply understand that what is the meaning of word that is manual if i talk about talking manual in a simple english language so i would say manual means that anything which is done manually right anything which is done by you done by manually that simply talks about the manual and if i talk about testing so this is one thing which we have already discussed that we just impl uh, implement out the different tests we just implement out the different features we just do all of these things to make our product error and bug free right so here if i just say if i just combine the simple manual and simple testing thing so i could just say without any uh, technical definition or without any uh, further like that things i could simply say that the testing which is done manually is called a manual testing isn't that simple right yes that is so i would just request you not directly go into the technical definitions first of all try to analyze that okay what is the name of the topic simply the name of the top topic is manual testing manual means anything to do that is manually testing you already know so test out your software to test out your products whichever you had made so that whenever they just get delivered into the market they are totally bug free right so this is where uh, this manual testing definition comes now if i just talk about the things in a very detail so i would say um that manual testing means that uh, the application which you had made out the application which is actually developed by you the product which is developed by you so here we'll be particularly talking about the application okay so now from here onwards i'll be taking the word which is application so manual testing means that the application which is basically the application which is made that is tested manually by the testers this is simply what is there in the manual testing right so whenever you had made out any application and you just test that application manually right so that is actually called as manual testing now when you are doing out the manual testing so in that case what are the things that are to be performed so the test which are there actually they need to be performed manually in each and every environment using different different data sets in the starting as well i mentioned about the data sets right that we take our uh, different different data sets and even we just give out some test cases and then try to implement out the and test out our software manually test out the product test out the application actually manually right so whatever the test you are performing manually that is done under the manual testing whatever the test you are performing they need to be performed manually in every environment which you are having right now in every environment you will be giving out different different data sets after giving out that different data sets you will even note down the rate of success and the failure okay whatever the transactions you are giving whatever the data sets you are giving for each of the data set you will be noting down the success and the failure rate that all will be recorded right this is what happens in actually manual testing let's say you develop out an application 
right let's say, let's say that you just developed out any application in that application if you are if you just want to test that out so if you are going to go through the manual testing procedure so first of all you need to test that particular application onto every environment which will be having different different data sets for every environment and even you will be noting down what is the success rate and whatever the what is the failure rate for each of the transactions for each of the data sets on which you are performing out the things this is what is actually done in manual testing right all of the things are recorded but this is all about the manual testing first of all that what it is and how we just do out that particular thing next when i talk about manual testing so i would say that it is absolutely mandatory means it is very important it is important for uh, every new developed software be before automated testing so now whenever we are going on and we just let's say just developed out in a new application you just developed out in a new, new software in that case it's mandatory to go for first of all for the manual testing then go for the automated testing i would like it is mandatory for every new developed software to go under manual testing before the automated testing what is this automated testing that we are going to discuss in some few minutes right so let's not go that too much into detail to, onto this automated testing but the way which i had told you that is uh, breaking out the words which is uh, you just break out the word automated testing into two parts first one would be automated and second one would be testing so if you are breaking out both of these and figuring out that what's the meaning then absolutely you are right the definition which you are thinking for the automated testing that is absolutely correct right i'll be proving this thing in within our some time right first of all let's discuss about manual testing in detail now what happens in manual testing when you are doing everything manually you are uh, testing in every environment you are uh, testing on different data sets you are giving it different cases you are noting the success rate you are noting the failure rate all of these things when you are doing so that will absolutely require a lot of time and even a lot of efforts are required but when you are doing anything or uh, manually when you are doing anything on to your own when something is tested manually by the testers so yeah it absolutely gives you the surety of a bug free software because the machines are not too much that much automated that okay they give you the surety of a bug free software but if you are doing anything on to your own so yes that gives you a complete surety of a bug free software so if i talk once again about the manual testing so in that manual testing means the application the web application whichever is made by you or any application is tested manually by the qa testers so the test which you are performing that needs to be performed manually in every environment using a different data sets and the rate for the success and the failure transactions should be recorded as well why is manual testing so when manual testing is mandatory for every newly developed software before automated testing this testing actually requires a great effort and time as well but it gives you the bug free software surety of a bug free safe software right this is about the manual testing now if i talk about the challenges that what are the challenges that manual testing is faced now there must be some a uh, challenges some limitations in the manual testing right that is the why we just in, we were introduced to the an automated tool which was selenium right there should be some, there must be some challenges in this particular testing and this was only the reason that why any automation testing was actually introduced right let's see that what are the challenges in the manual testing first it requires more time and more resources absolutely right thing so when you are doing anything manually right when you are doing anything manually that will absolutely require more time within if anything is done using any automation tool right so this will cause one of the challenges which was uh, faced in the manual testing that it was actually requiring a more time and even the more resources as well right gui object size difference and color combinations etc are not easy to find in manual testing so whenever you are performing manual testing so in that whatever the gui objects you have made out whatever the color combinations you had put on whatever the size differences you are facing what are the different color combinations you were trying to figure out all of these things 
are actually not easy to find in the manual testing right these are the things which are not really easy to find out in the manual testing right after that executing the same test again and again it is time taking process as well as tedious Ab absolutely right so um let's uh, whenever you are just doing out the things on to a manual testing so what we had seen there we saw that in manual testing what was happening first of all whatever the whatever the application you want to build out that was actually built after that when the tests were performed so in that case what was happening in that particular case whatever the test was done that first of all they were done in all the environments after that different different data sets were given off for that and after that different data sets you were needed to put down the success rate you were needed to record down the failure rate and all these things were actually done so these things were done manually so it was a time a very much time taking process to do out the same test again and again same test again and again execute the same test so yeah it actually takes a lot of time and yeah that's as well a little difficult and a little hard process as well so these were the three challenges which were faced in the manual testing so first of all it requires more time and more resources second the gui object size difference and the color combinations are not easy to find in the manual testing and third executing the same test again and again is time taking process as well as tedious right so here we discussed about the manual testing and the challenges now i'd be introducing you to that what is automation testing what do we mean from this term now again i just i would just not want you to quickly read out the slide no i do not want you to do out this thing first of all uh, according to in simple english language think about what is actually automation automation means to automate any anything using any machine right automating means to automate something and testing this testing we already are familiar with that what testing is so as basically we have that autom in automation testing we already have a framework we already have a tool set according to that only the test whichever are to be performed on whatever the applications they get automatically performed so in that you do not need to put down the rate of success the rate of failures you do not need to manually test on each and every data sets you do not need to manually give it on all the environments no these are not the cases which happen in automation testing automation actually on its own means that anything which is done automatically right so in this automation testing whatever the test you carry out all of them are actually done automatically right so let's read out that as the name for the suggest automation testing takes the software testing activities and executes them via an automation tool set or framework as i mentioned in the starting as well that in automation testing what happens in automation testing we just we you just take out a software whatever uh, software testing activities whatever you just want to do and we we'll simply execute them uh, through a automation tool set or a framework we already have so we just put out the things on to that automation tool set or framework and whatever are the tests which you want to perform for any software or any application whatever is done by that you could just simply perform those tests on to that now if i just talk about in very simple words that what automation testing actually meant so we can say that it is a type of testing in which a tool which you have right that executes a set of task in a defined pattern automatically automatically is a essential word to add in the automation testing definition right now this this is a type of a testing in which uh, a tool automatically executes a set of tasks in a defined pattern which is automatically defined and it automatically performs and executes the set of tasks which are given to that right this is what comes in the automation testing now where is this method actually used out so this automation testing method uses scripted sequences that are executed by testing tools already we have many scripted things written out here we have already written scripted programs written out for this automation testing method we just simply use them out and they are executed by the testing tools which we have here right 
This tool executes examinations of the software, report outcomes, and compare the results with the earlier test runs. Now, what are the things that automating testing tools can do? So, in that case, it can execute the execute examinations of the software it can basically whatever the outcomes are there it can report that particular outcomes and even it can compare the result with the earlier test runs which were actually made out it can compare out that test and we can just uh, see the comparison in the results for whatever the earlier test runs which you have carried out right this is what uh, is here in this automation testing thing that what it what it does actually does so it executes the examinations of the software it reports the outcomes and even it compares out the results with the earlier test runs right this is about the automation testing if i give you an overview for the automation testing so we can say that as the name suggests automation testing takes software testing activities and executes them via an automation tool set or framework so we have a tool set or framework through which this automation testing actually takes place if i talk about this thing in much simpler words so i could say that it is a type of testing in which a tool executes a set of tasks in a defined pattern automatically so this automation testing method basically in this we use the scripted sequence that are executed by the testing tools and these testing tools what they do they help us to execute uh, the examinations of the software the report outcomes and even compare the results with the earlier test runs right so hope you just got out the idea first of all regarding that what is manual testing what are the what were the challenges faced in manual testing that why we need to introduce the automation testing right after that the challenges we simply learned about that what automation testing is now in the next part of the video we'll be discussing about the selenium in detail we'll be going through the introduction to selenium so now we'll be discussing about and i'll be taking you through the introduction to selenium now this is the place where actually we start the selenium thing so let's get started here let me just take you to the new slide and here we go uh, first of all we'll be going through that uh, who introduced selenium that basically who is the founder or you can just say that uh, who developed selenium after that we'll be seeing that how that th things are done and what is actually the selenium right so the selenium was introduced by jason huggins in 2004 right so uh, we can just say here that selenium was introduced by jason huggins in 2004 so he was an engineer at thoughtworks so basically how does this idea coming for introducing something some automated tool so what he was actually doing he was doing his work on some web applications right he was just test, making out some web application doing some work on his web applications suddenly he just required out some testing technique right he just suddenly required that okay i just need to go ahead with the testing on this particular web application which i am making now doing out the manual testing absolutely takes a lot of time a lot of efforts as well which we had already seen in the previous slides that manual testing takes first of all a lot of time and even a lot of efforts why because there which are the tests which are actually there they are carried out manually first of all after that the tests are performed on all the environments you need to put different different test cases for that after that whatever the rate are of the success or whatever the failure rates are there you just need to note them down and then just come to an output this is the thing which happens in manual testing and this is absolutely a long procedure a hard procedure and a lot of time taking procedure so then basically jason huggins thought that there must be some tool in which we, in which some automated things should be there so as to do out the testing in a easier and in a faster way so this is where jason huggins introduced selenium as an automated tool for the testing frameworks right so if i just quickly talk about that who, who was who introduced selenium so name for that person is jason huggins he was an engineer at thoughtworks so some one day he just thought of working on some applications and he required testing so at that case only he just developed out and introduced the selenium and automated testing framework or you can say as a tool right now 
what are you testing we do with the help of a selenium with the help of selenium or using selenium that are called as selenium testing again from the word it actually states that particular thing what is about the selenium testing so the testing which is done using the selenium right whatever the test which we perform using the selenium tool that are referred as selenium testing now what selenium actually is so it is an open source tool first of all very first thing that it is an open source tool a portable framework which is used for automating out the test administered on web, web browsers see selenium is one of the first of all open source tool that is absolutely okay a portable framework that you could just use it at any place that is as well okay this is particularly used for automating out the test which are administered on the web browsers actually selenium works on different different web browsers it has that capability to work upon different web browsers right so whatever the test we have so basically it is actually used for automating out the test which are administered on the web browsers what are the testing uh, web applications on which you can perform selenium on which you can just use out this uh, framework which is selenium so that testing web applications are a uh, shopping carts you can email programs like gmail yahoo all all these cases in all these places actually you could use out the selenium framework so first of all it is very open source tool so basically it means that you could just simply download that it is it doesn't doesn't ask you for giving out any paid version or something that it's totally available free of cost after that it's a portable framework so you could just use that at any time at any case and this is used for automating out the test administered on the web browsers the testing app web applications which can be performed using selenium are shopping carts or email programs like gmail yahoo these are the things which are actually performed using the selenium so hope you got the idea first of all that who introduced selenium so jason huggins was the person who introduced selenium in 2004 so who was he he was an engineer at the thoughtworks why and how did he got out the idea for developing and introducing this selenium so he was doing some work on some web applications and suddenly he required some testing technique manual testing was a very uh, long a very time taking task and it actually requires a lot of time to do out that particular thing so this was a place there was a requirement and when jason huggins developed selenium and automated testing tool so whatever the testing you do with the selenium these are termed as selenium testing and what is that selenium actually so it is an open source tool a portable framework which is used for automating out the test which are administered on web browsers it is only used for testing out the web applications such as shopping carts or email programs like gmail yahoo shopping carts you all are familiar with and nowadays everyone just prefer out shopping online and all those things so yeah these are the applications where you could just use out the selenium now why we should use selenium with python in the starting as well i told you that selenium is one of the tools which can be performed with the help of python programming language and you could as well go ahead with the selenium tool when with the javascript as well so now what's the use and what's the advantages more which why and we should use selenium with python so let's go and see that first of all we are all familiar with the python programming language and there is no such doubt in saying that this is one of the important features of python that it is very fast and even easy to learn as well right it is a very simple language so this is the first reason that why we should prefer selenium with python so python runs very fast absolutely right it is a very fast language it makes the use of indentation to initiate and end block so the indentation which we have in python that is a very systematic thing even you just need to follow out as well very strictly so what what basically let's say you just applied out some condition so when you just apply out that first of all conditions and whatever the uh, block of code you want to uh, apply, apply basically inside that condition so first of all your condition comes on the first line and when you come to the next line so there is some space 
left in the starting after that you start putting out your code of block which you want to put inside that condition this is what indentation is and it actually helps us to see that okay where this particular code of block is ending where this particular is starting so it make us easy to analyze all of these things and this is why uh, the use of indentation we will see right next it is very simple absolutely right the syntax which we have in python is very much simple as well as compact yes this that is simply and as well as very much compact uh, compared to other programming languages hope uh, you all are very much familiar with python for now so you must be very much familiar even with the features are which i just told you it is very much faster the indentation which we have here it is very simple to use as well as compact other if i just compare this with the other programming language so this is the first reason that why we use the selenium with python second thing we have a tool which is called as web driver in actually selenium we have this tool right web driver this is a very important tool in selenium we'll be discussing uh, about this in the further videos right now for this particular thing you could understand that okay web driver is a important tool in selenium so this tool which i was they told telling you about web driver that has a very strong bindings of python programming language actually right so uh, this is the important tool for easy user interfaces that is web driver and it really has the strong bindings for python programming language so this is one another reason that why we prefer selenium with python moving towards the third it runs rapidly while making a comparison of another programming languages so that is true that python actually runs rapidly while making out a comparison of any other programming languages right the programming language is also free and available as open source absolutely true so python is as well an open source language right whosoever needs that you could some just simply download that and use it freely in any of the environments yes this is as well the case it's not the case that you just particularly need this only environment to work for python no you could download any of the environments of your choice and there you could just download the python programming language and simply you could just use that out so it's we can say that it is as well free available as open source and you could simply download and use freely in any of the environments according to your choice and the last one it is easy to code and easy to read that is one of the important points one of the important features as well of the python programming language that it is very much easy to code out and even easy to read out right so hope you now just got out the idea regarding these five points these five reasons that why selenium with python let me just quickly give you an overview so python runs very faster and makes use of indentation to initiate and end blocks it is very simple as well as compact as compared to other programming languages right we have a very important tool which is web driver in selenium and that has the strong bindings for python programming language python programming language runs rapidly while if we just compare this with any other programming language so it runs rapidly this language is as well free and available as open source so if you just need out you could just quickly download that and freely you could just use that on any of the environments and at last it is very easy to code and the the syntax the programs which you write in python programming language that are easy to read as well so these were the five reasons that why we prefer selenium with python now here basically will be we have discussed about that what uh, selenium is and why we should prefer selenium with the python programming language so in the next set of video we'll be seeing about the advantages and the limitations for the selenium testing now we'll be seeing that what are the advantages for the selenium testing let's go ahead with that first of all uh, the very first advantage for the selenium testing is that it supports the various programming languages to write the test scripts as mentioned by me in the previous video i had already told you where we discussed out the topic that why selenium with python there i mentioned that selenium is even um, you can just do out the selenium testing with the other programming languages as well i took out the example for the java script right so the same advantage is mentioned here that 
for writing out the test scripts see, uh, there are many programming languages which are supported so whatever you are whichever language you are familiar with you could absolutely choose out that language and go ahead with that for writing out the test scripts another very important advantage and even i could just say a very good feature for selenium is that it is supported on the various web browsers as well you could take mozilla firefox you can just go on to the google chrome whatever web browser you are actually using out the selenium is selenium actually supports out many of the and various of the web browsers right let's say you take uh, firefox you take google chrome or any other whatever you just want to take out you can just as well go ahead with that same next it supports the parallel test execution now what parallel test execution is in detail i'll be discussing further for now we could just understand that uh, selenium as well supports out the parallel test execution it means i could just give you an overview that parallelly you could perform many tests onto a particular application uh this is uh, i could just say a simple um definition regarding the parallel test execution right so selenium actually supports out that particular thing one another thing which is also mentioned into the definition for the selenium as well that it is an open source software so you could just use that accordingly whenever you just wish out you could just download that and use it accordingly and it, it basically it's a totally open source software right next selenium as well supports out the different operating systems we mentioned i mentioned and told you that it supports out the various browsers with the supporting of the various browsers it as well supports and works on different operating system you take windows you take linux you take mac whatever you just take out it supports all of these operating system right so these are some advantages of the selenium testing now what are the limitations as well i mentioned the starting that if something is having advantages it will absolutely have some or the either limitations so let's see what are the limitations of selenium testing so i mentioned that it works on the web browsers right i mentioned out this particular thing so this is one of the limitation of the selenium that it only and only supports out the web based applications right whatever the application you are making it only and only supports out the application which are web based which are which are basically work upon either google or mozilla firefox it just simply supports out those web based applications only now whatever the new features are getting introduced into the selenium just saying whatever the new features are getting introduced they do not have a surety that they will work or they not work right they may work out sometime they may not work out sometime so this is one of another limitations which is right now right now right now this facing for the selenium testing right another here are some important uh, last three limitations about the selenium testing you can see that there are some use cases where the selenium doesn't works out the selenium testing actually doesn't works so first is the selenium cannot perform testing on the images the very first thing that it cannot perform out any of the testing onto the images the the code which is written behind this testing and all the things so that is not supports the testing on the images you you cannot automate out the captchas using the selenium captchas right now in today's world right now everywhere we see out the captchas whenever you just log in onto any of the web browser so you just any of the website they ask for the captchas to fill out that right so selenium cannot automate that so captchas are not at all automated using the selenium and at last that barcodes cannot be automated using selenium neither the captchas nor the barcodes ne neither of these are supported and can be automated using the selenium right these are some limitations for the selenium testing hope you got that but once again let me go over them so selenium supports the web based applications only so whatever the applications you are having selenium only and only supports out the web based applications it doesn't support out the applications which you have made on your any of the environment or something like that it doesn't start does that thing okay second the new features which are getting introduced so they are a little bit of irresponsible in that case we just have a doubt sometime that either they work or they may not work we are not too much or that much confirm about them so this is what we can say the irresponsibility of the new features now whatever the 
uh, selenium whatever basically selenium cannot perform outer testing on the images so if you just want to perform any test on the images so in that case selenium cannot do out that particular thing right the captures which you have these are not automated using the selenium and the barcodes are as well not automated using the selenium right so these are some of the limitations of the selenium tools finally we will cover gui development you will learn how to create interactive desktop applications using libraries like tk inter we will guide you through building your own gui applications from scratch making your programs more user friendly and visually appealing so let's start with graphical user interface so as i already told you about graphical user interface it allows the user to communicate with electronic devices through graphical representation when i'm talking about graphical representations that means buttons and icons so the example of gui is microsoft windows as well as mac os and we are having several other examples also so basically what happens here here you can do the communications by interconnecting with the icons so this is the basic idea about graphical user interface now let's see different types of graphical user interface libraries that are present in python so we are having several libraries that are used in python for the gui we are having tk inter we are having kiwi pyqt5 wx python and pygui so now let's get some idea about tk inter so python tk inter is nothing but a standard gui library so basically when python is used in conjunction with tk inter it creates graphical user interface that is quick and simple also it gives the tk gui toolkit a sophisticated object oriented interface so this is the basic idea of tk inter you just need to know that it's a python gui library and then we will see how to create a tk inter program so now if you want to create a simple gui application with python tk inter so there are some certain steps that has to be followed first you have to import the module of tk inter right so you can just simply write from tk inter import asterisk and then you can import the tk inter module second step that we have to follow we have to create a main window then how to create a main window we will basically create a object of python tk inter next after creating the main window now we can add multiple widgets in a main window and after adding widgets now we can enter into the main event loop to perform action so now there are two primary approaches that user has to follow right so first as i already told you that you have to import the tk inter module and the module name is from tk inter import asterisk so after importing the tk inter module now what we have to do we have to create a main window so how to create a main window i will just simply write here main window that is nothing but a variable so for creating a object i will just write here tk and parenthesis make sure that your t is capital and then in order to run the application i will just write here main window dot main loop so basically main loop is nothing but an infinite loop right that will run your application and then it also waits for an event and process it as soon as the window is open so this is the basic idea about how to create a basic python application with gui now let's see into the practical example so what i will do now i will just write here from tk into import asterisk so this is the basically tk inter module that i will import here and then after that i will create a main window so let me write here variable window and i will create here the object so for creating the object make sure that t is capital and now we'll just simply write window dot main loop so we know that main loop is in finite loop that will run the application so if i'm executing it you can see that we have created a simple gui application right so this is the basic idea about python tk int so now you have seen that how to create a gui app now let me here change the title so if you are executing it now so on execution you can see that i am getting here tk right and if i want to give the title instead of tk great learning so i will just simply write here window dot title and i will write here welcome to great learning so now let me execute this and on execution you can see that on top we are getting welcome to great learning as a title so after this let me change the window size so i'll just write here window dot min size and i will just write here let's suppose width as 
and height is equal to 200. So if I'm executing it now, you can see that this is the minimum size of this window. And if I'm clicking on this button, maximize, then you can see that this is the maximum size. So let me change the maximum size also. So for that, I'll just write here window. So I will just write here window dot max size. And once again, let me give here width is equal to, let's suppose 300. And let's take the height as 800. So on execution, if you see, this is the minimum size of the GUI app and this is the maximum size, right? So this is the basic idea about Python TK interf. So after creating first GUI app, now it's time to know about widgets. So what are widgets? So talking about widgets in general, this is basically an element of GUI. And in TK interf, widgets are considered as a object which represent buttons, frames, etc. So basically TK Enter offers many controls and these controls are nothing but known as widgets, which we will be using in GUI applications, right? So as I already told you that it represents buttons, labels and text boxes. So we are having different types of widgets that are available in TK Enter that is label, button, entry, check button, canvas, frame and many more. So this is the basic idea about widgets. So now let's understand the geometry configuration of widgets. So we have already got the idea about widget, but if you want to organize the widgets, so we need a geometry manager classes. So primarily we are having three types of geometry manager classes that is pack, grid and place. So after adding widget, I have to organize the widget. So I will be using these three geometric manager classes. So the first one is pack. So when you are using pack functions, so it means that you are placing a widget on a top, right? Coming to the grid, it is used to organize the widget in the table like structure. So when I'm talking about table like structure, that means row and column. Next, we are having place. So it is used to organize the visit at specific positions. So I will just write here X and Y. So here, if you are writing, let's suppose X is equal to 20 and Y is equal to 40. So that means from left to right, you are placing a particular widget. And now coming to the Y, that means from top to bottom, you are placing any widget. So this is the basic idea about the geometric configuration of widgets. So now it's time to discuss about the different types of widgets that are present in Python TK into. So first widget that we are having is label. So when you are talking about label, basically it is used to represent display box in which image or text is added. So what's the syntax of label? So I will just write here simple label and in parentheses, I will write here master comma options is equal to value. Coming to the master, master is nothing but the main window that you have created and here we can provide several options as an arguments. So we can write in options BG, command, font, image, width and height. When I'm talking about BG, that means it's a background, right? And also we are having FG also. FG means foreground color. So when you are writing FG is equal to blue, so your text will be of blue color, right? So this is the basic idea about the label widget. Now let's see it into the practical example. So what I will do here, write down, once again, I will just import the TK inter module. So I'll just write here from TK inter import asterisk. And then after that, I have to create my main window. So let me write here the variable name window and I will create the object as TK. Now I will just simply add widget here. So I have to add here label widget, right? And we know that after creating the main window only, we can add widget here. So let me write here Elvin is equal to label. So this is my label widget, right? So in label here, I have to write here master. What's my master? Master is nothing but the main window. So I'll just write here window. And then in options, I can give several options. So let me write here options. Let's suppose I will just write here text and I will write here grid learning. So this is the label, right? And also if I want to organize the visit, then I have to use the geometrical configuration, right? So let me use here first elven.pack. And if you want to run the main application, then I have to write here window dot main loop. So if I'm executing it now, so on execution, you can see that create learning has been printed on the top of this window, right in middle. So this is about the pack geometry class.
Now, after pack, if I am just using here, let's suppose grid. So we know that grid contains rows and columns, right? So what I will do here, I will just write here row is equal to zero and column is equal to let's suppose one. Now if I am executing it, so on execution, you can see that grid learning has been printed here. So as of now, we have just started doing the coding. So as soon as you will write more code, then we can change the row and column also. And then we are having one more geometric class that is place, right? So I'll just write here place. So basically in place, if we want to organize the widget at any particular place so that we can give here X and Y. And let's suppose if I'm writing here X is equal to five and Y is equal to 10. So basically this is the position. When I'm writing X is equal to five, that means from left to right, you are placing your widget. Similarly, when I'm writing here y equal to 10, that means from top to bottom, you are placing your widget. Let me execute this. So on execution, you can see that date learning has been printed. If you want to place at any other position, so you can just write here x is equal to 50 and y is equal to let's suppose 100. And if you are executing it, you can see that we are getting the output like this. So this is the basic idea about the label widget. So now let's suppose we have already created a label widget of text create learning, right? Let me execute this. So if you see, this is a create learning here. Now, if I want to add here the background color along with the foreground color, then how to add it? So I will just simply go on here options and I will just write here. Let's suppose background color I want in blue. So I will just write here blue and and for foreground color, I will just write here simply red. Let me put this blue under double quotes. So now if I'm executing it, you can see that on execution, this great learning. So foreground color will be in red color and the background color is of blue color. Also, if you want to increase its width, so you'll just write bit is equal to let's suppose 40. And now if I'm executing it. So on execution, you can see that its width has been increased. So this is the basic idea. So in label widget, you can add more options in the form of background, foreground, image, font, many more. Yeah. So after knowing label, now if I want to add any image on my GUI app, so what can I do? So let me execute once again this. So if you see here, let's suppose if I want to add any image here, so what shall I do? So first what we'll be doing, let me just remove this. Let me write here the variable name as I will, and I will just use here photo image. So you can also see that is showing the photo image option, right? So inside this photo image, what I will do here, I'll just write here file. And if you see here, so let me take a file from the desktop. So if you see here, this is the file basically. And it's in the, and it's an image file, right? So I'll just go on properties. And if you see, this is the location. So I'll just copy this and the file name is Python, right? So the image file is having the name Python. So what I will do here, I will just simply first put double quotes and inside that I have just copied it and pasted the location and the file name is Python, right? So I'll just write here Python dot and it's in the PNG file. So I'll just write here Python dot PNG. Now, so now instead of this backslash, we have to just replace it with the forward slash. So I will just write here like this. So now after this, what I will do, I will create a label. So I'll just write here L1 is equal to label. And inside this label, I have to first put master, right? So my master will be here, the main window. So I'll just write here window and then I will write here option. So in option, I will just write here image and what's the image here? So image is equal to I1. So now if I'm doing execution, so on execution, you can see that I am getting nothing. Why? Because I have to use here geometrical classes, right? So for that, I will just write here, let's suppose L1 dot pack. So now you can see that in output, we are getting the TK enter image here. So this is the basic idea about the label widget.
So the next widget that we're going to discuss is button. So basically button is used to display button in an application and it's also having a very simple syntax. We have to just type button, make sure that B is in capital and then instead of master our main window will be there and in options we can pass several arguments such as BG, command, font, image, width and height. So here we can also use command. So when you are writing command, so basically when we are creating any function, we will just assign that function name into the command. We will understand better while doing the coding part. So now let's see the practical implementation, how to create a button. So for creating button, I will just simply write here. Let's suppose B1 is the variable name. I will write here button and I will write here window. So window is my main window, right? And after that, let me write here text. So if I'm writing here text is equal to enter. And again, I have to write here P1 dot. I can use here pack. I can use here place. I can also use here grid. But let me write here pack. Now if I'm executing it, you can see that this is my enter button. So let me give here again the color. So uh, in background, let's suppose if I am taking it as a green color and for foreground, I will just take as yellow and now in execution, you can see that this enter button is having foreground color as yellow and background as green. So now we have seen that how to create a button widget. Now let's see how to create an entry. So what is entry? So in entry, let's suppose if I have created a widget that is label widget and its name is username, right? And I want to give the entry through the user, right? So that's why I will create an entry where I can write the value in the form of a string as well as integer values too. So let's create entry here. So I'll just write here even variable and for entry, I'll just write here entry. And in entry, I'll just write here window. And then let me give here the width also. So let's suppose the width of this entry is 20. So I'll just write here even dot back. And now I'm executing it. So you can see that on execution, I am getting this entry, right? So here I can write here string value as well as integer also. So how we can use this entry? So let's suppose if you are making any website, right? And for that particular website, uh, if you want to access it, you need username and password, then we can use entry there and we have to create button also for that. So let's suppose that if you want to change the font style here. So what I will do here, I just simply write here font is equal to and uh, let me write here Calibri. And let's suppose that font size I want 20. So I'll just write here 20. And now if I'm executing it, you can see that the size has been increased. So now if I'm writing here Gaurav, it's in Calibri, right? Now, what can I do here? If I'm writing here BD is equal to 5. So what is BD here? So BD is nothing but it is used to represent the size of the border. So when I'm writing here BD is equal to 5, then you can see that we are getting the entry button like this, right? So this is the basic idea about the entry. So let's make a simple GUI here. So what we gonna do first, we gonna create a label and after that entry and then we will create a button. So in label, I will be taking the name as employee name and entry, I will just give any string values. And when I'm clicking on submit button, so what will happen? Whatever the string value that I have given in entry will be displayed. So basically I will be using two labels here. The first one will be having the name as employee name and another label will be having the name as nothing. So whatever the string value that I am giving to entry and if I am clicking on submit, so instead of nothing, that value will be shown to us. So this is the basic idea. So let me create a simple GUI now. I will just once again write here from TK into import asterisk. And now I will just create a main window. Let me give you the title also. So once again, I will just write here window dot title. 
and I will just write here welcome to great learning and then and let me just uh, write here window minimum size so I just write here width as let's suppose 200 and then height I will just write here 400 So for the maximum size, what I will do here, here I will keep the width as 400. Let's take the double of the minimum size and then height also, I will write 800. And let me write here window dot mean loop because if you want to run the application, then you have to write it, right? So, so you can see that this is my output and this is the minimum size and the maximum size is this one. And here on the title, I'm getting welcome to create learning. So these are the things that we already know, right? So let me create a label here. So for label, I will just write here L1 is equal to label. And L1 is my variable, right? So inside this label, let me write here master. So master will be here, my main window. And now in options, uh, let me write here text. So in text, uh, let me give here, let's suppose employee name. And then uh, let me also give here foreground as well as background color too. So foreground color, let's take here blue and background color as let's suppose I will take as red. And since this is a label, basically it's a widget. So I have to organize this widget. So for that, I will just write here Elvin dot. I can use also here pack, but let me use this time place. So in place, I can place my widget at any specific position. So uh, let me take here x is equal to 0 and then y is equal to 10. And on execution, you can see that this is my label, which name is employee name, right? Now, let me create an entry button here. So for entry button, I will just simply write here even is equal to entry, where even is my variable. And once again, I will just write here window. And uh, let me give the and let me give here the font. So I'll just write here font. So in font, uh, I will just change the font style. So let me change the font style to Corbel. And uh, let me give the size as 18. And let's use BD too. So why we are using BD? So as I already told you that BD is used to represent the size of the borders, right? Of an entry. So if I'm writing here BD is equal to 5, so let me write here even dot entry. So now what I will do now, I have to place this entry, right? So I, once again, I will write here even dot, let's use here place. And let me use here X is equal to 40 this time and Y is equal to 10. And if I am executing it just now, you can see that I am getting this output, right? So it's not coming perfectly. So let me just adjust the size here. So instead of 40, if I let's suppose if I'm writing here 80. And now if I'm executing, you can see that I am getting here employee name as label. And this is the entry, right? Where I can write any name. Okay. So let's create a button also. So for button, I will just simply write here B1 is equal to button. And let me give here the master as window. And in option, I will give here once again, the text is equal to, let's suppose, enter. Let me give here the colors also for this button. So for foreground, I will use yellow. And for background, let me use green here. So now we have to organize this button widget also. So for that, I will just write here b1 dot place. And let me write here x is equal to, let's take here 100 and y is equal to 40. I'm just taking random values here. Now if I'm executing it, you can see that I'm getting like this one, right? So let me just rearrange it. 
if I'm writing here x is equal to 120 okay now it's coming in between and let's take the y value as 60 now it's coming perfect right now if I'm writing here let's suppose Gaurav and if I'm clicking on this enter you can see that nothing has been happening right so what I will do now I'll just create another label and this label will be here and I will just write here nothing now after that whatever the string values I am writing here in this entry and if I am clicking on this enter then this instead of nothing the value must be the same that I have given so for that what I will do let me create another label so I will just write here L2 is equal to label and I will just write here window and after this I will just write here text is equal to nothing and let me give you a foreground as let's suppose uh, black and background let's take background as brown and let me place this visit so I think x will be 120 here I will be taking and y let's take here 90 or let's take 100 and now if I'm executing it you can see that label is not defined because L has to be capital here now it's good to go so on execution you can see that I'm having the another label as nothing now I have to do something that if I'm writing here Gaurav and clicking on this enter button then it should work right and instead of nothing I want here the value as Gaurav so for that what I will do here let me create a variable so now after this what I will do here uh, I will just create a string where so let me create a variable b is equal to string where so when I'm writing here string where so basically that means we are dealing with the string values right so after creating here string where one so now what I will do here inside this entry in options I will just write here text variable and it will be equal to v because we are dealing with the string values right now I want that my button should work so for that I will create a function so whatever the function you are creating let's suppose a function name is at tech then I can use the binding functions and I will write here in button command is equal to at tech at tech now how to use this at tech so I will create a function basically so I will just write here def at tech and now after this I will just simply write let's suppose uh, my variable is v right so if I want to get any value I will just write here v dot get so let me create another variable x is equal to v dot get right and now after this I will just simply write here so now what I will do here uh, I just want to print this value so I have to write here print x now here as I told you that I have created two labels. the first label name was employee name and another label it was written nothing so I told you that whatever the value that I am putting into the entry it should be changed in the label whose name is nothing right so I will just write here L2 and I will use here config function and inside this config I will just write here text is equal to x now what will be your x value here so I have written here x is equal to v dot get right and we don't add v is equal to string where so basically we are dealing with the string values so now what I will do here I will just execute this and let me write here let's suppose Gaurav and if I am clicking on this enter button you can see that I am getting Gaurav here right and also if you see the output I am also getting Gaurav in the output why because I have written here print x so now let's make some few more changes here the name has been changed from nothing to Gaurav and let's change the color also so how you can change the color so in this config function itself I will just write here background as let's suppose uh, yellow and then foreground as let's suppose blue now if I am executing it so let me stop and rerun this 
and this time once again if i'm writing here gaurav and if i'm clicking on this enter you can see that the name has been changed along with the background color as yellow and foreground as blue so this is the basic idea about the label widget entry and the button right so this is a very simple gui application so the next widget that we are having is check button the check button is used to show a selection of choices as check boxes let's take an example let's take an example of male and female we can use them as a check button now let's see the syntax so the syntax is simple you have to just write the check button and inside the parenthesis your master will be the main window and then there are several options that can be passed through as an argument we can have title background as well as active background so this is the basic idea about check button now let's see the practical implementation so now you can see that this is the basic tk inter programming now what i will do here i will just create a variable here let's take cv and i will just write here check button and inside this i will just write here window and then i will just write here text so as i was explaining about we can take the example of male and female so just let me write here male and then i'll just write here cv dot let's use here pack and now if i'm executing it on execution you can see that i am getting male as check button right so this is my check button so the next widget that we are having is frame so basically frame serves as a container and it is used to organize the widgets now what is the syntax of frame is again simple you have to just write frame and then master and then options so here as a argument we can pass several options such as bg bd cursor width and height right now let's see the practical implementation of this frame so now once again i came back to pycharm i just simply write here f1 variable let me create here frame and inside this i didn't pass any master neither options so i'll just write here f1 dot pack f2 is equal to frame and i will just write here f2 dot pack now if you are executing this then nothing will be executed right so what i will do now i will just create here let's take an l1 that is label i will create here and inside this i will pass f1 as a master and then uh, let me take here text so i will just write here text is equal to great learning and if i am writing here l1 dot pack now so let me execute this so on execution you can see that i am getting great learning now i will just create another label let's take l2 is equal to label so i will just write once again here f2 and then let me write here text is equal to bottom and i will just simply write here l2 dot pack so now if on so on execution you can see that i'm getting bottom so here you can see that basically i'm having two frame right date learning and bottom but i want the bottom to be printed on the bottom side so for that what i will do here uh you can see this i have written here f2 dot pack right so i'll just write here side is equal to and i will just write here bottom and bottom will be in capital so now if i am doing the execution so on execution you can see that great learning is on the top of the window whereas whereas bottom is on the bottom side of the window right so the next widget that we are having is list box so list box is used to give a user with a list of options so basically in a simple word you can say that list box contains a list of options and as we know that list can contain different types of data values so so list box will contain a different list of options so next we are having syntax so what's the syntax of list box once again we will write just list box and inside that masters and the options that we can pass as an argument so what are the options that we can pass through an argument it's like bg bg is background bd bd is used to represent the size of the border then we can also use font as a option image width as well as height so now let's see the practical implementation of list box so in the list box practical example we will see how to remove the element from the list box and also how to insert any element or you can say items in the list box so now what i will do here i will just write here lb is equal to let me create a list box so this is my list box and i will just write here window 
and let me give the width so if i'm writing here width is equal to 20 and let me just write here lv dot pack so here l should be capital so this is my list box and if i'm executing it you can see that i got an empty list box now it's time to insert the options in the list box so for that i'll just create a list so let me give here the list as elvin and uh, let's insert several values so how to add several values in a list box let me write the name here so let me write here tony i will write here edwin let's take some few more names uh, let me write here kirtika and let's take one more name as ipsa so these are the four values right and i want to insert in my list box so for that what i will be using uh we can use loop right for loop so i'll just write here for i in my list name is elvin right so so what's the name of my list box so list box is having a variable name as lb so i will just write here lb dot and then i will just write here insert and let me write here end and i will just write here i now if i'm executing it so on execution you can see that i am getting tony Edwin, kirtika ipsa so what can i do now if i want to remove let's suppose ipsa from here so let me create a button we have to create the button right so for button i will just write here b1 is equal to button and i will just write here window and text is equal to let's suppose if i want to remove ipsa so i'll just write here remove and let me give the color also so i'll just write here let's take the background color as red now for button also i have to write here b1 dot back now if i'm executing it so you can see that this is the remove button but if i'm just clicking on this ipsa and then clicking on this remove button so it's not removing so we know that it will not remove until and unless we are not using a command right so what is command command is nothing but a binding function so in button i will just write here command and let's take that i will write here at tech so here you can see that i have assigned at tech in command so what does it mean it means that i have created a function whose name is at tech right so what i will do here okay let me just create a function here def at tech and inside this function what i will do here so i'll just simply write here lb so what is my lb lb is nothing but a list box variable and if i want to remove the element then i will use here delete function and inside this delete i will just write here anchor so what do you mean by anchor so that means so that means if you want to select an item single item and if you want to remove one by one then we can use anchor here so if i am executing it now so if i want to remove let's suppose kirtika and if i am clicking on this remove button then you can see that it has been removed from the list box similarly for ipsa we can do it right so this is the basic idea about the list box so now after understanding label widget button widget and many other widgets it's time to discuss about some other widgets so we are having different types of other widgets available in python dk into starting from menu button menu message radio button scale scroll bar text top level spin box and pan window we'll see some of the widgets in the practical exam so let's start so now let's discuss about the radio button widget first so for creating radio button let me write here rp1 and r has to be capital so this is my radio button and as a master i will just write here window and after this i will just write here text is equal to yes and let me write here rp one dot pack so on execution you can see that this is the radio button that has been created yes right let me create uh, one more radio button so i will just write here rb2 is equal to radio button and once again as a master i will write here window and text is equal to no and obviously we have to place the widget right we have to organize the widget so for that once again i have to write here rb2.pack 
So now you can see that I'm having two radio buttons that is yes or no, but you can see that these both have been selected, right? So for that, what I will do here, I will just write here value is equal to, let's suppose for S I'm giving the value one and value is equal to zero. Now if I'm executing it, you can see that only one has been selecting at a time. So now here, if you see that these are the radio buttons, right? But uh, let me create a button so that whenever I'm clicking on yes, I want the value to be printed on my output. So for that, I will create a button. So let me create a button. So I'll just write here B1 is equal to button. And then I will just write here window. And in button, I will just give you a text is equal to window. And once again, just let me write here B1 dot back. Now, if I'm executing it, then you can see that I got the button. But, but if I'm clicking on this enter button, you can see that nothing has been printed in my output. So for that, what can I do here? Uh, let me create here an uh, int where. So I'll just write here, let's suppose, I'll just write here v is equal to int verb. So that means basically we're going to deal with the integer values. And after this, I will just write here variable. And we know that our variable is equal to v here. So I'll just simply write here v variable is equal to v. And inside the button when I'm writing command, so that means we are using a binding function. So command once again, I will give the name here at tech and I will create the function name as at tech, right? We know that whatever the function we are creating. So let's suppose we are creating a tech function. So in the command, we will assign the at tech here. So let me just write here def at tech. And inside this, uh, let me just write here simple print and v is my variable so i just write here v dot get so we know that in yes we have assigned the value as one and for no the value is zero so now if i'm executing it so on execution if i'm clicking on yes and clicking on this enter so now this button will work so on execution you can see that i'm getting the yes value as one right that we have already assigned the yes value as one similarly if i'm clicking on no and then clicking on this enter button will give you the value zero. So this is the basic idea about radio button. So the next widget that we are gonna discuss about is the message box. So now talking about the message box, it is used to display the message box on the Python applications, right? So what I can do here, let's create a message box. So for creating a message box, you have to import message box. So I'll just write here from tk enter import I'll just write here message box. Now my message box has been imported. Now what I will do here, I will just simply first let me create an entry. So I'll just write here even is equal to entry. And in this entry, I will just write here window. And let me also give here the font. So in font, I will just change the font style. So font style is take as Calibri. And then font size as 18 right and let me give the width also so i'll just write here width is equal to 20 and after this let me just organize this visit so i will be using even dot pack and now if i'm executing you can see that this is my entry box right now what i will do here let me create a button also so i will just write here v1 is equal to button and inside this button, I will just write here window symbol. And then in this button, I will just write here text is equal to let's take into right. And I will be just writing you v1 dot back. Okay. So now what I want to display here in this message box. So let's suppose if I'm not writing anything and if I'm pressing on enter, so then it shows some message box or you can say some warning message, right? In the form of message box. And let's suppose that if I'm writing any string values, then it shows that, yeah, it's successful and it should print that particular value. So for that, what I will do here, I will just create here a int word. So I'll just write here simple v is equal to int where. Or instead of int where, I'll just create a string where, right? Let me write here string value. So I'll just type here string where. And 
so here what I have to write, I will just write here text variable is equal to v, right? Now we know that we have to write here command which is a binding function basically. So command here once again I will create a function so I have to write the function name here and assign it to the command. So what I will do now here, I will just create a function here def at tech and let me give the condition here. So let's suppose if I'm writing here if v dot get. So we know that v dot get will give me the value is equal to equal to if I'm writing here empty. So I will just write here message box. Now I will be using the message box here dot. Uh, Python provides several functions here for this. So I'll just write here show warning. So I will be using here so warning and here you can see that we are having the title and message. So in title I will just write here causal and after that I will write it's empty. It's simple right when you are not writing anything in the entry and if you are clicking on the enter button or the submit button then it should show something right please enter something it's empty. So I have just written here the instruction it's empty. Next. I will give here the else condition else message box dot now uh, I can use here one more function that has been provided by python I just write here so info and then title I will just give here successful and then uh, let's suppose display I want to display here v dot get so I just write here v dot get so whatever the value is there I'll get here right so now if I'm executing it now so on executing this is my entry right and if I'm not writing anything entry and clicking on this enter you can see that I'm getting causal in my title and it's showing it's empty right so this is the message box similarly if I'm writing let's suppose Gaurav here now you can see that I have given here Gaurav in Calibri 18 right so this is a Calibri font style and if I'm clicking on this enter it's showing successful Gaurav, right? So this is the basic idea about the message box. Let's quickly recap what all did we learn in the session. First, we started with Python fundamentals. Here we discussed regarding what is Python, its variables, data types, operators, tokens, control statements, and also basic data structures of Python, like tuples, sets, lists, etc. In next module, that is advanced Python concepts, we focused on object-oriented programming concepts like classes, objects, etc. And also we learned how inheritance works and how to handle the errors in exception handling, also file handling. In the next module, that is data structures and algorithms, we learned about arrays, stacks, queues, etc. And also few sorting algorithms and searching algorithms like binary search, insertion sort, etc. Then in the next module that is Python for machine learning, we explore the libraries we use in Python for machine learning that is NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib and Seaborn. Then in generative AI of Python, we also provided an overview of generative AI concepts and Python applications in this field. Python for Automation dealt with Selenium Web Automation. In GUI development, we used Python library that is tkinter in order to develop a web page. So, we learned all these concepts from the basic version to the advanced version in Python. Hope this tutorial was helpful for you. Thank you. Happy learning.